A goblin response. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, when carrying out DIY, it isn't always about saving money. To me, being able to stand back and say, I did that, is equally as important. That is why the first person to click on this chapter is also the first person, other than me, to read it. I realize this might not be everyone's cup of tea and can only suggest they get the professionals in. I can heartily recommend J.K. Rowling's early works, she really makes the character of Harry Potter her own. Chapter 10. Amelia Bones wasn't happy that she had been blocked from administering Veritaserum to Lucius Malfoy, and had been neither slow nor quiet when voicing this displeasure to the minister. Her rage was somewhat sated on discovering Cornelia's reasoning, or should that be Dumbledore's? That the minister actually had a contingency plan was a shock. This initial shock though was nowhere near the intensity of the one she received when being informed that her department was basically going to be brought up to war footing. There would be a heavy recruitment program that would see or numbers swell by over 50% in the next three years. Amelia was prepared to trade off delaying justice to a thoroughly defanged Malfoy for an Auror department that had some real teeth. She didn't tell the blonde Ponce this, Amelia didn't tell Malfoy anything, rather just left him in a cell to sweat. She could legally hold him for one more day but Thursday was the deadline, Amelia was taking great pleasure in keeping him locked up for every available minute she could. Today saw her back at Hogwarts. She was interviewing Harry Crow in the presence of his head of house. Amelia was determined to get as much information as possible from the young man before her meeting with Dumbledore. The more the head of the DMLE wrote down, the angrier she was becoming. It was obvious Dumbledore had known Voldemort wasn't gone for good, why else would he set a trap for the Dark Lord? That he had used Hogwarts as a location for this trap had Amelia wanting to slap the old fool silly. Was it any wonder the Hogwarts ghosts were telling him he was on his last warning? Harry was just explaining what happened in the infirmary when the bloody Baron passed through the wall. Young champion, your friends require aid. Amelia watched amazed as the ghost hadn't even finished speaking yet Harry was heading out the door. She and Phileas shot out after him but the younger and much fitter Harry was already opening up a gap. Both followed as quickly as they could while the castle's portraits and ghosts led their champion where he needed to go. Padma was beside Hermione as both girls were rinsing their hands in the wash basins. She noticed in the mirror that the large toilet was now filling up behind them and her heart sank. Neville had gone ahead to the Great Hall and Harry was at a meeting with Madame Bones, this group had judged their approach perfectly. She counted nine of them, all older than her and Hermione, before the group's leader decided to speak. Granger, we want a word with you. Hermione turned around and was confronted with nine older girls glaring at her. They were mostly Slytherins but she was sorry to see a couple of Hufflepuffs mixed in there too, the sole Ravenclaw was particularly painful. The entire situation brought up some particularly unpleasant memories of her primary school, memories that Hermione thought she was finished with. Yes, what can I do for you? You can stay well away from Potter, that bloodline doesn't need another mudblood in it. Hermione's insights were like jelly but she wasn't about to let that show, she learned this just from being around Harry. Well, that shouldn't be a problem, since I don't know anyone called Potter. Don't get smart with us Granger, you know fine well who we're talking about. It took us nearly three days to catch you more than six inches away from him. That's going to change, if you know what's good for you. Hermione may have been shaking inside yet the young witch was determined she wouldn't let them see any tears. She certainly took their threat seriously but there was no way Hermione could comply with the demands. She was already sure not being Harry's best friend would be far more painful than anything they could do to her. Oh I know what's good for me, that's why I have no intention of moving from Harry's side. Padma tried to butt in, knowing Hermione wouldn't back down on this. Have you any idea what Harry will do when he hears about this? You lot have just bought yourselves more trouble than you can possibly imagine. Shut it Patil, no one will be saying anything to Potter. Yeah, we haven't forgotten your sister's blatant attempt to get off with him either. Batting those eyelashes while offering up a life debt, the Potter bloodline doesn't need tainted with your lot either. Hermione couldn't just stand there and ignore the racist comment against both her friends. Wouldn't that be Harry's decision? The lone Ravenclaw in the group then decided to make herself heard. Listen Granger, once you break up with him, a proper blood witch will step in and console the boy who lived. The very thought of having to sit back and watch Harry with another girl hardened Hermione's conviction. Never going to happen, I will be at Harry's side for as long as he wants me to be. Looks like we'll have to do this the hard way girls. Let's make sure our Harry never wants to go near the bitch ever again. Hermione felt herself being hit by two curses to her face before Padma moved to offer some protection. This resulted in her friend getting cursed too. There was then a loud animalistic roar before everything went to hell in a hand basket. Harry burst straight into the girl's toilet and quickly took action. There was no, what's going on here? His training had taught him you didn't waste time on such niceties. There were nine enemies crowded around Padma and Hermione, all appeared older than his friends and had their wands out. Both his friends had already taken some hits and Padma had clearly jumped in front of Hermione to offer some protection. Harry let out a roar as his knife went to work. The nine girls thought they couldn't lose, they were only up against two firsties. Suddenly there was a devil amongst them, a devil that punched, kicked and sliced his way through them in seconds. Screams of pain and shock were heard as wands and bodies hit the floor. By the time Phileas and Amelia got there, eight of the girls were on the floor. Most had been physically struck on some part of their body but all had either the back of their hand slashed open or their wand cut right through. Harry currently had the large Slytherin girl who'd been at the front of the confrontation pinned against the wall, with his blade poised at her left eyeball. The girl had blood dripping from her wounded hand, and liquid of a different color pooling between her feet. The Slytherin had somewhat understandably wet herself from fright. Tell me why and make it good, otherwise, I'm taking this eye in payment. The girl was now sobbing in terror and clearly incapable of speech, Amelia had her wand out and was about to intervene when the two victims beat her to it. Hermione was incapable of speech at the moment but her gentle hand on Harry's shoulder grabbed his attention. The sheer ferocity behind the stinging hex had left Hermione practically unrecognizable while her two front teeth were now about six inches long, and still growing. Padma's face was covered in painful looking boils but she was left to do the talking. They wanted Hermione to stop being friends with you Harry. 
When she said that was never going to happen, they started firing curses. Apparently, Hermione and I are not the right sort of friends you should have. Harry's temper seemed to spike at this news and the Slytherin girl's eyes rolled back in her head as her legs gave way. He let her slump to the wet toilet floor in a dead faint, now far more concerned with the condition of his friends. Amelia and Phileas watched on as the anger dissipate from the young Ravenclaw, that Harry's anger was replaced by tenderness and compassion was so at odds with the carnage he'd just wreaked. That the evidence of said carnage was scattered all about them just made the gentle emotions now on display all the more pronounced. You told nine of them never. Hermione could barely nod her head but she managed to get her point across. Harry sheathed his knife and offered her his arm. My lady. She wasn't physically able to smile at the moment but inside Hermione was extremely happy as she took Harry's arm. To her mind, this was easily worth all the pain she was currently suffering. He offered his other arm to Padma before facing the two adults who had stopped at the doorway. Master Flittick, I'm taking my friends to the infirmary. I will be there if anyone requires to speak with me. I give everyone fair warning though, should anything like this ever be repeated, I will not be so lenient again. The girls on the floor quickly crawled out their way to create a clear path for the trio to leave, they were all desperate to see the back of Harry Crow. Phileas sent a Patronus message to the Great Hall, he wanted the other heads of house and the headmaster to see this. The sight of the third-year Ravenclaw on the floor was particularly distasteful for her head of house. Phileas was left to wonder if it was coincidence Miss Chambers appeared to have been hit the worst. The girl had a bruise forming on her cheek with a black eye sure to follow, she was nursing her bleeding right hand while staring at a severed wand on the floor. Amelia was staring at the devastation wrought here, knowing Harry could have arrived at the very most half a minute before they did. He didn't care that they were girls, Crow just went right off them. When someone holds a weapon on you Madam Bones, it makes no difference if they are male or female. For Master Sharkshard to even consider teaching the lad, he must be exceptional with a blade. To be honest, I would have struggled to accomplish this in the time he had available. There is not an injury here that Poppy won't be able to fix within ten minutes, the memory of what Mr. Crow was able to do will last a lot longer than the pain. The senior staff were soon on site with Pomona's keen eyes quickly picking out the two Hufflepuffs involved. Only Mr. Crow could cause this amount of damage. Let me guess, these girls took the Prophet article to heart and confronted Miss Granger. I'd heard whispers of something like this was being discussed but thought Hufflepuff had wisely decided to take Gryffindor's approach and give such nonsense a miss. What did they do to Miss Granger? Phileas was impressed at Pomona's reasoning, he supplied the answers for the rest of the group. Miss Granger took a stinging hex to the face as well as a densorgio, it would appear disfigurement was their main objective here. Miss Patil also suffered fununculus, whether she was deliberately targeted or trying to protect Miss Granger remains to be uncovered. Both young ladies left on Mr. Crow's arm. Minerva and Severus were casting a pisky on the girl's hands to heal the cuts and stop the bleeding. The potions master was not a happy head of house. This is what happens when you let a child carry a knife. Phileas wasn't standing for that. Yes, six Slytherin bullies with drawn wands get their asses kicked. Before you start raving about punishing Mr. Crow, you should know it was the bloody Baron himself that warned Harry his friends were under attack. Hogwarts then led him directly to this location. The castle appears to have taken a stand on this matter, to go against Hogwarts in this is not wise Severus. Phileas now settled his gaze on the lone Ravenclaw present. I can assure everyone here Miss Chambers will pay dearly for her part in this cowardly attack. As will my two Hufflepuffs, I can't express how ashamed I am of them. Severus couldn't let it go though. And what of Crow, is he to once more escape any form of punishment? She wasn't strictly speaking involved in this discussion but Amelia offered her opinion. There were nine older girls here, all with the intention of doing Miss Granger harm. I would say Mr. Crow's response was a measured one. None of these girls will require to spend the night in the infirmary, Miss Granger certainly would have needed to if Mr. Crow hadn't acted so quickly. Amelia and I were less than a minute behind the lad but he'd already dealt with the situation by the time we got here. He did promise not to be so lenient if there was ever a repeat of this incident. But he sliced right through my wand, what am I going to tell my parents? Don't worry about that Miss Chambers. You can be assured I'll be informing your parents of exactly what happened here today. For a Ravenclaw to be involved in bullying a younger member of our house is something I will never stand for, this incident will be used to remind all of Ravenclaw of that fact. Headmaster, surely you can see this boy needs to be reined in before the next thing he kills isn't a troll, but another student. Albus was well aware his tenure as headmaster was hanging by a thread. He had no intention of going against Hogwarts to soothe his potion master's sense of injustice. I'm inclined to agree that Mr. Crow's response was measured and appropriate. A wizard would have been casting stunners or body binds. Mr. Crow's methods may be different but certainly no less effective. I watched him use that blade on Lucius Malfoy, his speed and control is astonishing. He's attending Hogwarts as a goblin, I assume this is a goblin response to what was undeniably an attack on his friends. His question was aimed at Phileas and the charms master didn't disappoint. Actually headmaster, his reaction was a lot more measured than I feared. The goblin response would have been to ensure this could never happen again, I expected to see limbs on the floor. The girls had been quietly crying but this comment introduced an element of wailing to their accumulated outpouring of self-pity, none of the adults present thought this group would ever be going near Miss Granger again. They also thought that was Mr. Crow's intention, word of this would spread throughout the castle before curfew. Who would dare attack Miss Granger when her protector had taken down nine older enemies to keep the young witch safe? When you factored in his killing of that troll to achieve the same result, and that the castle had not only warned but aided him today, Miss Granger should be one of the safest witches in the castle. Minerva though was determined to have her way on this matter. That there were no Gryffindors amongst the attackers pleased her more than she could say but the deputy was determined to enforce discipline here. Severus was more inclined to punish Slytherin students for getting caught, that wouldn't be happening this time. Hogwarts already has a student under a week's suspension, and placed on probation for the rest of the school year. If I discover this attack was because of Miss Granger's blood status, and I'm almost sure that was the case, all of these girls will be receiving the same punishment. Albus, could you cover my classes for the rest of today? I will probably need to arrange nine home visits. Severus appeared ready to have a fit but Pomona cut him off. 
That seems fair. Phileas had more to add though. Miss Chambers will also see her Hogsmeade privileges revoked and she can forget about trying out for the Quidditch team this year. I find her bullying of two Ravenclaw first years despicable, I hope you will convey that to her parents Professor McGonagall. The girls were now sobbing inconsolably as they were herded up and shepherded toward the infirmary so Poppy could check the nine of them. Minerva wanted a word with the other three involved in this debacle so she headed there too. Albus tagged along, content he now had a genuine excuse to put his meeting with Amelia off again. The headmaster intended to avoid said meeting for as long as possible. Severus didn't think he would be able to attend the infirmary without getting into an argument with Crow. Having heard what he did to Lucius, the potions professor rather wisely decided to head back down to his dungeon. The only thing that travels faster than news inside the castle is speculation. Speculation was currently rife amongst the students, especially after seeing the senior staff rush from the Great Hall. So it was hardly surprising that Neville and Parvati arrived at the infirmary only moments after the Ravenclaw trio got there. Both Gryffindors had quickly noticed who was missing, and thought this was the best location to discover if anything had happened to their friend's family. Parvati was in tears seeing her twin's beautiful face in that condition. I warned you they were after Hermione, how did this happen? This instantly got Harry's attention, Hermione was currently behind a privacy screen receiving treatment. Padma had her head down as she answered her twin. We didn't know who, where or when so I decided not to worry Hermione, just stick close to her. Harry reached for his friend's hand in an effort to get Padma to look at him. That is the second time you've taken a curse meant for Hermione, though with this one you deliberately protected her. She can't say thank you at the moment so I'll say it for both of us. Am I going to have to get used to visiting my sister here if she hangs about with you Harry? Hearing the anger in her sister's voice, Padma cut in before Harry could answer. That's why I'm getting extra lessons in defense from Professor Weasley, and you should see what Harry did to the girls who attacked us. Parvati's eyes nearly bulged out at this, her sister was spending her time with the two hottest wizards in Hogwarts. She didn't get a chance to comment further on this though as both Parvati and Neville got an opportunity to see firsthand what Harry had done to the attacking girls. The senior staff were leading the girls into the infirmary, it was hard to miss that every single one of them shied away from Harry. Neville was amazed at the number of attackers his friends had faced, they just seemed to keep coming through the doors. Professor McGonagall entered along with the headmaster, her attention soon shifted from Dumbledore the instant she spotted Harry. Mr. Crow, a moment of your time please. All in the room knew this was not a request as the deputy headmistress led Harry back out the door. She stopped in the empty corridor for a quiet word. We find ourselves once more in this situation Mr. Crow. Only because people keep attacking my friends Professor. I understand your concern and please trust me that every single one of those girls will be severely punished. She could see this had calmed Harry somewhat so Minerva continued with the discussion she pulled the lad out here for. I have nothing but admiration for your willingness to protect your friends but do you remember the discussion we had the last time this happened? In this instance, you were sitting in a room with your head of house and the head of the DMLE. Do you doubt that either of them would have acted swiftly to protect your friends? Harry hadn't even thought about it. On discovering they needed help, he just blindly raced from the room. Even his training told him this was the wrong option to take, jumping into an unknown situation when he had very capable help right beside him. No professor, I trust both of them. Then you see why I once more must assign you detentions. Not for saving your friends, but because you had trusted adults on hand to take care of the situation for you. I understand professor, you can't hammer the attackers and not punish me for breaking school rules too. It would leave you open to the charge of favoritism. I'm impressed you can see that Mr. Crow, a certain other first year thought I was picking on him when handing out punishment. I feel in this case though, two nights with me working on transfiguration should be punishment enough. Harry accepted this decision, knowing it was more a case of extra tuition rather than any form of punishment. Professor McGonagall confirmed this as she walked back into the infirmary with him. I understand you might not want to leave your friends alone for a few days, they are of course welcome to accompany you on your detentions. I will arrange the times once I have dealt with these girls, they are going to keep me busy for now. Phileas was over in a flash. Am I to understand Mr. Crow has detention for his actions today? It was Harry who answered his head of house. Sir, I earned my detentions. I should have let you deal with the problem and for that I apologize. I'm sure Professor McGonagall is also aware I would probably do exactly the same thing again, which is another reason I deserve my detentions. Poppy was still dealing with Miss Granger so Minerva spoke with the injured Miss Patil to discover exactly what happened in that toilet. When the screen came back, Hermione gave Harry a nervous smile and he instantly spotted the difference. You had your front teeth made smaller than they were before. Madam Pomfrey managed to cancel the stinging hex, then shrank my front teeth. She gave me a mirror and asked me to say when to stop. I've always been teased about my teeth being too large. Well I think those doing the teasing were either blind or stupid. Thank you for remaining my friend Hermione, that couldn't have been easy. Harry, easiest decision I ever made. I intend to be your best friend for as long as you'll let me. Harry had her in a tight hug before she could say any more. Thanks Hermione, I'm so glad to hear you say that, and to see you're okay. Padma jumped in front of me and then you arrived, otherwise it would have been a lot worse. Do these morons actually think attacking you is going to see us stop being best friends, that's just stupid. So is them thinking they're better than Hermione because her parents are muggles. They can't pick on my blood status so the fact that the Patil family comes from India gets thrown in my face. Again, do they think I don't look into the mirror every morning? They are just bullies, using whatever words they need to justify their behavior to themselves. Hermione hugged a treated and once more boil free Padma, thanks for sticking by me today, I never had friends who would do that before. I know you would do the same for me. Professor McGonagall has already heard what went on in that toilet, and Madame Pomfrey said we can leave. Shall we take Professor Weasley's advice and head for the Great Hall? Harry led the way with Hermione on his arm, Neville and the twins right behind them. All three Ravenclaws were wondering just what Roger would have to say about this. Lucius had plenty to say when he finally got home, his four days in a ministry holding cell responsible for his rant. 
I knew Fudge was a fucking idiot, but I thought he was at least our fucking idiot, bought and paid for. Cornelius won't get a job cleaning up Al's shit at the post office by the time I've finished with him. As for that bitch Bones, her days are numbered. She'll be top of our master's list. Lucius then noticed his wife appeared distraught, far more than his few days in a cell warranted. This worried her husband as Narcissa was normally so aloof, emotions were for lesser beings. She nervously handed him a scroll. The Gringotts seal on the scroll alerted the head of the Malfoy family this was serious but reading what it contained terrified Lucius more than that blade against his chest. Those bastards are closing down our vaults because of that little shit. I better get right over there, it's going to take most of the 24 hours they've given us to get everything out. His wife though had some really bad news for him. Lucius, that was delivered on Tuesday. The 24 hours has long since passed. What, didn't you tell them I couldn't come to the bank? They said that was not their problem. What about our contacts at the ministry, didn't you get in touch with any of them? I tried everyone we know, I even went to Bones and begged her to let you out for a few hours, all I got were excuses, apologies or doors slammed in my face. Lucius now found himself holding onto the nearest wall to keep him standing upright. Did you manage to get anything out? Narcissa tried not to let her anger show, but didn't quite manage it. You put a cap on how much I could withdraw from the Malfoy vaults, 100,000. He was now leaning on the wall. That won't last us very long. It won't last at all, since I don't have it. I offered it to fudge to get you out. I'm facing charges of attempting to bribe the Minister of Magic and the money was confiscated as evidence. Lucius had now slid down the wall and was sitting on the floor as the blows kept coming. I managed to transfer money to Hogwarts and pay for all seven years of Draco's education but, apart from taking my jewels, I was blocked from doing anything else. All we have left is the manor and its contents. Just as he was thinking they had reached rock bottom, Lucius discovered there was more to come. We also have a basket full of scrolls, every single one of them thanking us for our efforts but they no longer require us for their committee or board. Someone has really put the word out, just what the hell happened in Hogwarts on Monday. It was only now beginning to dawn on Lucius exactly what had happened in that classroom, he'd been trussed up and then stuffed better than any Christmas turkey. He swore vengeance on everyone involved in this conspiracy, especially Potter, Crow or whatever the little bastard called himself. Lucius of course had contingency funds stashed where no one else could find them. Their lifestyle may take a downturn but they were a long way from being Weasley poor. The Malfoys' change in circumstances would certainly put a swift end to funding anyone else. Those associates who had become reliant on what was basically a handout were now going to have to look elsewhere. The Ravenclaw trio were at breakfast and looking forward to their extra defense lessons over the next two days. Bill had discussed suitable times with Harry's father and both had thought the weekends would be best. Harry had received word from his father to say that the curse breaker was now fully involved in their plans and could be totally trusted. With Bill now timetabled to be in the castle Monday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday, not forgetting Master Pitsley on a Friday, Harry felt a lot better about the Hogwarts situation. That one of their own had been involved in attacking Padma and Hermione had put a strain on mealtimes at the Ravenclaw table. Most of the house new chambers was ambitious but all considered her actions to be a step too far. Hearing that there were advanced lessons on any subject available was always going to break through any awkward barriers amongst Ravenclaws. Harry had been politely deflecting requests to join them in these lessons all morning. No one was getting too upset at being told these lessons were restricted to just the four of them, Padma's twin sister couldn't even bag a place, though most thought this was because her motives for wanting to attend clearly weren't purely academic ones. Harry was already sharing his defense tutor with the rest of first year, the remainder of the school were stuck with study periods while the headmaster searched for a replacement. There were also another six first year claws sitting at the table with wide grins on their faces, Harry's potions tutor had allowed him to invite more of his friends to take his class. Every single person in three houses of Hogwarts understood those smiles, and wished they were wearing one just like it. Getting out of classes with Snape was certainly a good enough reason to smile. Harry was unconsciously feeding Urgit a bit of his breakfast while reading the letter his beautiful snowy owl had just delivered. His father was passing on a warning that the prophet had finally picked up on the very large hints that had been getting dropped on him for the last few days. Gringotts had even taken the most unusual stance of affording the newspaper a statement. Harry was chuckling to himself when Hermione asked him what was so funny. As he noticed the prophet being delivered, Harry told his best friend that the entire hall would find out in the next few minutes. The ministry had been conducting what amounted to a charm offensive on Harry and the goblins, passing on little details to the press like how the boy who lived was not only healthy from his years at Gringotts, but incredibly fit. The prophet left no young witches in any doubt what they meant by Harry being incredibly fit. They were currently running a competition, where they would pay handsomely for a picture of the young savior. No mention of any returning dark lord was even hinted at. Hermione had teased Harry that a photograph of him in his training gear would be worth a fortune, and how she wished her camera wasn't sitting in her bedroom back home. Harry had gotten his own back by offering to let her take said photograph, in exchange for a picture of Hermione in her Nike training clothes. It didn't take that long for a screaming Malfoy to rush toward the Ravenclaw table and throw his copy of the Prophet at Harry. You thieving goblin bastard, you stole my inheritance. Harry calmly stood to face the enraged boy as, for once, the staff moved quickly to intervene. Both the heads of house were on the scene to ensure this conflict didn't escalate beyond words. Mr. Malfoy, the only part of your statement I agree with is that I am a goblin. Now, will you retract and apologize, or must we take this further? It clearly says in the Prophet that the goblins have seized the Malfoy vaults, how is that not stealing? Harry didn't let the Slytherin's rage affect him, he'd been expecting this confrontation since reading the letter from his father. The Prophet must have made a slight error. Those vaults belong to Gringotts, and are rented by the Malfoy family. As with any rental agreement, there are always conditions attached. An adult witch or wizard attempting to attack a young goblin with their wand certainly breaks those conditions and will see them kicked out of Gringotts. When my father heard what the head of the Malfoy family had attempted, he went straight to the director. It should also be noted that, as per the conditions of rental, your father was given 24 hours to retrieve anything he wanted from those vaults, before they were sealed. My father couldn't get there on time. 
Again, the conditions of the rental contract allow for this. Had your father been too ill to get to the bank, the 24 hours would have been suspended until he was able to attend. In accordance with the conditions of the rental contract, being locked in a ministry cell is not an agreed and acceptable condition for suspension so the 24 hours lapsed. It's standard Gringotts banking practice that's taught to every young goblin, and perfectly legal. Phileas then asked a question he already knew the answer to, but wanted everyone else to hear. What happens to the contents of those sealed vaults? Harry almost smiled at his head of house but that would ruin what he was trying to achieve here. Because the vaults were not emptied in the allotted time, the bank will continue to take its small, annual rental fee for the continued use. The rest of the contents will remain untouched until someone is able to claim it. Realization began to sink in for some but Harry wanted no misunderstandings here. In the case of the Malfoy vaults, that would be Draco when he came of age. This is of course assuming that he himself hasn't already broken those same banking conditions. Just to be clear Mr. Malfoy, publicly calling me a thieving goblin bastard, over this matter shatters those conditions. Harry gave Draco a moment to allow that information to sink in before speaking again. Once more Mr. Malfoy, will you retract and apologize, or must we take this further? Draco was many things but he wasn't a complete moron. The goblins had the Malfoys by the short and curlies, and he'd just given them a perfect excuse to yank those hairs out by the root. It was time to grovel, no matter how distasteful. Being poor was a far worse fate than eating some humble pie. I apologize unreservedly Mr. Crow, both for my lack of manners and the ill-informed comments I made. I now clearly see my statement was in error and retract every word spoken. I was not aware of what was involved in closing those vaults and acted in haste and anger. Perfectly understandable Mr. Malfoy, even if it was regrettable. I'm quite prepared to accept your apology and forget the entire incident, this time. Draco bowed in thanks, before turning to leave the Great Hall. The entire castle now knew Crow owned his ass. The very thought of that same ass dressed in second-hand robes for the rest of his life was more than enough for Draco to keep his head up and defend his decision to anyone. He'd taken the only option available to him, and would continue to do so until he reached 17. Then he would be moving the entire Malfoy fortune elsewhere before seeking his revenge. This required an urgent letter home to his father. Both heads of house returned to the staff table, content the matter had been resolved without breaking any school rules, while Harry sat back down to his interrupted breakfast. Hermione was reading Malfoy's discarded paper but had a question that the prophet didn't answer. Gringotts actually have an official statement on the matter printed in the prophet. It covers in detail everything you just said, including listing the conditions that are considered a breach of contract. Malfoy could have saved himself the embarrassment if he'd only finished reading. I suppose that Malfoy loses Vault's headline was as far as he got. It doesn't mention though why his mother couldn't just move their valuables. Padma supplied the answer to her muggle-born friend. No head of a Pablood family would give his wife access to everything, probably too frightened they would be robbed blind. Harry didn't know this, and it went against the information he did have. My mum did, dad had her assigned full access to the Potter vaults. There were obviously things only the head of the Potter family could do, but those apart, everything was equal. This intrigued both his friends though it was Padma who asked how he knew this. My father is the senior accounts manager at Gringotts, the Potter family account is the most senior at the bank. My father knew both my mum and dad, and liked them very much. He says I've got my mother's eyes. Your mum must have been beautiful. The words were out before it dawned on Hermione what she was saying. Padma was sitting watching both of them turn shades of pink and decided to help out, though she would tease Hermione mercilessly when she got her alone later. Hey Harry, I think you could get Malfoy to clean our shoes for us. I think you could get Malfoy to do just about anything you wanted. That is not the goblin way Padma. Maybe not, but you have to admit it would be funny. This cracked the three of them up. Bill entered the great hall to see three of his students laughing together, he couldn't help but compare them to his two youngest siblings. Ginny now sat enthralled as Bill told tales of the real Harry after dinner. He didn't want his sister simply switching her fantasy but was indulging Ginny at the moment. Watching Ron's face as he described what Harry had done to the nine older students was worth it. His mother and father had been on Ron's case all week and his youngest brother now couldn't wait to return to Hogwarts. Taking the carrot and stick approach, Bill was using some of his extra salary to buy Ron a new wand later today. He also promised new robes if he finished all the homework Bill had gotten from Minerva for him. He wasn't entirely happy with having to coerce Ron into doing something but there weren't too many other options available at the moment. The youngest Weasley brother was in the last chance saloon as far as his Hogwarts education was concerned. Bill and Percy were taking on the task of ensuring Ron didn't blow it. He could practically feel Dumbledore's eyes boring into his back while the Gringotts employee walked toward his students, Bill was certain the approach would be coming soon. A. N. Thanks for reading. Best friends forever. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, I write purely for my own enjoyment, making no money for my efforts. Since I spend many hours every week writing each chapter, I'm hardly likely to write something I don't enjoy reading. Unfortunately that means no ex overs slash, lemons, dark h, hour, Miss Granger partnered with anyone other than Harry and certainly no children named Albus Severus. If this is not to your taste, no problem. At last count, there were almost half a million Harry Potter fan fix on this site alone, I am sure there must be something for everyone amongst them. I also tend to class my stories as, general, since I rarely know where they will end up. If readers want to attach labels like, bashing fic, to this story, that is their choice. Chapter 11. The classroom door opened though most of the room's current occupants didn't notice they now had a visitor. Padma and Neville were practically dead on their feet, exhaustion clearly visible in their features. Hermione was certainly flushed and tired but Harry hardly looked out of breath. Bill was finishing their first lesson by hammering his point home. The fitter you are, the longer you can last in a fight. It just may be the difference between getting away or being seriously hurt. That is why we will practice, practice, and practice again. Hermione was breathing heavily, knackered from dodging spells and her repeated attempts to cast a strong shield, and she hadn't yet learned one spell to fight back with. She was flustered, sweaty and certainly not a happy young witch. Professor Weasley, what if I just take out a gun and shoot the bad guy? 
It was Hermione's idea of a joke, thinking of her favorite scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, but the person who just entered didn't take it as such. Dumbledore didn't think it was funny at all. Miss Granger, firearms are abhorrent to the magical community, anyone using one against a witch or wizard would see themselves shunned by magical society. They should never be used. Hermione couldn't believe what she was hearing so asked the headmaster for clarification. My father is a member of a shooting club, he could put a couple of bullets into you from 100 yards away in the time it takes to cast a shield. Are you saying this is wrong? I do not doubt your facts, Dumbledore said this in such a condescending manner that it was clear he didn't believe this feat was possible. All I am saying is what would happen if you, a witch, were to use this abomination on someone else? And just who makes up these rules? Hermione didn't wait for an answer but turned to Harry, wanting to hear the only opinion that mattered to her. Harry's answer showed his inexperience with relationships, best friends or any other kind. Goblins like to look their opponents in the eye before they kill them. Hermione could actually feel the smugness radiating from Dumbledore, even though the headmaster was currently behind her. Her lip was trembling at what she perceived as Harry's betrayal. I'll tell you what Harry, while you're looking into Voldemort's eyes, I'll shoot the mad bastard in the head. I don't care if no one ever speaks to me again, at least you will be alive. If you let others set the rules, you'll be dead, because Voldemort certainly won't let any stupid rules stop him getting what he wants. With that, Hermione ran out the door in tears. Harry looked to Neville for some clue as to what had just happened, his friend shrugged his shoulders as he had no help to offer. Harry, I don't even know what a gun is. Padma just about managed to find enough breath to huff at Harry. It doesn't matter what a gun is, she was right and you were wrong. Now get after Hermione and tell your best friend that, you moron. It was a worried Harry who shot out the room after Hermione. Albus as usual was able to turn any situation to his advantage. As it would appear your lesson is now over, could I have a private word with your professor? It might be a polite dismissal, but Padma and Neville still knew they were being dismissed. Bill had already decided he wouldn't make any of this easy for the old man. He talked over with Barchoke the best way to handle this approach and they both agreed Dumbledore would expect to have to wear the Gringotts employee down, so that's what Albus was going to have to do. He decided to make it as awkward as possible right from the start. It will have to be a quick word Albus, I have places to be and things to do this afternoon. Albus hated having to rush these kind of discussions, where was the room for finesse in that? As William was currently putting on his cloak and getting ready to leave, he really had no other option. You seem to enjoy teaching and I was wondering just how attached you were to working for the goblins. Bill just laughed, yes I enjoy tutoring but it is such a small part of my new position, not something I fancy doing full time. I would miss my other duties too much. Just what are these other duties? Perhaps we could find something similar to interest you within the castle. Albus Dumbledore, you know I can't talk about that, even more so with someone who's currently barred from Gringotts. Bill thought that was enough for a first encounter so bade a disappointed Dumbledore good day. Hermione may have been training for just over a week now but Harry had been doing exercise routines for years, he quickly caught up with the upset young witch. Hermione, you were right and I was wrong. At that Hermione turned to face him. What was I right about Harry? Panic flashed through him for a second before he fought it down. Panic led to mistakes and he couldn't afford to make one now. He gently took her hand and kissed the back of it while his mind worked out just what he was going to say. I don't know anything about guns, and not much more about offensive spells, but you were right. I cannot let outside forces determine the rules of a fight, because there are no rules in a fight. Hermione almost managed a smile. That's all I was trying to say Harry. Guns might not be the answer, but we shouldn't just dismiss anything out of hand. You have been trained to use a blade, and appear expert with it. I don't think I could use that method on someone. If it was to save my parents or my friends though, I think I could use a gun. I'm pretty sure I could have pulled a trigger to shoot that troll in the infirmary. It's a cultural difference Harry, something to be worked out, not dismissed as irrelevant. He was beginning to understand what his best friend was meaning. The muggle way would be guns, the goblins would use a blade up close while wizards would stand and fire curses at each other. What you're saying is that I should rule nothing out. Hermione now flung her arms around him and held Harry close. You said you've got to fight him but I don't want you to, I just want the bastard dead and you alive. No chivalry, no jewels at dawn, you can look him in the eyes after you've killed him, sneak up behind and cut his head off. You gave that troll every chance before being forced to kill it. Don't give Voldemort a chance, because he won't give you one. She was crying while holding him tight, Harry's arms around Hermione gave her the courage to say what was on her mind. I've never had a best friend before Harry so I don't know if what we have is normal or not. What I do know is that I never want to lose this, ever. Between deranged dark lords and every witch under the age of 25 wanting a piece of you, I feel I'm going to get left behind. Hermione was suddenly experiencing blood flow issues as Harry's arms held her even tighter, that wizard didn't know his own strength. His words though pumped joy to every part of her body. I will never abandon you Hermione. As far as I am concerned, we will be best friends forever. He then buried his head in her bushy hair as she whispered, best friends forever, in his ear. Hermione was giddy, whether from happiness or lack of oxygen to the brain she didn't really care at this point. A droll voice she had come to know so well spoilt this perfect moment. Hey Harry, judging by the color of her face, Hermione really needs to take a deep breath about now. I also think you should let her feet touch the floor again. It wasn't until Harry's grip slackened that Hermione realized he'd lifted her off the ground, Harry really didn't know his own strength. I'm sorry Hermione, I guess I got carried away. She gave him a grade 1 new improved version smile. It's fine Harry, I'm sorry too for causing this. Padma's droll voice once more interrupted. Are you sorry for swearing in front of the headmaster? Certainly impressed the hell out of me. What, oh my, do you think I'll get detention, should I apologize? This had been a major clue to Harry that his best friend was really upset, he'd never heard Hermione swear before. I think you should get house points for saying you wanted the mad bastard Voldemort dead. Neville glanced nervously at his two friends. So are you two okay again? Nod saw him continuing, sorry I wasn't much help Harry. 
That's okay, Neville. Two clueless males here. Just as well we've got Padma and Hermione to keep us right. Quote ellipsis. And don't you forget it, Crow. See, Hermione, I knew the hat put him in Ravenclaw for a reason. I don't know why it put me in Gryffindor. I was rubbish at defense today. You'll get it, Neville. Hermione and I have been training in the morning. It definitely helps. I don't care how much it helps. I am not getting up at ridiculous hours to go running, and certainly not wearing anything like Hermione dresses in to do so. My father would cast me out the family for even mentioning clothes like that. The pink tinges both her friends managed was another victory for Padma, and helped with taking their minds of why they were fighting in the first place. Everyone though decided it would be a good idea to have a shower before heading down to lunch. At breakfast on Monday, the headmaster introduced the new defense against the dark arts professor. Professor Keegan was a small, mousy man with receding gray hair and a developing paunch. He stood and nervously acknowledged the students as Dumbledore introduced him. The wizard appeared terrified of his own shadow but at least wasn't wearing a turban. Penelope had told the first years that Hogwarts defense teachers had gotten progressively worse every year she'd been here. Professor Keegan didn't seem capable of bucking that trend. The Ravenclaw first years were now all looking toward Harry, and he didn't disappoint. Curse Breaker Weasley will still be tutoring me at our normal time for defense. The rest of first year are welcome to join those lessons. He didn't say any more, too engrossed in the letter urge it had delivered. Hermione noticed the amount of concentration Harry was affording the parchment in his hands and asked the obvious. Anything wrong Harry? Oh I think father is being sneaky, I'll know more after speaking with Curse Breaker Weasley. He could see Hermione already beginning to fret that something was wrong so decided to tell her now. Every Halloween, while the wizarding community celebrate, my father and I have a little family ritual that we do. The reason I loathe being referred to as the boy who lived is because that stupid title only tells half the story. People tend to forget what else happened that night, my mum and dad were murdered. Hermione instinctively reached for her best friend's hand, offering comfort for Harry while wondering just what this ritual was. She soon found out. My father takes me to the cemetery where my mum and dad are buried and we spend a few hours there, I sit and tell them everything that's happened to me since the last time we talked. Father has asked me if I want to invite you along this year. Hermione was overwhelmed at this development but needed to be sure Harry wanted her there. She couldn't think of anything more personal than this. What do you think Harry? You said it had become a family ritual, do you want someone else there? Hermione, I would love you to be there beside me. I want to introduce my mum and dad to my best friend. I just think my father is being sneaky about it. This must be some goblin thing I don't understand Harry, so you're going to have to explain that. Harry squeezed her hand and told her part of the truth. To get out of the castle for the day, you need a parental permission slip. I think my father will be contacting your mum and dad the minute I say yes. I also have a sneaky suspicion that the subject of guns will find its way into whatever conversation they have. Oh Harry, that's brilliant. I wrote to my father expressing your opinion that this shouldn't be a fight, it would seem he agrees with you. I just hope he doesn't frighten your parents off. Again Hermione was confused, she was getting used to it though from hanging around with Harry. You lost me again Harry. Have you told your parents that your best friend has a powerful psychotic nutter trying to kill him? If they're as smart as you, they'll grab the daughter and head for the hills. Getting you as far away from danger as possible would definitely be the smart move. I certainly wouldn't blame them if they did. Well I bloody would, this was said loud enough to attract attention, causing Padma to run interference for them. She started chatting to Terry about their herbology homework and soon had dragged another two first years into the discussion. Hermione lowered her voice so anyone other than Harry would have trouble hearing what she was saying. My parents know I was in the infirmary when that troll paid a visit, they also know who saved me. I've described in great detail how you and Padma stood up for their daughter when those girls ganged up on me, we both know Neville would have been beside us too if he'd known. My mum is over the moon that I have friends now who would do that for me. That I'm exercising and taking extra lessons on how to defend myself has my dad pretty chuffed too. Hermione hung her head as she said the next part. That was not the first time I had been faced with a group of bullies, it was the first time I had friends rushing to help me. My parents knew my main hope for Hogwarts was to make some friends, and that I've managed to do that. I've never been happier and they will certainly not drag me out the castle because your father speaks to them about guns. Harry had to hope Hermione would be a decent judge of her parents' reactions, what really worried him was just how much his father would reveal. They had plans for after their visit to the graveyard this Halloween, one of which Hermione certainly couldn't accompany him on. Just what was his father up to? Their trip down to Herbology allowed the rest of first year to hear the news that they could continue the defense lessons with Professor Weasley. Malfoy immediately but politely declined the offer, being quickly followed by Crabbe, Goyle and Parkinson. Ron didn't need to withdraw, he was never included in the first place. Ron had returned to the castle with his new wand tucked away in the pocket of his new robes. His mum and dad had badgered and harried the youngest son every chance they could while he'd been home. With Ginny not talking to him because he tried to attack her hero, it had been a pretty dismal time for the youngest male Weasley at the burrow. That his mother also forbade him any second helpings, and stopped all his, snacks, left the young Gryffindor desperate to get back to Hogwarts. Breakfast was enough to tell him his problem still existed though, namely no seconds. His father had been so angry and had actually went mental at him for the first time in Ron's short life. His dad's temper appeared to be driven not only by the fact his son had fired those curses, but also that Ron hadn't apologized afterwards. His father had laid down the law, apologize by Saturday or he would be getting dragged back to the burrow by Bill on Sunday. He would have to chose his moment carefully, there were all different definitions of, public, and Ron intended to do the deed with as few people there as possible. After talking to his defense tutor, Harry was ready to kick himself. Only his need to conceal the package he'd just been slipped stopped him. Of course his father would have to contact the Grangers over Harry's immediate plans, the rest had just followed from there. Curse Breaker Weasley had already contacted Hermione's parents, and Harry was delighted they had said yes to his idea. Bill was contacting him again on Thursday and would now arrange a meeting between the Grangers and his father to discuss Hermione's participation in their plans for Halloween. 
Now all Harry had to do was keep a secret from Hermione for a few days, easier said than done. Hermione had noticed a change in her best friend over the last few days, it may be subtle but it was there. There was nothing subtle about tonight though, all through their astronomy lesson Harry had been like a little kid on Christmas Eve. Professor Sinistra had barely dismissed them when Hermione dragged Harry over to a quiet spot of the astronomy tower to demand some answers. Okay Crow, spill it, I want to know what's going on. Harry's wide smile at this may have been confusing but his next action just blew her socks off. He leaned in and kissed her. It was only on the cheek but it was from Harry, it was her first kiss and they were under the moonlight. It was only when he spoke that she got a grip and realized just what had been going on. Happy birthday Hermione. Realizing that it was now well past midnight, it hit Hermione that she had just turned 12. How did you know? It's my duty as a best friend to know when your birthday is, I'll bet you know mine. Harry, the entire castle knows when yours is, I'm surprised it isn't a public holiday. Hermione was stopped from saying any more when Harry pressed the present bill had slipped him into Hermione's hands. It was an exquisite inlaid and lacquered wooden box that measured about 8 inches by 2, though wasn't even an inch thick. She opened what she guessed was a jewelry case, only to snap the lid closed after barely a glance. Harry, oh shit Harry, this is way, way too much. It's only my birthday, this is birthday, Christmas, Easter and anything else you can think of for the next decade. Harry's smile never wavered as he opened the box and took out what was inside. What we have here is a cultural difference Hermione. Goblins don't celebrate Christmas, Easter or any other wizarding holidays, so nothing is more important to us than someone's birthday. This news rocked Hermione back on her heels. You don't celebrate Christmas Harry. Padma and Neville had hung back to give their friends a moment, having been in on Harry's plan. Both had gifts for Hermione that they would give her tomorrow. Padma knew how excited Harry had been about this and didn't want her friend getting sidetracked and disappoint him. Hermione, the Patil family doesn't celebrate Christmas either. As Harry said, it's a cultural thing. Now stop going off at a tangent and show me what Harry got you, he wouldn't even give us a clue. While this had been going on, Harry had used the time to fasten the bracelet around Hermione's wrist. Her first glance at it in the box had told the birthday which Harry's gift was beautiful, seeing it on her wrist changed that opinion. Beautiful just didn't do this work of art justice. The bracelet was made from gold yet of a design she'd never seen before. There were five gold discs that had tiny sapphires around their edges. These discs were encased in a filigree design that would have all other goldsmiths sweeping with envy, before taking up lumberjacking. Compared to this, they might as well have been practicing their trade using axes. Two of the discs had engravings on them that Hermione didn't recognize, the other three though had her heart doing backflips in her chest. The one on the left proclaimed Harry while the right one was engraved with her own name. It was the one in the middle of these two that had tears of joy slowly running down her cheeks, it announced to anyone glancing at her wrist that they would be best friends forever. Padma's hands shot to her face the instant she laid eyes on Harry's gift. Oh Merlin's hairy left buttock. Hermione, that's goblin made jewelry. Hermione thought that would be obvious, since it was a gift from Harry. She didn't understand the emphasis Padma was placing on its manufacturers. Neville was happy that for once he could supply his friends with some answers. Hermione, the goblins are world-renowned metal smiths. They not only make fantastic blades, they have no equal when it comes to making jewelry. What makes it even more sought after is that they hardly ever let any of it fall into wizards or witches' hands. The Longbottom family has one item that has been passed down the family for hundreds of years. Padma was nodding like a lunatic, unable to take her eyes of the bracelet her friend had on her wrist. Hermione, you'll start a riot when you walk into the Great Hall wearing that tomorrow. Please make sure that Bitch Chambers gets a good eyeful of it. This is too fine to wear every day. Harry interrupted the birthday witch. Hermione, I want you to promise you'll never take that off. It contains protective runes carved into two of the discs. Just by being in contact with your skin, the bracelet generates enough protective power that it would easily have deflected both the curses you were hit with last week. Oh shit, 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 enchanted goblin jewelry. Hermione, when anyone asks, just say it was a gift from Harry and act dumb about everything else. Trust me on this, your bracelet is worth its own front page headline in the Prophet. Neville agreed with Padma. Goblin jewelry is extremely rare, your bracelet though might be the only piece of enchanted goblin jewelry not owned by a goblin. All eyes were now on Harry, he chose Hermione's arm that he had placed the bracelet and brought the back of her hand to his lips. It says right there that we will be best friends forever, that to me is priceless. Happy birthday Hermione. Harry then kissed the back of Hermione's hand and had the birthday witch practically swooning. Now I hate to ruin this moment, but if we don't get a move on we could be spending your birthday in detention. Everyone else has left. Professor Sinister emerged from the darkness, loath to break up the cutest thing she'd ever seen. She could hardly wait to tell Minerva in the morning. Aurora agreed with Miss Patil though, and would not be mentioning that Miss Granger's bracelet was enchanted. Not quite everyone has left Mr. Crow. Happy birthday Miss Granger. Now I will escort you four to your houses, just to ensure no one gets detention on such a special day. Harry held out his arm for Hermione and all four followed the astronomy professor. Hermione though took a moment to kiss Harry on the cheek. Thank you Harry, it's absolutely gorgeous and I love it. Both may have been blushing as they made their way along the corridor but their wide smiles could practically light their way back to Ravenclaw Tower. Padma gave Hermione her present before they went down to get Harry for breakfast. It was fun to watch her friend's face change colors as she read the title of the book, 12 Fail Safe Ways to Woo Your Wizard. When Hermione started displaying purple tints in her color scheme, Padma lost her battle with laughter and handed over her friend's real present. It was still a book, though Hermione appeared to appreciate, a score of offensive spells to even the score, far better than her first offering. Padma was behind her friends as they walked into the Great Hall and was pleased to see her prediction was coming true. Hermione's hand was, as usual, through Harry's arm. This appeared to be the perfect angle for the sapphires of her bracelet to catch the light and sparkle. Padma thought young witches possessed skills for sniffing out shiny, sparkly things that would rival any Niffler. When those shiny, sparkly things were worn by another young witch, the poor little Niffler might as well stay in its burrow because it became a no contest. 
There were students in the Great Hall who couldn't read instructions off the blackboards in classrooms yet could tell you what Hermione Granger's bracelet said. When Neville approached the Ravenclaw table with a gift for Hermione, the Canute dropped that it was her birthday. She was delighted with her new book on noble houses and their customs. A red-faced Neville was eventually persuaded to sit beside the trio, but not before Hermione had hugged him and kissed her friend on the cheek in thanks. As usual, Roger had watched the by-play between the friends. He also couldn't help but notice every witch at the table staring at Hermione's birthday present. Hellcrow, you're making the rest of us guys look bad here. Just how are we meant to match that? Harry really liked Roger's joking nature, and answered right back in the same vein. Well Davies, I don't see what's wrong with letting everyone know I have a great best friend. The entire table heard the humor in his voice, they also understood there was steel underlying that humor. A newly returned Chambers sat at the other end of the table, head down and not looking or talking to anyone. Her parents had been livid when they heard what happened, her father was all for contacting the parents of the other girls involved to arrange some collective action against this upstart who'd harmed their children. The prophet had changed everyone's views, or rather their report on what happened to the Malfoys did. The Pabloods were learning a variation on the golden rule, those that have your gold make the rules. Few, if any, felt secure enough in their own wards to trust having their fortunes stored at home. There was also the added problem of those witches and wizards with access to their home. Gringotts protected fortunes not only from robbers but those family members who would think a share of said fortune should rightly be theirs. It was easy for the Gringotts account holder to define exactly who could do what to their vault, telling your brother, mother, greedy in-laws, obnoxious cousins that they weren't welcome in your house had far more significant ramifications. All sniggering at Draco's respectful behavior soon stopped as Pablood after Pablood received the same message from home, do not antagonize Harry Crow. Minerva sat at the staff table and watched over her charges. Her eyes usually focused mostly on her lion cubs but she found her gaze more and more being drawn to the Ravenclaw trio. Mr. Longbottom's acceptance into this group was also very pleasing. Augusta tended to wrap young Neville in cotton wool, making good friends was exactly what the young lad needed. The deputy headmistress couldn't help but think young Harry was surrounding himself with good people. She approved wholeheartedly of his close friends and Master Pitsley had impressed the hell out of her. William Weasley was in her unbiased opinion, one of the finest young wizards to have come through Hogwarts in a long time. Her correspondence with Barchoke was also refreshing. His entire aims were centered around what was best for his son, and he was more than prepared to back that up with gold when needed. She'd listened with great interest to the tale of what had happened after their astronomy class last night and was finding her opinion of Harry matching pomoners. He may be the son of James Potter but he had none of the faults his biological father had at the same age. Now if only Severus could get his head out his ass and see the boy was far more likely than James, they may be able to avert a confrontation that couldn't end well. When Professor Weasley asked them both to wait behind, Hermione started to run through the entire lesson in her mind to discover what she'd done wrong. Bill played along with her fears at the start. Miss Granger, you can thank your best friend for your current predicament. His wide smile would have half the witches in the castle dropping at his feet, Hermione was just pleased this meant she wasn't in trouble with a professor. Your mum and dad wanted me to wish you a happy birthday, oh and give you this. Hermione was so touched by this, she didn't notice Harry moving behind the professor's desk. How was Harry responsible for you seeing my parents? It was Harry who answered her. Well, it was actually my father. When he discovered what I wanted to get you for your birthday, he realized I needed your parents' permission first. Hermione was beginning to wonder if this was a goblin thing again, did giving someone a bracelet signify something more in their culture? That was until she saw what Harry had in his hands. Happy birthday Hermione, I didn't name him yet, figuring I would leave that up to you. Harry gently placed a fluffy black kitten into her hands, Hermione fell in love with her new pet instantly. Oh Harry, he's simply gorgeous. With that goblin sense of humor of yours, the poor thing would probably be saddled with a name like Snowball. Harry couldn't help but smile at his best friend's reaction to his gift. Actually, I was thinking more along the terms of moonlight. Without that light, he would be practically invisible. Hermione had a different memory to associate with Harry's suggestion, it reminded the young witch that her first kiss had been under moonlight on her birthday. She also had to admit that his suggestion was so much better than Blackie, which was the first thing that came into her head. Okay, so moonlight it is. Harry, you're spoiling me. Hermione, you only turned twelve once in your life, why shouldn't that be celebrated? Harry picked up her present from home and offered his arm, he'd heard something outside that had him wanting to leave now. If that prat attempted to spoil Hermione's birthday, there would be hell to pay. Hermione had moonlight cradled in one arm, while her other was linked with Harry. She had been fretting about spending her first birthday away from home, but this year she had friends to share it with. Hermione thought this was already her best birthday ever. Ron was walking back from his defense lesson when he spotted the Patil bin standing outside a classroom with Neville. He didn't think there could be a better opportunity for a public apology than this. Miss Patil, I would like to apologize for hitting you with that curse. It was purely accidental as you were never my intended target. Padma's gaze hardened as she stared Ron down, the Ravenclaw witch well remembered the taste of slugs, and what getting cursed had led to in the infirmary. Padma had no intention of giving this Weasley an easy out. What about Hermione, the girl you intended the curse to hit? Ron's temper momentarily fled but he managed to get control of it, why couldn't this bin just say she accepts and get this over with? I intend to apologize to Miss Granger too. She nodded at that, if Hermione accepts your apology, I will too. Neville couldn't help but prod the Pratt. This is your lucky day Ron, Hermione will be coming right out that door any minute. Before Ron had time to bolt, he was suddenly faced with Crow and Granger. With retreat no longer an option, he was forced to behave like a Gryffindor. Miss Granger, I would like to apologize for firing a curse at you. Hermione didn't think this day could hold any more surprises but had just been proved wrong. Padma's slight nod gave her the information she was looking for. She hadn't actually been hit with the curse but at least the idiot had apologized to Padma, there was still one thing missing though. What about Harry, isn't he due an apology too? This was a step too far for Ron. What for? It was me who ended up in the infirmary. The growl stopped Ron's rant in its tracks. 
A furious Bill was standing behind Crow and Granger, glaring right at him, Ron needed no further prompting. Mr. Crow, I would like to apologize for attempting to curse you. Harry genuinely liked three of the Weasley brothers, and it was Hermione's birthday. Apology accepted. The two girls quickly followed Harry's led as Bill handed Neville the cat basket and supplies Harry had forgotten about in his haste to leave the room. As the four friends made their way along the corridor, Bill dragged his youngest brother into the classroom by his new robes. I want a word with you Ronnie. A.N. Thanks for reading. A.N. 2. Thanks to Roby C. for his variation on the golden rule. His review made me laugh so I used it in this chapter. Granges and Barchoke and Sharpshard, oh my. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, I absolutely don't own any of the words contained in this chapter and claim only the specific order I placed them in as mine. A.N. I upload weekly because that's how long it takes me to write a chapter. I don't have 50,000 words pre-written, just sitting waiting to be uploaded, I wish I did. At most, when I publish a chapter, the next is in, first draft, format, meaning I'll spend the week refining it while writing the following one. I just put this here because I didn't want anyone to think I was holding out on them. I also think Harry Crow is going to be my longest story yet. Chapter 12. There were six first-year Ravenclaws whose emotions were flying high as kites. Lunch sat forgotten as they described their first potions lesson in great detail, while showing anyone who was even remotely interested their new book. Since this was the Ravenclaw table, anyone who was even remotely interested, meant the entire house, and they all wanted to know where they could get their hands on a potions book like that. Not quite the entire house though, three first years, and a Gryffindor interloper, were quietly studying books of a different sort. They were drawn out of their intensive studying by a pair of voices. Quidditch through the ages. The noble sport of warlocks. He flew like a madman. Do our eyes deceive us George or are these four swatting up for their flying lesson today? Oh I think it's worse than that Fred, the order of the Aves appear to be afraid of flying. Perhaps we should have named this one Penguin, what do you think Robin? Robin was swift to kick this pair of Joker's assumptions right back at them. The only time my gran would let me out of her sight was when I was in the greenhouses, she wouldn't even allow a broom in the manor. Hermione quickly rallied to support her friend against the red-headed dynamic duo, citing her own circumstances. I didn't know magic was real until I got my letter, how was I supposed to practice flying on a broom? Harry was right behind them in defending the group's right to be nervous. Goblins live underground, not much scope for flying there unless you're a bat. We tend to use brooms for sweeping. An entirely different outlook on the matter was provided by Padma. I was raised with flying carpets, I imagine brooms will be sore on your bum. Given the choice, I'll take a bit of Persian rug under me any day. All eyes were now on Padma. What? It's only Europe that bans flying carpets, and the riddle of why that's the case is easily solved. It was only because the broom manufacturers pushed for it, they didn't want the competition. Before we moved to Britain, we had a much-loved carpet that we traveled around the country on. We used to have family picnics while traveling, try doing that on a broom. This idea appealed to Hermione. I think I would like that much better than a broom, you could even fit seat belts. Neville didn't know exactly what a seat belt was but grasped the general concept. I like the sound of being strapped in. It's not so much the flying that bothers me, more the falling from a great height. Wait until you see your first Quidditch match. Yeah, Fred and I are the Gryffindor beaters. Both twins were very proud of this achievement but Miss Granger wasn't too impressed. Harry and Hermione had been sharing, Quidditch through the ages so she at least knew what a beater was. So you two beat these bludger things at other players to try and knock them off their brooms. And this is the most popular sport. Harry cut her off before she could say any more. Cultural differences Hermione, let's at least wait until we've seen a match before saying any more. You're right Harry, the reasons behind why people play golf also escape me. The blank looks encouraged Hermione to explain. They use clubs to hit this little white ball into a small hole in the grass that can be a couple of hundred yards away. They waited for more before George asked the obvious. What happens after they get the ball in the hole? Oh, they pick it out and move on to the next hole. The twins' riotous laughter caught everyone's attention. Oh Fred, the good. Yes oh brother of mine, lesser wizards would have been sucked right into their ploy whatever it was. Quote ellipsis. But not the Weasley twins. Your delivery was perfect Hermione, a beautiful mixture of annoyed innocence. Yeah, it was just your final part that let you down. You need to invent something a bit more believable than that goof game if you really want to hook people. Apart from that, your prank was excellent. We just stepped over here to say thanks for forgiving Ron and you try to catch us out, you guys are brilliant. The twins walked away laughing while the rest of their house studied these people who were brave enough to take on the Weasley twins. Harry had some words of advice. Cultural differences Hermione, and shut it Roger. Barchoke stood to welcome the Grangers to his office. I am Barchoke, senior accounts manager at Gringotts, and Harry's father. I would like to thank you both for coming here today, especially since I know you are very busy. Oh it was no trouble, in fact I really enjoyed the method of transport your young Mr. Weasley used to get us here, a porky I believe he called it. He's using something similar to take him all the way to Scotland now, to give the kids their extra defense lessons. Dan smiled and offered his hand. Hi, I'm Dan Granger, and this is my better half Emma. Please excuse my wife, she gets rather excited by all this magic. We got a letter from Hermione this morning telling us that the kids flew on brooms yesterday, I think that's enough to get any parent excited. Barchoke shook the offered hand, before doing the same with Emma. They'd barely been in his office a minute yet already showed more courtesy than wizards he'd been dealing with for years. Dan had a question that he wanted answered before they went any further. Can I ask if this meeting is with a senior banking official or the father of our Hermione's best friend? He was already liking these people and invited them to sit before answering. I've worked my entire life to get where I am inside Gringotts, something I'm proud of. Nothing gives me more pride and pleasure though than being known as Harry's father, that is who you are speaking with today. Emma was delighted with this news. I really want to thank your son for making Hermione's time at Hogwarts such a happy experience, especially his actions with those bullies. 
That had happened before at her primary school and it was left to Dan and I to go down there after the event. Mom, I feel it is I who must thank your daughter. I watched my son grow up in a world that was not his own and worried over how Harry would adapt to Hogwarts. He has led a very lonely childhood, throwing himself into his studies to compensate for the lack of close friends. Harry and your daughter met on the express and were like two kindred spirits, they have been inseparable since. I have had the pleasure of taking lunch in their company. In my humble opinion, they bring out the best in each other. Hearing this had Emma beaming but Dan had his practical hat on, this was a goblin sent opportunity to get some answers. Barchoke, I hope you don't mind me asking, but some of the things in Hermione's letters are confusing to us. The crow potter dual identity is hard enough to understand, never mind the goblin, wizard issue, but we don't know where to start with the whole, Hogwarts champion, thing. I find it hard to believe the school lets a first year walk around with a sword, though I will be eternally grateful that they do. Barchoke offered tea, saying this could take some time, he was slowly becoming aware this couple would now play a part in Harry's life. With Harry and the daughter being practically joined at the hip, there simply was no other alternative. He told them the entire tale in chronological order, starting with the Dark Lord hearing a prophecy before trying to kill a baby. No matter how many times he told the story of Harry's relatives not wanting the boy, he was never able to fully hide his anger at the deed. The goblin was delighted to see that anger shared by these loving parents. He rounded the story off with a blow-by-blow -blow account of the troll incident, including who had released the creature into the castle and why. The Grangers had heard most of the details from Hermione, it was just hearing how it all fitted together that knocked him back a bit. Dan was the first to recover, and showed he really understood the problem. Can I assume you know why this guy won't stay dead? Yes, sorry but the method he used must remain a secret for now. You have my word though that we are doing everything in our power to ensure this creature will soon stay permanently dead. This talk of death sent a shiver down Emma so she pressed ahead with what she wanted to ask from the minute she'd stepped into Barchoke's office. Please don't think me forward, you've actually met Hermione while we've only read about Harry. Do you have a picture we could see? Asking any proud parent to see a picture of their child will always get a yes. Barchoke moved behind his desk and removed a framed picture from a concealed drawer. This was taken the morning he left for Hogwarts. Emma was presented with Harry in his, Mr. Darcy, Geisen and, oh my, escaped her lips before she had time to engage her brain. Emma had no difficulty in thinking of Harry and Hermione as kindred spirits. Barchoke's description of his son having no close friends and throwing himself into his studies was scarily familiar to both Grangers. Hermione had supplied some of the details of her journey to Scotland, with what she'd heard here today Emma could now fill in the blanks. Two lonely children reaching out to each other as they shared a compartment for hours, arriving at Hogwarts as each other's first friend. Hermione had said she didn't know what made her ask Harry if he wanted to share that compartment, one glance at the picture was enough for her mother to know the answer. Her little girl was smitten. She passed the picture over to her husband. Your son is a very handsome young man, I mean wizard, oh goblin. I'm sorry, perhaps you can see why this is so confusing for us. Barchoke actually laughed, Mom, I was happy with handsome. Hermione mentioned getting out of school for a day to accompany Harry on some family event, she said we needed to sign a permission form. Opening up a folder, Barchoke handed the correct form to Emma. Dan though had caught a glimpse of a lot more paperwork with their name on it. Can I ask what else you have in that folder? Barchoke handed the entire folder to Dan before beginning to explain exactly why he needed that folder. My son has many people who seem determined to play a part in his life, your daughter has already suffered because of this and I can only sincerely apologize. Can I assume that is why Hermione was given this bracelet she's been raving about? We thought Harry was getting her a kitten for her birthday, not both. I'll be honest with you Barchoke, while I really like the protection angle, the father in me isn't sure how to handle my 12-year-old daughter receiving jewelry even she classed as, ridiculously expensive, especially from a young lad we've never met. The Neasel kitten was indeed earmarked as Hermione's present, but seeing his best friend attacked affected Harry deeply. He wanted her protected, and knew we possessed the means to do so. Dan and Emma both expressed their agreement and gratitude at that while Barchoke explained the, ridiculously expensive, part. There is a phenomenon that we goblins neither understand nor can control, why wizards and even muggles will pay ludicrous amounts to own something no one else has. Take a piece of canvas, slap some paint on it and you may end up with a nice picture. Depending who slapped that paint on, the picture might be worth hundreds, thousands or millions. Our goldsmiths have a reputation for being the very best at what they do. Since we rarely allow our jewelry to pass out of goblin hands, the wizards will pay ludicrous amounts for it. I think I see what you are saying, something is only worth whatever value people are prepared to pay for it. Exactly Emma, James and Lily Potter set up a trust fund for their son attending Hogwarts. Buying that bracelet as a goblin barely put a dent in that fund, there wouldn't have been enough gold in that trust vault for a wizard to buy the same item. It was a confused Dan who asked what seemed a glaringly obvious question. With such a lucrative market, why is there not more jewelry being sold? That would never work, due to the way we goblins are possessive about the items we make. Special permission from the director is needed before an item can pass to someone who is not a goblin, that signed permission is contained in the folder in front of you. This permission comes with some pretty restrictive conditions. The worst one being, should the person gifted the item ever decide to sell it, the giver is duty-bound to repurchase the item, almost certainly at the far higher prices those outside Gringotts would pay. Since the giver must have these funds available before permission is granted, it is perhaps understandable that this is a very rare occurrence. Dan thought he'd picked up on an inconsistency. I thought you said Harry wouldn't be able to afford that bracelet at wizard prices. He was answered by a smiling barchoke. I said his trust fund didn't hold enough, that is a mere drop in the ocean of the Potter wealth. Oh dear, I hope all this talk of money doesn't make what we wanted to ask seem mercenary now. Hermione wrote that Harry didn't celebrate Christmas, we wanted to invite him to spend Christmas with us this year. Emma was fretting until she saw the wide grin now being displayed by the goblin. I'm sure Harry would love to spend the time with Hermione, and it fits perfectly with what I was moving on to next. One of the things I would like to see accomplished this Halloween is the warding of your home, that's what most of the parchment in that folder is concerned with. 
As you know, your daughter currently wears a bracelet that offers her some protection against attack. These wards will perform the same function for your house and its occupants. This had both Granger's more than a little concerned. Dan was first to voice his. Do you really think that is necessary? Are we really in danger? No one ever thinks their home will be robbed, flooded or engulfed by flames. That doesn't mean a homeowner shouldn't take sensible precautions to prevent all of these from happening. That is all we are doing here, and you inviting Harry for Christmas allows the Potter account to pay for it. We're more than willing to pay any financial cost involved in protecting our home. The goblin politely interrupted. Sorry Dan, for you as a non-magical to be able to afford this warding scheme, you would probably need to sell your house. By inviting Harry to stay, we can now ward your home as a goblin dwelling, drastically cutting the cost and circumventing any ministerial interference in the process. James and Lily Potter gave their lives to protect their son, they would gladly spend a bit of gold to ensure his continued safety, and that of his best friend's family. Emma had noticed something and couldn't help but raise the matter. You seem to switch Harry from goblin to wizard as the situation suits, rather like having dual nationality. My son had mentioned that Hermione was very smart, it's now easy to see where that comes from. We hope Harry can benefit from this dual nationality at least until he turns 17, then he must choose. The magical community are desperate for Harry to choose them, for the boy who lived to do otherwise would be unthinkable. We intend to exploit this, desperation, to see some wrongs righted. Barchoke knew he had reached a crossroads, this was where he must decide just how much to tell these people. Desperate people can sometimes do foolish things to get what they want. As they look around for ways to influence my son's decision, sooner or later the gaze will rest upon your daughter. They may have known each other less than a month but it is already clear to me that Miss Hermione Granger will be part of my son's life for many years to come. Having met your daughter, I can't tell you how delighted I am by that. I am assuming you will have gathered somewhat the same information from her letters home. Emma was enthusiastically adding her agreement. We had to read her first letter home several times. The handwriting was the same but the letter appeared to have been written by a different girl. I've never known her to be so happy, it's Harry this and Harry that. She does mention other friends, Padma and Neville. I had the pleasure of lunching with all of them, the four are becoming close friends. The witches at Hogwarts have already recognized how close Harry and Hermione are, hence the bullying of your daughter. The Pabloods are bound to have picked up on this already, this being the reason I want your home protected. The Granger's blank looks led to them learning about blood status from a goblin. So Hermione was attacked because they thought my daughter wasn't good enough for your son. Dan was understandably enraged at that. Barchoke did his best to pacify the father's justifiable ire, not by either my son or I, of that I can assure you. Hermione is the same blood status as Harry's mother, and those very same Pabloods class goblins as beasts. Useful beasts to be sure but nevertheless still mere creatures. You will find no support for this blood purity nonsense inside Gringotts. I find it a little convenient that none of this was mentioned before we signed Hermione up for Hogwarts. This comment from Dan drew an answering wry smile from Barchoke, though on a goblin it could be mistaken for a grimace. The last person I heard express sentiments like those was Lily Evans, just after she had become engaged to James Potter. I think the phrase being banded about at the time was that Lily was nothing more than an uppity mudblood trying to better herself. It saddens me to think of how much was sacrificed yet so little actually changed. We intend to use the Ministry's desperation to implement some changes, another reason I want you and your daughter protected. He tried to pass on the gravity of the situation to the parents. Please don't mention any of this to Hermione in your letters, you will see her and Harry on Halloween where a fuller explanation can be given to both. Harry will shortly begin using the press in an attempt to achieve our aims. Since your daughter never leaves his side, this will probably drag her into the spotlight too. The wards we wish to erect will ban entry to all wizards and witches except those specifically allowed. At the moment, that would be Hermione, Harry and Cursebreaker Weasley. Anyone else attempting unauthorized entry will be rebuffed, and set of alarms that will see us rushing to your aid. The last thing Barchoke wanted to do here was scare these people, and this was a lot for a pair of muggles to absorb in one morning. We don't need a decision on this today, and I must emphasize this is purely a precautionary measure. Wards and such a common practice around magical buildings, Gringotts is positively bristling with them. I don't expect any attack on your home but it would seem sensible to take some precautions. We goblins spend our lives protecting precious items, but nothing is more precious to us than our children. Both Grangers shared a moment of thought before Dan answered. I really don't see how we can refuse such a generous offer, and can't wait to see the kids at Halloween. We knew it was going to be difficult being separated from Hermione but had sorely underestimated just how much we would miss her. Only her letters practically glowing with happiness convinced us we have made the right decision. Emma agreed with every word her husband had just said although she had a few questions of her own that she wanted answered. You said you think that our children would be part of each other's lives for years to come. Since they will be spending the next seven years together at Hogwarts, I think this view is perfectly understandable. I would like to know what happens when Harry turns 17. Will his choices affect their friendship? Harry will have a massive decision to make, and to be honest I have no idea what he will choose. All I can do as a father is give my son a good view of all sides to help him reach whatever decision is best for him. That is one of the reasons I was delighted you invited him into your home for the holidays, I want Harry to know there is a world out there beyond Gringotts and even beyond magic. Barchoke then answered Emma's main concern as honestly as he could. Young as they are, already I can't see Harry making any decision that permanently parts him from your daughter. Abandoning his best friend is something my son would never do, that's just not in his makeup. Charging through the school with his sword drawn in an attempt to keep her safe is far more in keeping with Harry's nature. Both Granger parents were pleased to hear this, Hermione's letters home had shocked them with how attached she'd become to this boy in such a short space of time. They were delighted with the opportunity to see the daughter at Halloween, but even more so for the early opportunity to run their eye over this best friend. This all sounds fine, I just wish there was something more we could do. We seem to be reaping all the benefits here without contributing much at all. Barchoke couldn't turn down such an opening. Funny you should say that Dan, something that Hermione said interested us greatly. Urgit delivered a letter to Hermione on Sunday morning that had her squealing with joy, he said yes. 
She then practically had Harry in a headlock as her excitement saw her bouncing up and down next to him. Guys, making a spectacle of yourselves. Again. Oh Padma, he said yes. This is wonderful. We got that bit Hermione, now we need to know who said yes to what, and why it's so bloody wonderful. When Harry said he didn't celebrate Christmas, I wrote to mum and dad about it. They asked his father if Harry could spend Christmas with us, and Barchoke said yes. Do you want to spend Christmas with me Harry? It was only now that Hermione noticed Harry had went as stiff as a board, her best friend then pushed away and shot out his seat. Hermione was momentarily devastated, thinking she had done something wrong, that was until she saw where he was headed. Professor Weasley had just entered with a tall battle-scarred goblin that Harry was now bowing deeply to. Hermione thought this was more like a goblin from Tolkien, as different from Barchoke or Master Pitsley to be almost another species of goblin. Master Sharpshard, you honor me by coming here. That was not my intention Crow. I am hearing disturbing reports that you are going soft. I came here today to see for myself what has become of all the training I lavished on you, get changed. Harry bowed and raced out the door. Phileas had almost choked on his breakfast when he saw who had entered with Bill Weasley. Albus, Minerva, whatever happens we mustn't intervene. Master Sharpshard is the greatest practitioner with a blade I have ever seen, no student will be in any danger and certainly not harmed. Minerva was immediately alarmed. What do you mean Phileas? Think Alastair Moody teaching defense, Master Sharpshard's methods are probably something, Mad Eye, would heartily endorse and quickly adopt. They may seem severe to those watching but Harry will be used to it. Excuse me, I'm going to tell his friends the same, though I fear I may need to place Miss Granger in a body bind. Bill hadn't a clue what was going on here. Master Sharpshard had just informed him earlier that he would be accompanying the curse breaker to Hogwarts today. Watching as Flitwick headed for his students, Bill decided to follow his example. Professor Weasley, is that who taught Harry how to fight with a sword? It was Phileas who answered. Yes Miss Granger, and I must ask you not to attempt to interfere. Master Sharpshard's methods may appear brutal to the uninitiated but he really is the greatest blade in the country. He was interrupted by Hermione's scream. Harry had just ran back into the hall wearing his dragon hide tunic when the large goblin exploded into action, attacking with a huge battle axe that seemed to appear from nowhere. Harry was a blur as he dodged blow after blow, being backed into the entrance hall. That Master Sharpshard was shouting at him in English gave Harry a fair idea just what was happening here. You had a Death Eater under your blade and let him go free. Then faced nine enemies and, not only did you not kill any of them, you left them able to attack again. Have I been wasting my time teaching you crow? Harry now had his shield on his arm, and used it to deflect the attacking axe. He dodged inside to get into knife range, only to be kicked in the chest and sent flying through the doors. He landed in the entrance hall and rolled, knowing the master would be coming after him. While rolling, he abandoned his shield and sheathed his knife. He sprang to his feet with Hermione's screams ringing in his ears but Gryffindor's sword in his hands. Loud clangs reverberated around the entrance hall as Gryffindor's sword skillfully deflected the repeated attacks from the battle axe away from Harry. Hermione was trembling, screaming and shouting at the same time, and only Professor Weasley holding her arms stopped the young witch foolishly rushing in regardless. Seeing Harry apparently now holding his own settled Hermione somewhat, though those around watched this deadly battle in awe. Phileas had given up the blade for a wand but could honestly admit to himself Harry had more raw talent than he had ever possessed. Harry's dragon skin tunic allowed everyone to see his fluid body movements as he wielded Gryffindor's sword like a seamless extension of his body. The lad's developed physique was now easily explained, swinging a blade hour after hour would certainly account for it. Harry was now engrossed in the fight, the clash of his blade deflecting the axe familiar to him from years of training. He'd never wielded a blade quite like this one though, which gave Harry an idea. It was a risk that could cost him dear, then again it wasn't like he'd ever won a match against the master before. As the next opportunity presented itself, Harry didn't parry and deflect the axe blade but let the sword made for Godric Gryffindor meet the weapon's shaft. Normally this would send a jarring force right up his arms, but this was no ordinary sword. It cleaved clean through the shaft. Harry's follow-on attack was then blocked by a short sword that again just seemed to appear in the master's hand. I was partial to that axe crow, that is going to cost you. If anything, the speed of the fight increased, with Harry now swapping to a one-handed grip on the sword and drawing his knife in the other. Harry was soon covered in sweat as Master Sharpshard relentlessly probed and attacked his defenses. He could hear Hermione shouting above everyone else which triggered something in his mind, there are no rules in a fight. As he blocked the next attack on his sword, Harry used his knife to cast a curse they'd learned out the book Padma gave Hermione for her birthday. The cutting curse was so unexpected, it glanced Master Sharpshard's cheek as he dodged a fraction too late. First blood was normally the end of the duel, but with Master Sharpshard you just didn't know what he would do next. The large goblin actually stopped attacking. You cut me with a spell crow. Harry was panting for breath but still kept his guard up. You taught me to use whatever was available in a fight, that's what I had. The loud roar of laughter was completely unexpected. The short sword disappeared as quickly as it came while the now jovial goblin punched Harry's shoulder in a very rare show of affection. It would seem I have taught you well, though I will still be charging your father for my axe you destroyed. Phileas, good to see you again. Can I impose on you to cross swords with crow occasionally? I would hate to see all that skill become rusty from lack of use. This change from rabid attacker to jovial loser threw everyone. Padma though had something to say, or should that be scream? Yeah Harry, you did it. Everyone in the hall had spilled out to watch this fight, one of their own unbelievably winning resulted in loud cheering, and Hermione escaping from Bill's grasp. She hit Harry almost as hard as Sharpshard had earlier, though both her arms were wrapped tightly around him. Harry was holding her while whispering in her ear, cultural differences Hermione, I was in danger of getting my ass kicked, nothing else. The large goblin of course noticed the young witch. Can I assume you were Crow's friend? Harry gave Hermione a reassuring squeeze as she turned to face one of his most important tutors. He was delighted to see her bow. Well met Master Sharpshard, I am Hermione Granger, Harry's best friend. She then held out her hand for the goblin to shake, her bracelet shining on her wrist. 
The large goblin bowed back before accepting her offered hand. Well met Miss Granger. His deep laugh once more rolled around the entrance hall. Barchoke told me you were quite the one, now I've seen it for myself. Moments ago, you were ready to attack me with your bare hands to protect your friend, but now you greet me with honor. Wear that bracelet with pride Miss Granger, you have the heart of a goblin. Hermione was left wondering about that last comment as the headmaster chose this moment to make his presence known. I really don't appreciate my school being disrupted by these shenanigans. And I don't appreciate my star student being attacked by trolls and perblood bigots in your school. His father has a standing arrangement that this time is scheduled for extra defense lessons, you just got to witness a variation on that theme. Hogwarts students weren't used to seeing the great Albus Dumbledore spoken to like this. The scary goblin though wasn't finished yet. Defense should always be varied, you never know where or when the next attack will come from. Surely this is something you teach your students, or do you assume this variety will come from the myriad of people you seem to go through teaching the subject? The sarcasm in Sharkshard's last remark really drove a battering ram into what passed for defense tuition in Hogwarts, then Hermione batted down what was left of the shoddy doors. That's exactly what Professor Weasley has been teaching us in our extra defense lessons, to be alert for the unexpected. Sharkshard's voice boomed around the entrance hall. Good, then I will leave you in Curse Breaker Weasley's capable hands. Crow, you know the director is going to be insufferable now your fancy blade he had commissioned drew my blood. Until next time student. Harry bowed deeply. Until next time Master Sharkshard. As the goblin left, Neville approached with Harry's shield. You actually beat him Harry. He took the shield and reduced its size, clipping the disc onto his sword scabbard. I didn't beat him Neville, no one beats Master Sharkshard. I got lucky and surprised him, he could have taken me at least a dozen times before then. It's called training for a reason, I wouldn't learn anything if he continually beat me in under a minute. It looked brutal Harry, I was terrified for you. Harry could still see the fear in Hermione's eyes. The first few times we fought I was terrified too Hermione. Now it's just like our defense lessons, Curse Breaker Weasley attacks us so we can practice our dodging and shields. Padma was half carrying, half dragging the battle axe by its drastically shortened shaft over to the group. If Professor Weasley ever attacks us with something like this, I'm quitting guys. Thanks Padma, I'll be hanging that on my wall. Thanks also for that book you gave Hermione, it was really helpful. Padma was tempted to tease which of the books he was talking about but Hermione already had a tough morning, and that was her not noticing the number of witches who were eyeing up Harry. That she was still shaking inside just confirmed to Hermione she hadn't fully recovered from the shock of watching Harry fight, she actually thought her best friend was going to be killed this morning. That was obviously some goblin thing Harry but I failed to see the point. Harry smiled at his best friend, this time knowing exactly how to cheer her up. Master Sharkshard was just reminding me, and everyone else, that I am a goblin warrior. Padma had already resisted one teasing opportunity, this couldn't be passed up. She butted in before he could finish. Next time we could do without the theatrics, and that outfit. Let's get to class, the sight of my sister and Lavender drooling over Harry is making me queasy. Anyone would think they'd never seen a gorgeous guy in a sexy dragon skin tunic before. Harry was blushing while Hermione appeared outraged before Padma began laughing. Oh you guys are just too easy to tease. Seriously though, some of these witches are beginning to creep me out. If a wizard ever stared at me like that, I'd want Harry and Neville to kick their ass for me. No problem Padma, Harry wanted to get out of there and offered Hermione his arm. He then proceeded to make up for this morning by saying what he'd originally intended to, before Padma had interrupted. Hermione, I would love to spend Christmas with you. Oh Harry, it will be wonderful. Padma, Neville, you are both invited as well. Neville was delighted to be included but had family things that needed doing then, he told Hermione that before politely declining. Padma would need to write home before she could answer. She loved her sister dearly but the thought of two weeks listening to her prattle on about boys, fashion, boys and more boys was not appealing. That Harry was going to be one of the boys repeatedly mentioned was a certainty. She knew what the agenda was for most Pablood witches who attended Hogwarts. Meet their future husband, be at least engaged by the time they left school with marriage and their first child born preferably before turning 20. To wait any longer ran the risk of your family arranging a husband for you. Padma thought that agenda was fine, provided you met someone you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. She wanted more from her Hogwarts experience, and spending a holiday in a muggle house would certainly be an experience. She would need to have a girl's talk with Hermione and explain why all the jealous looks were being focused in her direction. She may be muggle-born but Hermione was already in a position most of the Pablood witches would sell their soul for. Having gotten to know Harry, Padma already knew he would be considered a prize for any young witch. Add in all the other stuff and then pile his wealth on top, well she didn't think the other witches were going to be discouraged for long. She suspected their methods would be different though, unless they were really stupid. Bill watched his students heading off to class but wanted a quick word with his youngest brother first. Well Ronnie, still think he's nothing special. Ron had his eyes well and truly opened, they had almost popped out watching that fight. The Patil girl could hardly lift that axe, it would have cut him in half if it had connected. That goblin wasn't holding anything back either. That's right Ronnie, yet he beat the goblin warrior that attacked him. What chance do you think you would have had in a fight like that? Perhaps now you'll stop being such a little prick and leave well enough alone. At that, Percy appeared at his elbow. I've got this time set aside for Ron to do his homework, I'll take it from here Bill. The curse breaker left Percy in charge while he went to deal with his own students. Like everyone else, he'd been impressed with the fight. His brother Charlie had the quickest reflexes of anyone Bill had ever seen, until today. The look of concentration on the lad's face as he fought was also something to behold. Anyone letting Harry close enough to use a blade was going to lose, even Voldemort. Dumbledore was also astonished at Harry's reactions and speed of thought. Likewise, he thought Phileas was strikingly accurate in equating the goblin fencing tutor to his old friend Alastair, their teaching methods were remarkably similar. Like the rest of Hogwarts, he also didn't miss the, going soft, reference. After that display, Harry's enemies would not be meeting him head-on for the foreseeable future. 
Albus expected a few months of quiet now while the plotters evaluated the situation before making their next move. This situation presented Albus with something of a dilemma, he wanted to wrestle control of the boy away from the goblins but he also knew Voldemort had to be defeated. He needed a way to accomplish his first aim without in any way endangering Harry's chances of successfully completing the second. He was tempted to leave things as they were but knew he couldn't. Master Sharkshard had berated his student for showing a modicum of forgiveness and there lay Albus's problem. A victorious Harry would have the wizarding community worshipping at his feet and rushing to fulfill his every wish. Without forgiveness in the boy's heart, their society could be changed beyond all recognition. He needed information on exactly what the goblins were up to, and had just watched his unknowing source walk away to teach young Harry and his three friends. William Weasley would need to understand the harm that could be done here, and pressured into recognizing where his loyalties really lay. With a delicate situation like this, it was all about using the right lever, and there was no bigger lever to use against someone than his or her own family. He was sure it wouldn't take long for a conversation with William's mother to gravitate to Molly telling Albus how pleased she was to have her eldest son back home. That would be his opening to express his regret that William refused to cooperate with him, and that how his time working for the goblins had really changed the former Hogwarts head boy. Molly hated the very thought of any of her children changing, especially if that influence of change wasn't exactly human. She would be on her son's case the entire time he was at the burrow, and Albus would intensify his efforts while William's duties brought him to Hogwarts. This twin attack should soon expose a crack in his armor, that was all Albus needed to exploit the situation. One bit of information would soon lead to another and then he would have the young man. He would become his spy inside Gringotts, providing information that would help Albus plot the course of magical Britain's future, for the greater good of course. Lucius was trying to plot his future and having very limited success, he was not looking forward to his master's eventual return. The head of the Malfoy family understood that his usefulness as a Death Eater lay in his fortune and influence. With neither, he would be severely limited in how he could assist his master's plans. Lucius had witnessed firsthand what happened to Death Eaters in that position, and it was anything but pretty. Lucius was contemplating his next move as he sat staring at a little black diary. With the goblins blocking Narcissa from accessing the Lestrange or Black Vaults, this diary was the only card he had left to play. As with any Triumph card, it was all about how and when it was played. His craving for revenge on Crow was tempered by the fact that the Hogwarts champion would be helpless against this. Like a fine wine, Lucia's revenge just got better the longer he left it to age. If this was played right, it had the power to see Crow's dead body carried from Hogwarts, with Dumbledore sacked and Fudge forced out of office as the public demanded scapegoats. Lucius was a patient man and his need for revenge now wouldn't settle for anything less than a triple takedown. He could afford to be patient. Patience was about all he could now afford, and it wasn't like he had anything else to do. A. N. Thanks for reading. History in the making. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, J.K.R. still owns Harry Potter. I write purely for fun and post it here so you can read it for free. Anyone wishing professional standards of writing should go and buy one of her books. Poa is my favorite. Chapter 13. Hogwarts did indeed settle down to its new, normal, over the following weeks. Thanks to the warning from Padma, Hermione was more aware of what was happening around her, or should that be Harry, regarding the behavior of the Hogwarts witches. Ravenclaw House were adapting well to what was happening within its own blue and bronze walls. Morag, Mandy and Lisa were all friendly with the trio, sharing Harry's defense and now potions classes too certainly helped. Cho was continually making eyes at Harry, and finding any excuse to talk to him. In these situations, Harry was polite but nothing more. The older Ravenclaw girls, apart from Penny, were staying clear, Chamber's example perhaps playing on their mind. The other first-year witches were all on good terms with the friends too, with only the two Gryffindors continually pushing the boundaries. Poverty and Lavender had approached as they walked to class, chatting to Harry a mile a minute. It was when Lavender decided to move things along by latching onto Harry's other arm that she was politely but instantly and firmly rebuffed. Miss Brown, never take a sword wielder's right arm unless it is specifically offered to you. In my culture this can be considered an attack, as you are hampering my ability to draw my weapon. Lavender released Harry's arm as if it was red hot and had just burned her fingers. No one wanted Harry to even think they were attacking him, they had now all seen what he could do with a blade. He nodded before continuing, you were not aware of the situation so nothing further needs to be said. Both Gryffindor girls had given him a wide berth after that. When some of the older girls from the other houses approached, Hermione hoped it wasn't wishful thinking on her part but Harry appeared to use her as a shield. This was a function she was more than happy to provide. These witches may have had a specific agenda at Hogwarts but so did Harry, his agenda though had far more reaching consequences than simply finding someone to marry. Hermione was reminded of this as they were leaving their normal Monday defense class, Professor Weasley had a short message for him. Harry, your father says, it's time, he assured me you would know what that means. His grin was feral, setting Hermione's danger alarm off. Harry, please tell me you are not going to go all, goblin warrior, on us. Hermione, I am a goblin warrior. Okay, bad choice of words. What I really meant to ask was if you were going to be rushing into danger with a blade in each hand. He could see she was merely worried for his safety so attempted to put her mind at rest. Hermione, I have been tasked with ending a great wrong, and that's all I can say about the matter until it happens. What I will say is that I shouldn't need either of my blades to defend myself, there will be no danger at all. After the Lucius Malfoy incident, Hermione had accepted that Harry was at Hogwarts for a purpose other than just receiving a magical education. Here was obviously the next phase of that purpose. That he couldn't tell her any more was fine, that he wouldn't be in any danger was all she really needed to know. At least this time she had six weeks of magical training under her belt, and a few curses up her sleeve. Hermione believed Harry when he said it wouldn't be dangerous but it was always better to be prepared. She had also been preparing by reading the book Neville gave her from cover to cover. Hermione thought a lot of the behavior and customs could at best be described as quaint, but it at least explained Harry's old world behavior. He'd obviously read something similar before attending Hogwarts and thought things like offering a young lady your arm or kissing the backs of their hands was the way wizards behaved normally. 
Purely by observation, Hermione could tell that this behavior was no longer commonplace amongst the magical fraternity. Perhaps it was now only used at the most formal of occasions or functions but the young witch wasn't too bothered about that. Since she was currently on Harry's arm, and it was her hand being kissed, it would be a cold day in hell before Hermione as much as raised the subject with her best friend. Hermione could only hope Harry had reached the same conclusion, but enjoyed having her on his arm too much to stop. Her latest mini faux pas against goblin culture set her mind racing. She didn't rush to the library because Hermione was sure the best source of the information she required was currently walking right beside her. Harry, I've read that book Neville gave me on ancient and noble houses. It was very insightful, a brilliant source of information for someone like me with no magical background. I was wondering if there was a book like that on goblin culture. I could see if it was in the library or order it from the bookstore. Harry had actually stopped walking as Hermione's question set him thinking. The short answer is no, there are no books. I think the reason for that is probably because no one has ever been interested before. Okay, confused again, how could no one be interested? The goblins store and control the magical community's wealth, yet no one knows anything about them, that's just nuts. It was a chuckling Harry that started him off down the corridor again as he answered his best friend. You'll get no objection from me on that. I think the reason there may be no books is that they really need to be written by an outsider observing a culture that's different to their own, goblins tend not to let strangers get too close. He could see Hermione struggling with that concept so tried to give her an example. We could ask Padma to tell us about her years in India, and she could talk for hours. That doesn't mean she would mention riding a flying carpet, because to her that would just be normal behavior and not worth talking about. I see what you mean now, you need someone from another culture to observe what is different, and also what is the same. Exactly, goblins always hold their beheading muggle parties on the last Friday of every month, who knows when wizards have theirs. Harry Crow, don't you dare, I get more than enough teasing from Padma without you starting too. Why Miss Granger, is that any way to talk to your only source on all things goblin? Hermione let out a groan, I was going to say I could check with Master Pitsley but I can just see you both setting me up for a fall. Just remember Crow, you're staying with me for the Christmas holidays. I'm your only source for all things muggle and payback can be a bitch. She tried to be stern but couldn't quite manage it, both of them ended up laughing as they made their way back to the Ravenclaw common room. In the Gryffindor common room, Neville was trying to prepare for this week's potions lesson. Ron was bored though, and kept pestering him to play wizard chess. Go and ask Seamus, I'm busy Ron. Dean's telling him all about that football game again. Did you know they played it on the ground? 22 players and only one ball. Bloody mental if you ask me. Ron, I didn't ask you. I am actually trying to get some work done here. When he took the time to actually look at what Neville was doing, Ron got the distinct impression he was being conned. That's potions, you said this goblin creature never gave out homework. It wasn't a question, more like an accusation. Master Pitsley doesn't have us writing essays, he does expect us to know everything about the potion we will be brewing before we step into his class. Ron still thought this was merely a manufactured excuse to dump him. It's only Monday, you don't have potions until Friday. You'll have forgotten it all by then. No I won't, because I'll be going over my notes every night until Friday. Bloody hell, I tried to warn you. See what happens when you hang out with Ravenclaws, us Gryffindors have got to stick together. If sticking together means taking potion lessons from Snape then you can forget it. Where is your house loyalty? Abandoning your housemates and siding with Ravenclaws, you're a disgrace to Gryffindor Longbottom. Neville was on his feet at that. You're a fine one to call me a disgrace, you fired a curse at a girl. Real brave Gryffindor, didn't even have the courage to apologize. I bloody did, you were there. Anyone can say the words Ron, we all knew you didn't mean any of it. Harry just didn't want to get into an argument with you and spoil Hermione's birthday. You call me a disgrace to Gryffindor yet I'm in a class with nine Ravenclaws, I'm ahead of six and keeping up with another two. I would say I was doing my house proud. What have you got to show for your time at Hogwarts? Detentions, lost points, a suspension and now on probation, way to go Ronnie boy. Ron's complexion was turning deeper and deeper shades of red but Neville just faced him down. You've tried to curse two of my friends, and actually managed to hit the other one by accident. Draw your wand on me Ron and you'll get to see just what your eldest brother teaches us every weekend. Their confrontation had gotten louder and louder, gathering a rather large crowd. Two of the crowd suddenly had an arm each as Ron's feet left the floor, the twins whisked him away up the stairs. Neville sat back down and continued his work, until poverty spoke to him. Neville, six and two only make eight. You said there were nine Ravenclaws in that class. Ah, but when it comes to potions, Harry is in a class of his own. Even the twins couldn't brew a potion that would be undetectable by Snape. As he worked studiously, Neville was unaware of the changes taking place around him. Most of the house just had their opinion of the shy, quiet boy drastically altered. Especially two first-year witches who were having no success with their repeated attempts to get near Harry Crow. Neville Longbottom might just turn out to be a rather fine replacement. Bill also had a Weasley harping on at him while he attempted to accomplish a task, he should have known better. A quiet meal at the burrow was as good a definition of a misnomer that Bill could think of. But he's Albus Dumbledore, surely there must be some way to bypass those secrecy terms to help. He put down his knife and fork, Bill had had more than enough, both of dinner and his mother's nagging. It was time for a few home truths. Would you be so insistent if it was Lucius Malfoy who wanted information? Don't be ridiculous, he's a Death Eater who used his money to avoid Azkaban. Yet to a goblin, both are classed the same. Dumbledore has been barred from Gringotts for a decade. That was over a misunderstanding. Bill finally lost it at his mother. If that's the story he's putting about then it makes him a liar too, I'll tell you about your great Albus Dumbledore. He left an orphan child on a muggle doorstep, a child who had been hit with the killing curse by Voldemort. He didn't know if the yelp from his mother was because the dreaded name was spoken aloud, or that it was one of her children saying it. Bill pressed on regardless. That child was sporting a scar on his head, no healer, no treatment, just dumped on a doorstep with a letter attached. 
Now here is where his stupid scheme started to fall apart. The muggles didn't want a magical child in their home so took Harry to Gringotts and deposited the toddler who saved us all there. Molly had tears in her eyes as she shook her head. It can't be true. Harry's father still has the letter in Dumbledore's handwriting. McGonagall and Hagrid were present that night too. Hagrid keeps attempting to talk to Harry at Hogwarts but the boy wants nothing to do with him. He knows Hagrid is Dumbledore's man, and anything he said would make its way straight back to the old fool. This was still a step too far for Molly. Albus Dumbledore is no fool, I will not have that said in this house. Do you know how that troll got into Hogwarts? Dumbledore is desperately trying to keep it secret but Madame Bones wants him up on charges for his part in the fiasco. Voldemort is not dead. This time he was sure what had caused his mother to scream. You're lying, Harry Potter killed him, everyone knows that. Yes, but what everyone doesn't know is that he's trying to come back. Why do you think I returned from Egypt and took this job? Voldemort is not dead, and we know he's going after Harry. Dumbledore knew this and didn't tell anyone, especially Harry. Instead, Dumbledore set a trap inside a bloody school. I have four younger brothers currently in that castle and that old bastard is playing with their lives. Voldemort possessed a teacher and was actually inside Hogwarts, that's who let the troll in. Bill hadn't realized he'd been shouting but it looked as if he'd finally gotten through to his mother, unfortunately it also looked like he'd terrified Ginny. She was curled on his father's lap and crying. The goblins are doing everything in their power to help that young man, I have no idea what Dumbledore is up to. As a Weasley, my position on this matter should be crystal clear, against the dark and for the light. My champion though is not some old wizard who likes to play games, but a young man who defeated Voldemort once before. I am on the side of the goblins because they are backing Harry to the hilt, as am I. Arthur was trying to soothe his daughter but really needed to know something. How much of this is known within the ministry? Fudge and Bones were there the day Harry laid most of the Voldemort stuff out, that was also the day he took down Lucius Malfoy. The details of what Dumbledore did to Harry, I got from his father. Dumbledore is the head of the Wizengamot, yet it took one of my students to do what should have been done years ago. With Gringotts backing Harry's actions, Malfoy has legally been stripped of his wealth, and with it most of his power too. Events at the ministry began to fall into place for Arthur. I wondered why there was a sudden recruitment drive in the Auror department, we were left wondering if Amelia had finally gotten something on Fudge. That was probably her payoff for Malfoy not standing public trial. The minister would be too afraid of just what Lucius might reveal under Veritaserum. Molly's mind though was stuck on one single fact, a single fact that would change her outlook forever. You know who was near four of my babies, and Albus bloody Dumbledore never even mentioned it. Bill knew what his mother's next action would be, and tried to head it off. Mum, don't mention we had an argument over this. By all means say you've heard a certain rumor, just not where you heard it. It might be fun to hear what excuse he comes up with, I trust Dumbledore about as far as I could throw Hagrid. Arthur was busy trying to comfort his daughter. It's okay Ginny, your brothers will be safe inside Hogwarts. What about my Harry, Bill said the bad wizard was coming back for him. Bill couldn't let that go. I thought we talked about this Ginny. He's not your Harry, you've never even met him. Bill, it's just a harmless infatuation. No dad, it's not healthy and should have been discouraged years ago. The last thing I want to see is Ginny getting hurt, but that's exactly what's going to happen if she doesn't stop this now. How do you think Ginny's going to react when she discovers this whole boy who lived fantasy she's constructed is just that, a fantasy. He absolutely hated to see his sister cry but this needed to be said. Ginny's fantasy will inevitably come crashing down around her ears, Harry doesn't even know she exists and already has his own set of close friends. At this point she will be heartbroken, and 600 miles from home. The twins and Percy are barely coping with Ron's problems, do you honestly think they will be able to handle something like this? How do you know Harry won't like me? You can't possibly know that. He tried to phrase his answer in a way that would be as gentle as possible for his sister to take, yet at the same time get his point across. Harry Crow is a very serious young lad, only the fact that he's in first year gives his age away. If you didn't know that, you would swear he was older. His friends are also really serious, about their studies and being his friend. Every weekend I think I've pushed them too hard, yet the following week they're back and eager for more. They are rattling through the defense course, doing the same with potions and near the top of all their other classes. I have no idea what level they'll be at by the time they're ready to start second year. Bill could see this was not well received, and knew the next bit would be even less so. We already have one Weasley at Hogwarts disgracing himself due mainly to his immaturity, we really don't need a Weasley fangirl following Harry around like a little lost puppy. The fantasy needs to stop here before Ginny gets really hurt. I'm not saying she'll never be friends with Harry, I'll even introduce her, but this fantasizing over a boy she's never seen, never mind met, is not going to end well. Ginny focused only on one part of what her brother said, you would introduce me, to Harry. Bill was torn, he wanted his sister to put this behind her but Ginny clearly hadn't. Introducing her to Harry might just be the shock Ginny needed to get over this infatuation, especially if Harry had a certain young witch on his arm. I'll introduce you to Harry when he gets off the express for the holidays. He could see her eyes practically sparkling at that but had to give a warning. Harry's going to be spending Christmas with his best friend, Hermione asked both him and Padma to spend the holidays at her house. It looked as if Ginny had been told she'd won the Prophet Grand Braw, only then to be informed there was a mistake. His best friend, isn't that the girl Ron mentioned as his girlfriend? Hermione Granger currently wears a goblin made gold bracelet that's inscribed Harry, Hermione, best friends forever. Harry gave it to Hermione for her twelfth birthday. Bill felt as though he was having to be cruel to be kind with Ginny. He'd watched as witches older and far more developed, both emotionally and physically, than Ginny had been rebuffed by his student. They were mostly mature enough to accept the knockback, Ginny wasn't. He watched as his sister made an excuse before heading up to her room. Arthur waited until she had left before confronting his eldest. Was that really necessary? Yes dad it was, you've been filling Ginny's head with this boy who lived nonsense for years. It's only a children's story book. 
To us, yes, but Ginny believes every word of it. Why shouldn't she? Her father read it to her. The difference between this and Babbity Rabbity is that little girls don't grow up thinking they're destined to marry the hero and live happily ever after, and then have to go to school with the hero. She's only ten, Ginny isn't thinking anything of the sort. Bill knew Ginny was his father's favorite, the entire family knew it, but he still saw his daughter as much younger than she actually was. It would be a big wrench when Ginny left for Hogwarts next September. Dad, I found Ginny on her bed crying her eyes out, clutching the bloody book. Do you know why? Ron told her Harry already had a girlfriend. It's one thing to daydream on what you would like to happen in life, Ginny is struggling to tell her fantasy from real life. I've been trying to convince her he's nothing like the book but now she seems ready to fixate on Harry Crow. Maybe seeing him in real life will shock her out of this. If not, we've still got the next eight months to think of something. Molly was shaking her head. I always thought the twins were our biggest problem, now I'm not so sure. Ron's in far more serious trouble than they've ever been, and Ginny seems set to bring us a whole new set of problems. Where did we go wrong with those two? Bill had some words of comfort for his parents. Neither Ron nor Ginny are bad kids, both just need time to grow up. It will be keeping them in Hogwarts while they do the growing that might be the problem. As the first years were leaving Charms class next day, Poverty thought she would make her move, before Lavender got in there first. Harry and Hermione were in front, with Neville and her sister just behind them. There wouldn't be a better opportunity. Why Mr. Longbottom, I thought you were a gentleman. Your friend there Mr. Crow is showing the way so why don't you have a young lady on your arm? Neville noticed rather a lot of people were now looking at him. This Neville though had good friends, friends who gave him the confidence to do what he needed to. You are correct, I apologize for my oversight. Miss Patil, would you do me the honor? Poverty was overjoyed her ploy had worked, that was until she saw Neville offering his arm to her sister. Why Mr. Longbottom, I would be delighted. Padma was walking away on Neville's arm, but she still took time to turn her head round and wink at her twin. Thanks for that Padma, your sister and her friend are a little too, clingy, for me. Oh no problem Neville, I'll guard your body any time you like. This is wonderful material for teasing, do you think it would be too cruel to thank Poverty? I was working along the lines of her remark bringing us together. If she hadn't said anything, who knows how long it would have taken for you to ask me out. She couldn't hold her laughter as Neville's jaw dropped lower and lower. This is just too good, the same lines should work just as well on path too. I'll take your arm anytime you want Neville, as your friend. After the panic had passed, Neville found it was quite nice to be teased by a friend. Do you want to sit with me at the Gryffindor table? I think we could have your sister and Lavender Green with Envy by the end of lunch. Neville, that's a brilliant idea, providing I don't need to sit where I can see Ron eat. Padma rested her head on his shoulder as they walked arm in arm to the Great Hall, both were struggling to contain the giggles at the reaction this got from other students. Hermione noticed exactly what was happening with her friends, she barely managed a smile though. All her concentration was on her best friend. It's going to be soon, isn't it? Goblins are masters of hiding their emotions, impossible to read, sometimes it scares me just how well you can tell practically what I'm thinking. Remember, no one will be in any danger. Now let's both go and attempt to eat some lunch. Hermione didn't have too long to wait, the hammer fell their very next class. Professor Binns was droning on as usual, and as usual half the class were struggling to stay awake. That all changed when Harry Crow stood, this could be history in the making. Harry waited until the professor noticed him standing there. As Hogwarts champion, I can no longer permit you to continue inflicting this torture and lies onto students. As a goblin, you disgust me almost as much as that butcher you called grandfather. How dare you sully my grandfather's good name. He died a hero, fighting in the Goblin Rebellion of 1612. Bloody Bins and his band of cutthroats were responsible for starting what you refer to as the Goblin Rebellion of 1612. They didn't die heroes, they were tried, convicted of the many crimes and sentenced to Goblin justice. Bins was putting more emotion into this argument than anyone had ever seen him use during teaching, no one would be falling asleep in this class. By what rights do Goblins try wizards, they should have handed them over to the ministry, where they could have received a fair trial. Where they could have been released by wizards who thought the same as them, that murdering Goblins was not a crime. They expected to be released and boasted of their atrocities, all thought the purity of their blood protected them. Guess what professor, dragons don't give a shit how pure someone's blood is, they just chew you up. If a ghost could appear shocked, Bins managed it. Their bodies were fed to dragons. No, they were thrown still alive into the dragon pens. They screamed for mercy but received the same they had shown us, none whatsoever. You lying goblin bastard. Bins literally flew at Harry but not having a body rendered his attack harmless. The rest of the class were shocked, both at Bins' actions and Harry's description of what the goblins did to their prisoners. Only Hermione was brave enough to ask a question. Harry, do goblins really throw people in with dragons? Only for the very worst atrocities Hermione, and only after a fair trial has found them guilty. Just about every culture has or had some form of death penalty, none were ever pleasant. From being burned at the stake to beheading, hanging to having your soul sucked out your body by one of the foulest creatures on the planet. That last one is currently wizarding Britain's answer to the problem. What did they do Harry? This was something Bins had never experienced in all his years of teaching, he wasn't sure how to handle the situation but tried to reassert his classroom authority. They didn't do anything but were killed by vicious goblin raiders. My father told me the story since I was a little boy. I grew up with this, you think I don't know what happened. Harry remained very calm as he answered Bins, there was no point in losing your temper to a ghost. If that is your only source of information, then yes. We live in a community where no one ever checks information, it said so in the prophet so it must be true, is not an acceptable method to prove the truth. I'll tell you what really happened. Bins was incensed at this. You will sit back down and shut up boy, there will be no goblin propaganda spouted in this class. You are right about one thing professor, there should be no propaganda here. This is a history class yet you have used your position to preach anti-goblin propaganda for almost three centuries, installing fear, mistrust and even hatred against us into children placed in your care. 
That all stops today. I intend to tell everyone the goblin version of events and let them make up their own minds to who's telling the truth. Fifty points from Ravenclaw, and it will soon be a hundred if you don't sit down at once. The truth is far more important than any number of house points. It's time for some real history to be told in this class. You see, goblins didn't always live only under Gringotts. They were forced to live there by treaty, it's all covered in owls. It may be covered but it's all lies, lies that have slowly become what is now regarded as fact. This happened because a certain professor has deliberately fed the same lies to everyone who has passed through Hogwarts for the last 280 years, man and ghost. Do you know British Owl and Newt passes in history aren't recognized outside this country? The rest of the world realizes what he teaches is wrong, biased and disproportionate, it's one supposed goblin rebellion after another supposed goblin rebellion. The entire course has become a joke but still nothing is done about it. It was a shock Terry Boot who asked the question that they were all struggling with. Why would they teach us something they know is wrong? Ah, you're forgetting Terry, the people in power were all taught the same shit we are being fed, by the same professor. Even the author of our textbook, Batilda Bagshot, was taught her history classes by Bins, she apprenticed under him. Is it any wonder her writings match Bins' accounts of things? In this country she's hailed as a great historian, outside Britain she's ignored and even thought a touch mad. Is that what you are trying to do here boy, tear down reputations people have spent decades building? It's better than tearing down dwellings, just because the occupants are goblins. That's what bloody Bins did, male, female, child, it didn't matter to them as they sorted every goblin they could find. They didn't want goblins living amongst what they called good wizards, so they systematically set about slaughtering those who dared pollute what the Pabloods considered theirs by birth. Harry was trying to keep himself calm and let the facts speak for themselves as he'd been taught, it was proving difficult though. The ministry was turning a blind eye to what was happening, after all it was only goblins who were being sorted and they didn't count. When the goblins caught the wizards in the act, they demanded to be handed over to the ministry. They were standing there splattered with goblin blood and expected to be released, they were tried like the crazed animals they were and executed. The class were hanging on Harry's every word, and ignoring the continual docking of points from bins. The ministry had to take action, there were now per bloods dead. As usual, the ministry decided to pass laws to get what they wanted. The ministry attempted to claim jurisdiction over the goblins, basically meaning we had to do what they said. No goblin was going to stand for that and so we have the goblin, rebellion, of 1612. There were casualties on both sides as the ministry attempted to impose their new laws before common sense prevailed. Your precious goblins were defeated and slunk back to their holes in the ground. That's where the filthy animals belong, not staying amongst decent magical people. Harry ignored the ghostly spittle that Bins was spraying him with as the professor screamed at him, mere inches away from his face, Harry had to finish the task he trained for. The ministry were forced to concede that the goblins were their own masters, and the Gringotts were sovereign territory. This didn't stop them passing anti-goblin laws that prevented us buying land or housing anywhere near a wizard dwelling. To some, this didn't go far enough. Of course it didn't go far enough, my grandfather was only one of many the bastards murdered. The entire species should have been wiped out. Harry had just about enough of this ghost, it had been pure torture having to sit in this class, knowing what he did. The reason Professor Bins here never took up his wand and avenged his beloved grandfather was that he didn't have one, a wand that is. You see, our professor here was a squib, now I personally don't have a problem with that, but our ghostly professor did. He grew into a bitter and twisted man, much like a certain caretaker we all know. His only purpose left in life was revenge, revenge against the race of, creatures, he wanted to see exterminated. Typical goblin, honeyed words to your face while they stab you in the back. Not content with murder, you robbed the Bins family blind, we lost everything. Yes, the Bins family lost their home, land and gold, but not to the goblins. Your father was barred from Gringotts for an incident that he was lucky to escape with his life, leaving you to inherit the family fortune when you came of age. I never received a canute, you goblin bastards stole everything. We took only the agreed vault rental, until the vault was closed by the ministry. It was the Pabloods of the Wizengamot who passed the law that squibs couldn't inherit Pabloods fortunes. They also sneaked a clause into the agreement of 1612 where, after a century, those unclaimable vaults passed to the ministry. Since they were effectively robbing their own, we goblins took the view this was none of our business. This was information Draco had a vested interest in. Are you saying the ministry claimed the Bins family vault? Vault, land, home and all family possessions. Everything was sold to swell the ministry's coffers. When his father died, the professor here was forced to seek a job in Hogwarts as he couldn't even access the home he'd been raised in. He died just before the century was up so at least didn't see the ministry take everything, but he refused to cross over because he had unfinished business. Yes I have unfinished business, to ensure wizards are never taken in by you thieving, lying, murdering goblin bastards ever again. Phileas had been alerted that something was wrong when the Ravenclaw points counter began spiraling downwards, he could only think of one person capable of wiping out the entire total of accumulated points in a single period. The Ravenclaw head of house entered the history classroom and witnessed a ghostly professor screaming in a most unprofessional manner at one of his students. Seeing Harry was unfazed, and in no danger, Phileas decided to just observe for now. Even in death, he wouldn't give up his life's work, ensuring relationships between goblins and wizards never progressed beyond where they are today, strained at best. By teaching lies to generations of children, wizards and witches are taught that goblins are to be feared and detested, never trusted. I'll bet every witch and wizard in this room, apart from the Muggleborn, have been taught only one thing about us from their parents. Never mess with a goblin. Bins was still shouting, though had given up all pretense of justifying his behavior as anything but revenge. You ruined my life and I won't rest until I have my vengeance. I'll cross over when every last goblin in the country has been slain. Knowing I played a small part in that will be enough for me. When you cross over is nothing to do with me, I cannot allow you to remain in the castle. The ghostly professor actually laughed at this. What are you going to do goblin lover, hold an exorcism? You don't have the power to force me out the castle. I was here long before you were born, and still be here after the Dark Lord kills you. 
He has also promised to wipe your kind out. That was why I helped him so much when he was a student here. This revelation drew gasps of astonishment from the entire class. That revelation was unexpected but Harry knew he had bins now, condemned by his own words. I can't, but others can. Have you heard enough? The four house ghosts passed into the room, all appeared grave. Helena spoke for all of them. Yes young champion, we have. There was then a loud clang last heard of the sorting. The bloody baron took over. Hogwarts has spoken. She provided shelter and allowed you to continue with your passion to teach, only for you to betray her in the worst possible way. The fat friar was next. Systematically lying to her children to further your own aims is despicable. You are no longer welcome within these walls. Sir Nicholas then demonstrated the heads were united in this. You can cross over or be banished from the castle. Those are your only choices. The ghostly professor wasn't given any time to make a decision, Hogwarts had already made her mind up. Another loud clang and it seemed as if invisible hands were dragging a screaming bins through the castle walls. The headmaster came rushing into the class, having heard Hogwarts, speak, and instantly come to the same conclusion as Phileas as to who would most likely be responsible. He burst through the classroom door, just in time to see a Hogwarts professor forcibly ejected from the castle. His gaze also focused on the only student who was standing. Mr. Crow, I want some answers, and I want them right now. A. N. Thanks for reading. Henrika Hobson comes to Hogwarts. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, I am not J.K.R., nor a professional author. I write as a simple form of escapism, and purely for my own enjoyment. I then post those efforts here so others can read my stories for free. For those people who know exactly how to write the perfect Harry Potter story, and simply must point out the many reasons why mine isn't it, please do us all a favor and write the thing. Like everyone else on this site, I'm always searching for good stories to read. Chapter 14. Mr. Crow, I want some answers, and I want them right now. Harry didn't get time to answer the headmaster as, in a manner scarily reminiscent of Professor McGonagall, Ravenclaw's Morag McDougall displayed her fiery Scottish temper for all to see. The angry Ravenclaw jumped in with both feet and asked Dumbledore a couple of questions she thought should be answered first. Headmaster, as well as being Chief Warlock of Britain, you are also Supreme Mugwump of the ICW. How could you not know the history qualifications at Hogwarts were laughed at in the rest of the world? I think you should tell us why you let this continue. Dumbledore was so shocked that a first year would actually question him, he didn't know what to say. Where was the reverence that students would normally show him, the reverence Albus was certain he deserved. Harry actually supplied the answer before Dumbledore could speak. Oldest reason in the world Morag, economics. Hogwarts has seven core subjects and for the last 200 years one of them has been taught for free. Binns is widely acknowledged as a crap teacher but he was cheap, you don't have to pay a ghost. Binns used this fact to his advantage while continuing to spread his own brand of poison. Albus eventually got his question answered, it was supplied by Helena. Hogwarts requires a new history professor, Binns was using his position to spread misinformation and further his own personal vendetta against the goblin nation. While we are willing to admit this was a problem you inherited, your inactions on this matter since becoming headmaster do not please us. We have lived in this castle for many centuries and have become detached from the outside world, we rely on each headmaster to keep Hogwarts on the correct path. A path that sees her graduating students sought after the world over, not laughed at. Harry bowed deeply to Helena. My lady, with Hogwarts permission, we goblins have the solution in hand. Albus didn't like the sound of this so-called solution one bit. And what will this solution consist of Mr. Crow? Are there going to be lessons on how to hug a goblin? I don't think so headmaster, though Hermione and Padma could probably teach that course if you really think it's necessary. Neville's uncontrollable laughter set the rest of the class off as Harry turned and winked at his two mortified friends. Phileas managed to hide his amusement and ask Harry the question he was certain the lad wanted to answer. I'm sure it's just a particular goblin Miss Granger and Miss Patil want to hug, just as I'm sure Mr. Crow's plans are a lot more advanced than that. Why don't you tell us about them Harry? Thank you Master Flitwick. my father didn't want his son leaving Hogwarts with an owl or newt that wasn't worth the parchment it was written on. As I am fluent in several languages, it would be easy for me to study and sit the accredited French or German history exam, but what about everyone else? That just wasn't good enough, and a solution had to be found. As Harry was spending more time with his housemates, they were getting to know him better. It was this that gave Lisa Turpin the confidence to ask a Harry a question. Is that why you waited until today Harry, so the problem could be fixed? Yes Lisa, a course that meets the European standard had to be thrashed out, textbooks sourced and translated into English before a professor could be found to teach the new course, it took a while. Albus was shocked, quote ellipsis. And just who will pay for all this Mr. Crow? Harry had a knowing smirk on his face. Headmaster, if there is one thing we goblins understand, it's economics. We are also well aware what would happen if Hogwarts was forced to put its prices up. The professor and all the textbooks will be funded by the newly formed Lily Potter Foundation. Unfortunately, this will only apply to the first four years at the moment. This is purely because anyone in their owl year or over wouldn't have time to learn the new materials, the fourth years are going to have to work their socks off for a shot at the new exam. You will have to provide a teacher for the upper years until the new course rolls out to everyone. This was more than Albus could possibly have hoped for, but he wanted to clarify one thing before graciously accepting. The course parameters have been set by the European Education Board. Yes sir, they approved everything otherwise Hogwarts would be no better off, and we goblins would be doing the exact same as bins. The materials will be in the library for any older students wanting to attempt the new exams but our education experts felt it might pull their other marks down if they concentrated on a new history course. I shall pass this news, and your experts' advice on to the heads of house. I feel they are in the best position to judge their students' capabilities. I will abide by their recommendations. I am delighted we can work together on this matter Mr. Crow. The entire class watched in disbelief as the headmaster stood there claiming credit for something he had nothing to do with, and didn't know anything about until moments ago. The daughter of Rowena Ravenclaw wasn't for letting Dumbledore get away with that though. Our champion approached us on this matter, and asked for our assistance. 
We took care of the problem and our champion provided the solution, your help was neither asked for nor required. Hogwarts accepts her champion's solution and we will inform the heads of our houses exactly what happened here today. Professor Flitwick saw most of it and I would value his opinion at this point. Hearing a Hogwarts professor boast he helped the Dark Lord all he could so Voldemort would wipe out the Goblin Nation has left me feeling dirty that I even knew bins. The loud, what, from Dumbledore rivaled the clang of Hogwarts for sheer number of decibels achieved. We all heard him say it Albus, his hatred for the Goblin Nation was barely below the surface but surprised even me with its intensity. As to the new history course, I think my opinion matches Mr. Crow's experts. I can think of no more than a handful of older Ravenclaws who could possibly manage that amount of extra work alongside their existing exams, and think the other three houses would struggle to come up with that many between them. I fail to see the point though in continuing with a course where the pass isn't worth the parchment it's printed on. I shall be recommending to my Ravenclaws that they drop history and use the time to study for other subjects. It was then they noticed Draco had his hand up. Can I ask a question sir? Mr. Crow claims to have found us a new professor, is this professor goblin or wizard? All eyes moved to Harry who quickly decided to use this opportunity to his advantage. This was something he had been mulling over for a few weeks and he'd just been handed a golden invitation to say what was on his mind. In all honesty I don't know, and also don't really care. I just know anyone my father employs will be extremely good at their job, or they won't have that job very long. Isn't that what really matters? Harry knew he would take his own house with him on this one. After their first potions lesson with a goblin tutor, they would be fools to think otherwise, and fools didn't get sorted into Ravenclaw. If you go through life limiting your choices of who you will associate with by little things like blood purity, Hogwarts house or even what Quidditch team they support, then you have my sympathies. If I did that, who would I have as a friend? There aren't exactly too many people in my position. He glanced toward Hermione, Neville and Padma before continuing. Take a look at my three closest friends and I, by any rights our friendship shouldn't work. An ancient British Pablood, an Indian Pablood whose ancestry is probably even older, a girl who didn't know she was a witch until her 11th birthday and me, a child raised by goblins. We have massive cultural differences between us, differences that raise issues practically every single day. When those issues are raised, we talk about them. Padma said she preferred her flying carpet in India to a broom, I enjoyed my first broom flight but who wouldn't want a shot on a flying carpet? Some of the stuff Hermione tells us you would swear she was making up, except she promised to show us for real. He glanced over at his friends again to see them smiling at him so Harry knew he wasn't in trouble. We have differences of opinion, but that's all they are. Friends don't need to be the exact same to get along, just agree to differ on some things. Why should it matter if our new tutor is a wizard, goblin or even a centaur, just as long as they can teach us what we need to know? Albus could see the lad was impressing his peers with this line of reasoning and wanted to put a stop to it at once, he well remembered another young wizard whose personality had the power to charm the birds from the trees. This is all very well Mr. Crow but I am down a professor, when will this new history professor be available to start? Oh I would imagine within a few days headmaster, and the house ghosts have already agreed to cover classes until they get here. Albus was left standing there like some spare prick at a wedding. This was supposed to be his school but more and more of the decisions were being taken without any input from him. He would need to corner William Weasley the next time he paid a visit, Albus desperately needed to know just what the goblin's final objective was here, preferably before Albus too found himself ejected from the castle. Carry on then, as he made to leave, Phileas stopped him. What about the house points bins deducted from Ravenclaw before he was thrown out? You know I have a non-interference policy on those matters professor, I dare say they were deserved deductions. Albus thought he was claiming at least a slight victory, he hadn't reckoned on the house ghosts. Helena was first, Mr. Crow, 50 points for bringing this matter to our attention, and another 50 for resolving Hogwarts history professor problem. Sir Nicholas then got in on the act, Miss McDougall, 50 points for having the courage to ask the headmaster that searching question, a question we all noticed he didn't answer. The bloody baron wasn't going to be left out, Mr. Boot, 50 points for asking a question that got right to the heart of the matter. That left the fat friar adding numbers in his ghostly head. Miss Granger 34 points for being a good and loyal friend. If I'm not mistaken, that takes Ravenclaw back to where they were at the start of the period. After just publicly stating he had a non-interference policy on house points, Albus was powerless to do anything. He left the class as the Hufflepuff ghost made the final proclamation, skulking back to his office. As they left a class none of them would ever forget, Hermione had one final question for the wizard whose arm she was on. Harry, what did you mean by knowing what would happen if Hogwarts put its prices up? Harry tried to think of an easy way to say this but eventually just told it straight. Magical Britain is a very male-dominated culture. Most Pablood witches are destined to raise children and adorn their husband's arm at social functions, they are sent to Hogwarts in the hope of meeting that husband. If the prices were to be pushed up too far, some fathers would question the expense of a formal education. They could decide not send them to Hogwarts, just choosing a likely husband for their daughter instead. Hermione was so shocked she dropped Harry's arm. Quote ellipsis. But that's, that's just. As Hermione struggled for words, Harry tried to come to her aid. Quote ellipsis. A different culture Hermione. I stood in front of the entire first year and said we can talk out any differences, please don't make a liar out of me. She had only one thought on her mind. Harry, please tell me goblin society isn't the same. The pleading in her voice touched something deep within Harry. He led his best friend over to a small, windowed alcove and both of them sat on the bench seat recessed there. Goblins are a warrior race Hermione, you need to remember that with what I'm about to tell you. There are certain restrictions that goblin culture places on its females with regard to careers. He could see Hermione ready to comment on that so quickly continued with his explanation. Females attend all the same classes as males do, though are more likely to be tutored in the use of lighter weapons in combat class. While they are certainly taught how to fight, it's more so they can defend themselves and their families, no goblin female can become a warrior or would ever be expected to fight in a war. This was something Hermione could grasp. There was currently a great debate in the British army as to whether women could fight as frontline troops. 
It was a debate in which there were no quick or easy answers so she could understand the goblin position on this. Harry took Hermione nodding her head as a good sign so continued. Goblin females are also barred from working at any of the counters in Gringotts, but not for the reason you might think. Goblins are trained in how to deal with surly and sometimes downright rude wizards and witches who use Gringotts. No goblin warrior could ever stand by while a goblin female received the same abuse, there would be heads rolling along the bank floor on a daily basis. Hermione had now witnessed Harry's protectiveness on more than one occasion, it was a trait that made her go weak at the knees. Again, she had no problem imagining a Gringotts guard taking a blade to a wizard who happened to shout abuse at a female goblin. There are females whose greatest wish is to marry, raise children and be a full-time mother, just like there are ones who wish to choose a career too. You told me your mother and father are forms of healer who work together. A husband and wife who were both healers would not be an unusual occurrence in our society. In the magical community, this would be much more of a rarity. Harry, all I really wanted to know was that the female goblins got to make their own decisions. Barring a few positions that you've explained, it would appear so. We are still a male-dominated society Hermione, no female could head a house. At the same time, no head of house would ever have anything to do with an arranged marriage, and goblin betrothal contracts just don't exist. Hermione's voice became a squeak as she struggled to get the words out. Betrothal contracts. Oh, the Pabloods just love the betrothal contracts, I think there's about a sackful of them somewhere in Gringotts with Harry Potter's name on them. The last of the Potters is apparently quite a prize, there certainly will be offers in that sack from fathers of witches we both know in Hogwarts. Hermione's mouth was suddenly incredibly dry but she had to know. What do you think of that? Harry shrugged, I'm a goblin warrior that has been given a mission, a mission I need to complete before I can live my life in peace. Until Voldemort is no longer a threat, I won't even consider anything like that. When he's gone, I know exactly what I want though. Hermione had stopped breathing as she desperately waited for Harry to continue. He appeared to be staring at something that wasn't there while she just wanted him to end this agony. My father told me my dad and mum were, as well as being a powerful and formidable couple, very much in love. That's what I want. He looked to his best friend for her opinion, to see Hermione wearing the biggest smile he'd ever witnessed. Do you think that's silly Hermione? She slowly and deliberately wrapped her arms around him, her head was beside his as she whispered in Harry's ear. That's what everyone wants Harry, but I can't think of anyone who deserves to find it more than you. So, we okay? Of course we are silly, cultural differences that we talk through. I would never make a liar out of my best friend. Was getting rid of bins the end of it Harry? Harry couldn't shake his head because it was currently nestled very comfortably next to Hermione's, he still had to give a negative answer though. Both my father and the director see this as nothing more than a few steps on a long road. She then asked the question that had been eating away at her for a while, here was Hermione's opening to have it answered. Quote ellipsis. But why you Harry? Why do you have to be the one risking yourself to do these things? Harry still had her wrapped in his arms, he kept Hermione there as he answered. That's simple Hermione, because I'm the only one who can. We goblins have been complaining about bins for generations, that we had to make those complaints to the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures should tell you how successful we were. The boy who lived was able to see bins driven from the castle in a single afternoon. We may not see goblin-wizard relations where we would want them in our lifetime, but our children and their children should benefit from these changes. Hermione was in Harry's arms, now her favorite place in the entire world. Hearing him say, our children, just turned her entire insides to mush. She knew he didn't mean it that way but a girl could dream, a certain girl also needed a long talk with her mother first chance she could get. Harry enjoyed Hermione snuggling into him so continued talking to prolong this condition, he had no idea his best friend would quite happily stay there for the rest of the day. I can only work on the wizarding attitudes, my father and the director have probably the more difficult task of convincing the rest of our nation better relations with the magical community is something we goblins should want. Of those seven, goblin rebellions, Bins had built his history course around, two of them were actually started by goblins. What he didn't teach though was that this pair of rebellions were actually put down by the goblin nation, with the guilty being punished. We still have a few goblins who hold on to their hatred every bit as bitterly as bins, though not after death. They sat quietly, content just to be holding each other for a few minutes. You know Padma is going to tease us mercilessly for this. Her question drew a chuckle from Harry. Don't forget Neville, he's getting just as bad. The two of them have poverty and Lavender almost sick with jealousy by acting like a couple. I wonder if Padma's name is on one of those betrothal contracts. I don't know, but it's something I'll have to deal with when I become head of the Potter family. No Pablood would ever accept a rejection of the daughter from a goblin, so that is something I'm going to have to do myself. Oh my, I think I would be mortified if you had to reject me. A moment of silence followed that remark before Harry managed to answer. I don't think I could do that to you. Hermione was once more having trouble breathing with a mouth that would match the Sahara for moisture content, did Harry really just say that? Do I need to talk to my father about a contract? She had made the quip only partly in jest. Harry held her closer as he whispered his answer. Only if you want to be the same as all the rest. Both had a rough last few hours and neither wanted to be the one to break their hold. This was how Padma and Neville found them almost half an hour later. Their friends didn't tease, just handed over the food they had brought wrapped in napkins. Eating in the great hall with everyone staring at you was overrated anyway. Barchoke marched down the corridor to the director's office. He didn't have an appointment but also didn't think that would matter today, the letter in his hand was all the appointment he needed. Once in the director's presence, Barchoke wasted no time in passing on the news, or the letter. Director, my son has done it. The pride in his son's achievement practically radiated off Barchoke, if it was possible for a goblin to glow then he managed it. Ragnik read the letter and his delight matched that of Barchoke. Bloody Bin's grandson finally ejected from the castle. This is a great day my friend. Even at this early hour, Ragnik shouted for Goblin Grog to celebrate this famous victory. When both of them had a tankard, Ragnik offered a toast. Almost ten years ago I named your son Old Crow because I found it amusing. Like a true goblin, by his achievements he has turned the joke back on me. 
I find myself having to rename your son. From this day forth he shall be known as Centurion Crow. Ragnik took a deep swig of the potent brew to seal the deal before noticing his drinking companion wasn't reciprocating the toast. Barchok was actually down on one knee with his head bowed. Director, I beg of you, please don't do this. My son faces enough resentment amongst the nation without adding to his burden. Do you not think the goblin who rid us of bloody bins spawn should be rewarded? Yes, Director, but... Quote ellipsis. But nothing, Barchok. You have raised a fine son, a proud goblin warrior. His tutors and trainers return glowing reports. You yourself marched proudly into this room to boast of his achievements. His work inside Hogwarts has been exemplary, and raised our profile to heights we never thought possible. I know as a father you want your son to make his own decision and I promise to honor that, but I for one would be happy if he chose to stay with Gringotts. Barchok was never so glad to have a tankard of grog in his hand, after hearing that he certainly needed it. He couldn't drink it now though until the director was finished presenting his argument. I know your original intention was to have your son taking his place in wizarding society, giving the nation a voice at the very top of their culture, that is still a worthwhile aim. Don't you see though, your son rejecting that life to live amongst us could have just as profound an effect on our community. The head of the Goblin Nation began listing his reasons for a statement that was every bit as shocking as when Barchok first proposed Harry Potter being raised as one of them. Both goblins in the room were also aware that one of them had very nearly lost his head that day. He has already killed with his blade in combat and righted a historic wrong, he could be every bit as great a hero to our nation as the boy who lived is to the wizards. Master Sharkshard thinks that when your son masters his magic, no goblin will be able to stand against him in combat. That in itself is an achievement which deserves to be rewarded. Now will you stand and toast your son's success with me? We have a ceremony to arrange, let's invite his young friend along and nail our intentions to the wall for all to see. Barchok knew one tankard wasn't going to be enough, he would need to write to Harry though before he drank any more. Director, you do me and my family great honor. Awarding my son this rank, and inviting his friend to the ceremony will certainly start the cart rolling. Here's to smooth track and a safe arrival at the destination we both want. The shocked goblin then drank deeply of the now much needed brew. Urgit delivered her letter to Harry before popping onto the table beside Hermione, the witch had moonlight in her lap and the wise bird knew this would mean more scraps. She wasn't disappointed as the first piece of bacon came her way, the young Neasel wasn't in the slightest bit jealous, appearing to know there was plenty available for both familiars. A snowy white owl and a jet black cat, they couldn't be more different yet get along fine together. Do you think we can add their example to us for Harry? Harry hadn't heard a word, his entire attention riveted to the parchment in his hands. He'd now read the relevant section three times and it still didn't make sense. What the? Harry, is everything all right? I honestly don't know. How can you not know? I mean I need a few minutes to figure this out. This is life-changing Hermione, and not something you expect with your breakfast on a Thursday morning. Nothing in Hogwarts could be kept secret and Harry's voice had been loud enough to attract attention. Soon the entire hall knew Harry had received disturbing news from home. Dumbledore sensed an opening so headed over to the Ravenclaw table. If the boy was upset, he might let something slip. The head of Harry's house followed on right behind the headmaster though. Albus started with an obvious question to get the boy talking. Any news of when the new history professor will be arriving at Hogwarts Mr. Crow? Tomorrow, and actually it's Centurion Crow. Phileas immediately had his right hand in a clenched fist and placed on his chest above his heart, he then bowed his head to complete the salute. Well met Centurion Crow, and may I be the first to congratulate you. With Professor Flitwick congratulating Harry, Hermione's worry meter slipped down about four notches, she was now more confused than concerned. Centurion, like in the Roman army, do you now have a hundred goblins under you? Harry was still struggling to come to terms with this news so it was left to their head of house to explain. A centurion is a warrior who, by his actions, has done the goblin nation a great service. He doesn't have warriors under his command as such, though a warrior would obey if a centurion gave a direct order. The nearest thing I can think of to compare it with would be an order of Merlin, or something like a knighthood in the muggle world. I think Harry will be the youngest ever recipient of this great honor, have they arranged the date of the ceremony yet? My father says it's all in hand. Master Flitwick, can you spare the time to have a meeting before classes start? Hermione should be included too, since she's going to be receiving an invitation from the director to attend the ceremony. Flitwick's, what, rivaled that of the headmasters in their history class for sheer volume of noise, the difference this time was that the entire hall heard and fell silent. Urgit shot into the air and circled above while Hermione comforted Moonlight, both familiars had reacted badly to the loud shout. So, me attending this ceremony is not what normally happens. I should be getting used to it by now, hanging around with Harry. Phileas was delighted to see how well the girl was taking this, he needed to let her know just how momentous this was though. Miss Granger, I think you will be the first witch or wizard ever to attend one of these ceremonies. I myself have never seen one. Albus was quick to react, he really didn't need more positive attention for the goblins. If Miss Granger is going to be in any danger, then I'm afraid I can't allow her to attend. Dumbledore may have been quick but Harry was lightning. He was on his feet and facing down the headmaster. Since Hermione has already been attacked twice in your school, I hardly think we need to take safety advice from Albus Dumbledore. When her parents sign the permission form, you have no further say in the matter headmaster. This does not concern you. Albus knew he had made a terrible mistake, he was currently standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with a first year but unbelievably was in deep trouble. While still quick, he was a wizard with well over a century of years under his belt. Young Harry on the other hand had speed to burn with reflexes to match, and Albus had foolishly placed himself in easy range of that deadly knife. Visions of wands lying sliced clean through on that toilet floor sent shivers down the headmaster. The elder wand may be the most powerful of wands, but it was still made of wood and wouldn't survive an encounter with a goblin blade. It was actually Phileas who saved the situation escalating to that point, and Albus having to back down from a first year in front of the entire school. Miss Granger will be treated with the utmost respect while inside Gringotts, to do otherwise would see the offender pay a very high price. 
she will be attending as the guest of the director, to even insult her reflects badly on Ragnik, certainly not good for any goblin doing the insulting's health. Add to that, the bracelet she wears tells everyone she is under the protection of a very powerful family. This last fact was news to everyone bar Harry, even Hermione. Phileas explained the bracelet's significance in goblin culture to the entire hall, all of whom were now listening intently. Professor McGonagall is known for wearing a piece of her clan tartan as part of her robes, the filigree design on the bracelet provides the same function. To a goblin, it's as easy to read as tartan is to a Scot. To treat Miss Granger with anything less than the respect she deserves would see that goblin incur the wrath of not only the director, but one of the goblin nation's most powerful families too. I agree with Centurion Crow, she will be far safer inside Gringotts than her time at Hogwarts has been. Albus was forced to accept this, he had no means of refuting any of these claims. The headmaster attempted to at least save some face. Please arrange for the appropriate paperwork to be in Hogwarts well before this ceremony takes place. Harry wasn't prepared to let the headmaster off with even that much. My father will be contacting Professor McGonagall shortly with all the details, and the completed paperwork. Master Flittick, my father also wishes to invite you to the ceremony. It was a delighted head of Ravenclaw who once more gave the centurion salute before leading both of them to his office. Hermione was on Harry's arm but with Moonlight cradled in her other, they had barely left the hall when she asked the first question. What just happened in there Harry? Remember I said I had to do this because only I could. I think the director has just changed the rules and now wants me to help change goblin minds too. I want to talk it over with Master Flittick but I think I'm right. The director inviting you along is the biggest clue. He's deliberately showing me choosing Gringotts doesn't mean I would lose my friends, and publicly throwing his backing behind that. This ceremony also very publicly places the director behind me being considered a goblin. A centurion is something every goblin warrior dreams of becoming, I just can't believe it's happening to me. Hermione wasn't too troubled by this news. I've already told you Harry, if you leave then I'm coming too. I haven't seen anything since our first night in Hogwarts that would make me want to change my mind. Considering you didn't even get house points for saving us from that troll, I would say you deserve this, except I'm beginning to think this centurion thing is even bigger than I first thought. Phileas was also running the facts through his mind, and coming to the same conclusion as Harry. If this came down to a tug o war between the two cultures, the poor boy's eventual decision had just become an impossible one. Bill could tell the gloves were now off, Harry's news had inserted a touch of panic into the headmaster's manipulations. Albus, you have to understand I was not the only person considered for this job, this is a fantastic opportunity for me. What you're asking would finish my career if word ever got back. My boy, what you fail to see are the wider implications we're dealing with here. Transfiguration is changing as Minerva becomes more and more enchanted with the goblin method of performing this task. Your defense classes are coveted nearly as much as those private potions lessons that are taught by a goblin. Tomorrow, we have a new history professor who will introduce a new course, both course and professor are bought and paid for by the goblins. Albus followed this up with an impassioned plea. They are using Harry's influence, and the pot of gold, to undermine our society in a way that's just as dangerous as any dark lord. Their influence has now spread over four of our seven core subjects, five if you count Phileas teaching charms, and I need to know what their intentions are. Surely there is something you can tell me. I can tell you they want Voldemort gone, something I know we both agree with. Albus only nodded and let the silence draw out, wanting more information than that. His patience was finally rewarded. They also have a plan concerning the school that I think you should be part of, I was told no. They suspect that there may be a horcrux hidden inside Hogwarts, Harry's hoping his status as her champion will help him find it. If he discovers one, my job is to safely transport it to Gringotts. If you discover one, I want to examine it. Sorry Albus, my instructions are explicit. Protect Harry at all costs, and get any horcrux to Gringotts immediately. The goblins have a procedure to deal with these things so you can rely on them to do it safely. Do you know if they have destroyed any more? I was told about the one that had been inside Harry, nothing specific out with that. I do know they have a small team dedicated to researching and then running down any leads on these abominations. At the moment, that team's best guess at a Horcrux location is Hogwarts. It wasn't much but at least he would be told if a Horcrux was removed from Hogwarts. Now that he had breached the wall of William's defenses, the next piece of information should come easier. Soon, he would know everything that the goblins trusted their curse breaker with. If it became necessary to expose that information to others, William would make a fine defense professor when the goblins threw him out. He would even have accommodation in the castle, and away from his mother. After receiving a howler from Molly when she found out Voldemort was in the castle, Albus thought getting out of the borough would surely be a plus point for the young man taking the job. The new history professor wasn't a wizard but Harry didn't think Draco would be complaining. Professor Hobson wasn't a goblin, or even a centaur, she was a five-foot six Swedish blonde in her mid-late twenties. Her face and figure were such that the seventh-year males were considering if dropping grades on their other subjects might be worth it to be in a classroom with the hottest witch in Hogwarts. No, Draco would certainly not be complaining about the latest goblin import to the castle. A N your response to my last chapter was just, wow. I do actually strive to make my stories, different, and I was really pleased to see my ideas so well received. Thanks for reading. Visiting parents. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, I don't own these characters and my writing certainly couldn't be considered canon. If my efforts don't fit your idea of what a Harry Potter story should be, I can only offer my apologies and a suggestion. Writing your own really is the only way to ensure the story progresses exactly the way you want it to, it also gives the rest of us something to read. A.N. I'm doing a charity cycle this weekend so you're getting this one early. Chapter 15. With Halloween being on a Thursday, the ceremony where Harry would officially become Centurion Crow was scheduled for the following day. Knowing how much pressure his son had actually been under in his two months at Hogwarts, Barchoke made arrangements for Harry and Hermione to be out of the castle that weekend too. The educator in McGonagall had originally balked at the idea of a pair of first years missing so many classes, forcing Harry to tell her the reason behind needing Halloween away from Hogwarts too. 
After that, it was a teary-eyed deputy headmistress who immediately signed the paperwork. They stayed for astronomy class on the Wednesday evening so didn't leave until after breakfast on Thursday morning, Padma was hugging both of them goodbye before Professor Flittick escorted them to the edge of Hogwarts wards. Harry's portkey then took the pair, plus Moonlight riding in her carrying basket, to Gringotts. Harry so wanted to hug his father, Hermione had gotten him addicted to this most ungoblin-like of behavior. Well met father, I'm delighted to see you again. Well met my son, and of course you too Miss Granger. It does these old eyes good to see you both looking so well. Oh sir, I think I'm more excited over this than Harry is, it's really great to see you again too. The sincerity in her words shone through and had the goblin smiling with delight, it was time to get down to business though. We have quite a lot to accomplish today so I need to get started by letting you know our itinerary. First, we all have an appointment with the tailors for something appropriate to wear tomorrow. Then our trip to Godric's Hollow, followed by a journey to Crawley. Hermione's excitement was reaching hyperventilating proportions. We're going to see my mum and dad. Yes, Harry and I have something we need to take care of but you also have a task to do at home. Hermione had developed and refined her method of dealing with what she called the goblin need to know principle, they never told you anything if they could help it, she only had to look at Harry and raise an eyebrow for him to offer an explanation. Best guess, my father has arranged protection wards on your home. You will need to be there as the warders require someone magical to tie the protection to. I'll tell you about the other trip when I get back, I don't know what I'm going to find and have no intention of letting it spoil our day. My father and I will be perfectly safe so you don't have to worry. I thought it was supposed to be me who knew you well. Their interplay had Barchoke smiling, but still ushering him out his office. They really did have a lot to do, and he was certainly not looking forward to this afternoon. Since the 1st of September, Hermione had felt as if she dropped straight into one of her favorite books, though this was her own personal version, Through the Looking Glass, and what Hermione found there. This morning had been pure Cinderella, she had felt like a princess as the seamstresses fussed over her and the young witch was amazed by the choices they helped her with, material, color, style, etc. Now Hermione was being smacked in the face with the harsh reality of the life she had chosen. Standing there as Harry introduced her to his parents at the graveside was in one way uplifting and yet utterly heartbreaking at the same time. Both his parents had been only 21 when they were murdered, and Hermione didn't know what to make of the inscription on their headstone, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. She stood there trying to be a good friend while Harry talked of meeting her on the express and all their adventures to date. He was always modest when describing his actions in these events, and when saying the Goblin Nation was honoring him by awarding the rank of Centurion. He told his mum about their classes, while saying to his father he'd enjoyed his first flight on a broom but had yet to see a Quidditch match. Hermione's heart was breaking for her best friend, she so couldn't wait to hug her parents and tell her mum and dad she loved them both. The porky had barely set the group down in her enclosed back garden and Hermione was already running, racing through the French doors while shouting for her parents. It was a smiling Harry who picked up Moonlight's basket and followed his father in the direction his best friend had shot off. They soon came across all three Grangers sharing a needy and tearful hug. Harry felt as if they were intruding until Hermione broke away from her parents and was quickly dragging him over to meet them. Mum, Dad, this is Harry. Hermione was in her usual position of being on Harry's left arm so he had to sit Moonlight's carrier down to offer her father his hand. Pleased to meet you sir. While Dan was noticing how firm this young lad's handshake was, and just how comfortable his daughter appeared on his arm, Harry was getting his first close look at Hermione's parents. He would place both about late thirties with her father easily qualifying for the tall, dark and handsome tag that he'd heard some of the witches bandying about in Hogwarts. That those remarks were aimed at him went right over his head. Harry also thought Emma Granger was a stunningly beautiful woman, politely and sincerely saying so as he kissed the back of her hand. Emma Granger couldn't believe her first look at Hermione's best friend. His dark suit appeared as it had been handmade by the best that Savile Row had to offer, though its cup could hardly be considered traditional. His snow-white shirt was impeccably matched by a pearl-gray waistcoat and cravat, crossed by a sash that held a bejeweled but obviously deadly sword. The long jet-black hair framing those unbelievable green eyes made for quite the ensemble, she could now understand Hermione's claims that other witches were throwing themselves at him. Gazing into those mesmerizing eyes almost took her breath away as Harry kissed the back of her hand, claiming it was now easy to see from where Hermione inherited her beauty. Her daughter giggling was a wonderful sound that both Granger parents wanted to hear a lot more of, and broke the spell Emma was falling under. Oh my, he's quite the charmer Hermione. This produced a full-blown laugh from her daughter. The thing is mum, Harry doesn't even know he's doing it. Harry's just being sincere. Hermione was bending down to get the newest member of the Granger family out her basket when her parents caught sight of her bracelet. Jesus, Hermione, you weren't kidding about your present being beautiful. Oh I know mum, isn't Moonlight just gorgeous? Dan and Emma were both delighted the daughter valued her kitten over the golden bracelet, and were looking forward to hearing their stories over a lunch that was already prepared. Watching the two kids interact at the table, they fond themselves agreeing with Barchoke. Harry certainly brought the best out of Hermione. Their daughter was sitting with Moonlight on her lap, scraps of food would find their way to the kitten, as Hermione's constant chatter and wide smile lit up the room. They had thought her letters were written by a different girl but here was the daughter both parents had always known was inside, all it had needed was some friends to bring this happy and contented version of Hermione to the fore. Soon Barchoke had to offer their apologies, he and Harry had an appointment that couldn't be broken. All three parents watched as their children hugged each other, Barchoke promising that they would be back later. The warders were also due within the hour to begin their work securing the Granger home. Hermione watched Harry and his father disappear and both her parents heard her sigh. Dan went to clear up after lunch, knowing Emma wanted a chance to talk to their not-so-little girl. It was a long time since Sirius Black had enjoyed lunch, it was now a decade since Sirius had enjoyed anything. Today was the tenth anniversary of the worst day of his life, the day his entire world turned to shit. It was therefore a great shock when he heard the guard approaching and then his cell door creaked open. Move it Black, some goblins here to see you on family business. I thought you were the last of your evil tribe. Sirius wondered if Lucius was trying to get his hands on the Black Fortune again. 
He must be getting desperate, sending goblins to Azkaban now. His only happy thought was his ironclad will that left everything to his godson, neither the Malfoys nor the ministry would get a canute of that money. He was led into the visitor room and sat in the chair, Chain soon had him secured before the guard left. A pair of goblins then entered from another door and sat in front of him. One of the goblins had his hood raised and face hidden while the other did the talking. Good afternoon sir, we were wondering if you could answer some questions for us. Well it's not like I had anything else planned for today. You've came all this way to see me so I'll do my best. Sirius then felt as if all the oxygen had been sucked out of the room. The other, goblin had lowered his hood and the marauder found himself pierced by a familiar pair of angry green eyes. The last time Sirius had looked into a pair of angry green eyes exactly like those was after he had bought his godson a broom for his first birthday. Lily threatened to castrate Padfoot if Harry hurt himself. You can start Mr. Black by telling us why you betrayed my parents to that bastard Voldemort. Hermione was pacing up and down the kitchen, with her gaze fixed on the back garden. Their house was now warded but Harry still hadn't returned as evening was falling, and Hermione's anxiety was mounting with every minute that passed. Her mum and dad were trying to get her to sit but the feeling that something had happened just wouldn't go away. Moonlight was currently positioned on Emma's lap, having taken to both her owner's parents instantly. Her mother was stroking the purring kitten while trying to get Hermione to calm down. Harry will arrive when he gets here, you walking up and down won't make it happen any faster. He's with his father and said they wouldn't be in any danger. Mum, danger just has a way of sneaking up on Harry. He never goes looking for trouble, it usually finds him. Oh shit, Harry. The pair had put Kite into the back garden and it appeared as if his father was holding Harry up, Dan moved swiftly to help Barcho get his son into the house. Hermione stood there almost frozen in shock until Harry spotted her and managed to say, Hermione, she sprang right to him and both were soon a tangle of arms. The two fathers got Harry into a chair and Hermione parked herself on his lap, her best friend was sobbing his heart out and she had no intention of moving anywhere else until he was okay. The three parents were left to stand there as Hermione comforted a Harry who'd clearly had some kind of emotional breakdown. Barchoke was looking on in anguish, feeling as if he'd failed his son. I had no idea how to deal with Harry's reaction but your daughter seemed to know exactly what to do. I can't thank you or Hermione enough for this. Emma watched as their daughter sat on a boy's lap and whispered in his ear, that the same boy was holding onto her as if his life depended on it gave some idea of just how much these two had come to depend on each other. She was so glad of having the chance to talk with Hermione, and relieved she had time to pass that information on to her husband while their daughter was assisting with the wards. Hermione's revelation that Harry wouldn't even consider a girlfriend until this nutter was no longer after him had eased Dan's worries. All three parents already had a fair idea who Harry would be turning to when that time came. Emma's advice to her daughter was to be Harry's best friend, and anything more that she wanted would perhaps follow later. Emma hoped it would be years later but children seemed to grow up faster with every passing generation. She asked Barchoke the obvious question. What happened? It's a very long story Emma, and one you will hear in great detail, but let's wait until Harry feels up to telling his part of it. My son has just had the biggest shock of his life. I have seen him physically battered and bruised yet not a tear was shed, this just reminded me he still has a bit of growing to do. I have gotten used to treating him like an adult but he is only 11, and today that showed. Having Hermione in his arms was allowing Harry to regain control of his emotions. Harry had built his drive to excel on a foundation of three life goals, three reasons he must train, study and be at his best so he could achieve his aims. These trio of absolutes were the force that gave Harry the strength to get back up in a fight when his body was screaming enough, what gave him the drive and determination to succeed on his mission at Hogwarts. He was determined to prove his, family, wrong for discarding him out of hand, his greatest wish was to one day confront them. In his book, a child being magical was not a good enough reason to throw that child away. His father was a different species and, in his own way, loved him very much. Goblins worshipped their children and Harry had been raised as a goblin, so his abandonment at his relatives' hands was a scar that went really deep. Secondly, he needed to see Voldemort gone forever. Even without the prophecy, this would have been one of his main goals. Revenge was a concept that spanned many cultures but Harry considered it more a case of delayed justice. Voldemort had killed his parents, and would be coming back to try for him again. Seeing this monster gone forever was something that had to be done, and, according to the prophecy, only he could do it. Thirdly, Harry desperately wanted to look the wizard in the eye that had betrayed his parents and ask him why, before spitting in the bastard's face. Today he thought he would accomplish one of those aims, only to discover it was the wrong man held in Azkaban. This had badly shaken those painstakingly constructed foundations, and Harry didn't know how to deal with the situation he now found himself in. When Harry began to speak, it was to Hermione he addressed himself. The three parents just sat and listened, almost forgotten about by their children. Hermione, I have hated someone for as long as I can remember. I took delight and comfort from the fact he was locked away in the toughest prison on the planet. No punishment was too harsh for this person, no suffering too great. Today, my father and I went to Azkaban to confront this criminal. Hermione's gasp of shock saw Harry falter for a moment, it also allowed Barchoke to quietly explain to her parents just what Azkaban was. Hermione now holding Harry even tighter at the mention of that foul place gave him the strength to continue. I found an innocent man Hermione, I found family I didn't know I had. I found a godfather, a godfather who even after 10 years in Azkaban still loves me. How could I be so wrong? What else in my life am I totally wrong about? I don't know what to do next Hermione. His best friend instinctively understood what the problem was here, Harry's very beliefs had just taken a massive hit. There was also the fact that another person said they loved him, apparently not something goblins were noted for saying to each other. Hermione had come to understand Harry very well, and thought she knew what to say to help her best friend. Love him back Harry, that's all you can do. If he really loves you, then that's all he would want. Let the adults work on how to get him out of there, you can't do any more at the moment. Harry was crying again, but this time it seemed different. Gone were the distraught, heart-wrenching sobs, this was more like a welcome release. As they watched Hermione once more work her soothing magic on her best friend, Dan needed to know something from Barchoke. 
Is this man really innocent? We have searched for years, attempting to unearth information on Sirius Black, the man who betrayed Harry's parents. That we couldn't find any surprised us. The Ministry aren't usually that efficient at keeping secrets, and left us with no option but to approach the source. Sirius claims that he never had a trial or was even questioned answers our lack of records problem. With his permission, we were able to access the Black Vaults. Harry is indeed his godson, and sole heir to the Black title and fortune. Emma couldn't get her head around this development. How could an innocent man end up in prison, without even a trial? Powerful figures wanted him there Emma, that was all it took. The man was in tears, claiming he had let down his godson. He was at Harry's parents' home that night after the attack, and wanted to take baby Harry with him. Dumbledore already had plans in place and Sirius was denied his legal right. Instead, he went after the real betrayer but was caught before he could kill the traitor. Sirius was again denied his legal rights, he awoke in Azkaban and has been there for the last ten years. Harry then tried to comfort Sirius by giving him a quick overview of his own life, before becoming distraught with himself that we hadn't taken any action earlier. Ooh earlier ooh. Harry, you had to stay hidden, I completely understand and agree with that. I see a wonderful young man before me, and that makes me feel better than I have in many years. Your father has done a fantastic job raising you. Sirius, I'm now head of the Potter family, I can use that to get you out. Sirius saw the Potter ring appear on his godson's finger. Not without ending the escrow agreement that keeps you protected, I don't want that. How did you slip that one past the ministry anyway? We placed the documents in a bundle of goblin complaints against the ministry, and filed them with the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. We have a signed receipt and the 90 days the ministry, or anyone else, had to object has now passed. That is so sneaky, I love it. Please listen to me, you couldn't have registered those papers before your 11th birthday, so the 90 days must have just passed this week. You couldn't have come here any quicker even if you wanted to. Harry started sobbing then, knowing what he had come here to do. Confront his parents' betrayer and spit in Sirius Black's face. Listen to me Harry, knowing you are safe and well will allow me to survive in here. Yes I want out, but not at any cost to the only person in the world who means anything to me. They heard the guard returning and Harry flew to hug his chained godfather, his father was left to pull his son's hood up and stop Harry attacking the guard as the idiot berated and manhandled Sirius out the room. Ooh present ooh. Dan had a query, are you saying all Harry had to do was pull his hood up and he could waltz right through a maximum security prison? I was clearly a goblin, and chatting with my companion in our own language. I told you, to them goblins are only a small step up from moonlight there. Yes there was certainly a chance we may have been discovered, that's why we couldn't make the trip any sooner. Until Harry went to Hogwarts, no one but Dumbledore knew where he was. I got Harry back to Gringotts, we were already sure Sirius was telling the truth but confirmation saw me having to bring Harry here in that state. Emma was focusing on another issue. You said Harry was now head of the Potter family, does that mean he's made his decision? What I want for my son is that he, and he alone, has the power to make the decision. This was crucial in that our greatest fear was the ministry or Dumbledore would find, or even invent, some legal loophole to tear Harry away from me. The escrow agreement means he's considered property until he reaches the age of 17, or the head of the Potter family decrees otherwise. Since that is now Harry, he has the power to end it at any point he so chooses. At the moment though, this would have the effect of throwing him to the wolves. He has trained hard and studied even harder for what he knew was awaiting him at Hogwarts. Harry has neither the knowledge nor experience to handle being an adult wizard. He needs time to grow, physically and emotionally before that decision really becomes a viable one. So this was more about stopping anyone else forcing that decision on him. Exactly Emma, we want to keep this information secret for as long as possible. I don't want Harry jumping into anything and getting some short-term gain, but losing in the long run. Sirius picked up on that aspect at once, which was why he didn't want Harry rushing out and declaring himself head of the Potter family to help. Will he have to deal with this sack load of betrothal contracts now? Barchoke's eyebrows shot up at that. He told Hermione about them. Emma was confused at the surprise, you could almost say shock, her question had been greeted with. Yes, is there something wrong with that? Oh no, it's just the level of trust between them that shocked me. On seeing Emma visibly confused, Barchoke attempted to explain, that a parent would offer the daughter in marriage to someone they had never even met, for financial gain, is as disgusting to goblins as I can see it is to you. Goblins could never treat their children like property. He then continued quickly, knowing the irregularity in that statement and noticing Dan had clearly picked up on. Had Harry been born a goblin, an escrow agreement would never have been possible. I only suggested it to protect Harry from an orphanage, my intention was always to adopt and raise him as my son. When Harry publicly declares himself as head of House Potter, one of his first tasks will be to reject each and every one of those contracts. They are something that he is deeply embarrassed by, which was why I was so surprised he mentioned them to Hermione. The parents had been chatting in voices that were barely above a whisper because Harry and Hermione had become very quiet, a closer inspection showed that they had fallen asleep in each other's arms. Emma couldn't help herself. Ah, don't they look cute? This led to her husband shaking his head but making an offer to Barchoke anyway. I really don't want to disturb them and Harry is welcome to stay here tonight. You could pick them both up in the morning. Tomorrow is a very big day for Harry, he really needs to be rested. I think staying here would certainly help with that. Barchoke then had a question of his own. Would you mind if I made them more comfortable? Emma quickly agreed and then both Grangers watched in amazement as the chair slowly transformed into a very comfortable looking sofa. The transformation was so slow and gentle, neither of the kids woke as their sleeping position changed. Both were now lying on the sofa though they never released the grip on each other throughout. A cushion became a blanket that tucked both of them in before Barchoke wished everyone a good night. Emma came from the kitchen with two cups of tea to see Dan watching over the sleeping pair. She handed him his cup while expressing her surprise. You're taking this much better than I thought. I half expected you getting the guns out to chase Harry off, not sitting there watching some boy sleeping with your daughter. He knew his wife was teasing but Dan still decided to answer. First of all, this is not some boy, this is Hermione's best friend. 
Furthermore, they are sleeping and did I mention he was eleven? This earned Dan a kiss from his wife, who was still teasing. Why don't you just admit you like the boy? Oh he had you eating out of his hand within minutes, handsome and charming was just two descriptions I heard as I cleared the lunch dishes away. I will admit the boy is polite, courteous and has impeccable taste in females, he had you swooning and clearly adores Hermione. Let's not forget he placed himself between nine bullies and our little girl, I'm trying my hardest to forget all about trolls. Emma held the silence and Dan finally cracked. Okay, I like the boy, satisfied. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page, I think they're adorable together. I wondered about Barchok's comment that these two would be part of each other's lives for years, having seen them today I agree 100%, and approve more than I can say. When have you ever seen our daughter happier, and one of her other friends will be coming for Christmas too? I really can't wait and want to spend as much time with them as possible. This had Dan thinking. Neither Harry nor Padma celebrate Christmas, I think we should go all out to make their first Christmas as memorable as possible. Christmas was Emma's favorite time of the year so that got a big yes from her. They watched as the kids moved to get more comfortable on the conjured sofa, but no point did they release their hold on each other. This actually drew a smile from Dan. Hermione has always been a girl who loved her hugs, it would appear she's found a best friend who thinks the same way. Emma had more to add to that observation. Harry had his first hug on the train to Hogwarts. Hermione said this was a cultural difference Harry was happy to adopt, apparently goblins don't do hugs. That's probably why his father brought him here, Barchoke possibly knew what Harry needed but didn't know how to go about it. This confused Dan, how is that possible? Emma cut right in. Hermione says the four friends come across differences like that every day. They've learned it doesn't make someone right or wrong, just different. She really is growing into a young lady. His wife cut in again. Quote ellipsis. A beautiful young lady who's already well into her first crush. That the subject of this crush is lying on our new sofa snuggling into our daughter means the next few years will be interesting. There is one thing I'm already sure of, that young man there will never break her heart. This time it was Dan's turn to butt in. Here though was the protective father Emma had been expecting. Quote ellipsis. He bloody better not, or he'll need to deal with me. Hogwarts was recovering from its Halloween celebrations and normal service was slowly being resumed at breakfast. The conversations were swaying between the upcoming Quidditch match and the beautiful new history professor, the new course was only mentioned at the Ravenclaw table. All that stopped when the prophet was delivered, the headline alone was enough to account for that. Boy who lived opens his heart to the prophet. Exclusive interview and picture. They did indeed have a picture of Harry, with Hermione of course on his arm. The flowers in his hand were assumed to be for her. There then followed a list of questions and answers that most in the castle recognized the truth of, that was until Padma grabbed a copy and made for the staff table. Professor Flittick, this is a load of rubbish. Harry would never talk to that rag, he won't even read it. I am inclined to agree with you Miss Patil, but that picture is undoubtedly Mr. Crow and Miss Granger, and most of us recognize some truth in the article. She was joined by an angry Neville who defended his friends just as stoutly. Padma and I know what Harry and Hermione had planned yesterday. It's just not possible for this interview to have taken place. All this supposed interview goes on about is how happy Harry is at Hogwarts, where does it say he had to fight a troll and provide three of his own tutors? Neville totally agreed with Padma on this point. It also never mentions the fact that Harry is out of school to become Centurion Crow, something he would be sure to talk about in any interview. Severus had been keeping his head low, observing rather than objecting. The boys' takedown of bins had been pure Slytherin in the way it was handled, the foundation named after his mother supporting a new history course had also grudgingly won the potion master's respect. This interview in today's prophet was more like the behavior he had expected from James Potter's spawn. Severus was head of Slytherin though, so decided to act like one. How can you be so sure of that Mr. Longbottom? Neville and Padma shared a long look. They may be breaking a confidence of Harry's but this interview made their friend seem like an arrogant asshole. Their decision was made. His father was taking him to visit his mum and dad's grave. This is something they do regularly, and Harry spends his time telling his parents what's been happening with him since his last visit. He invited Hermione along and those flowers will be laid on his mum and dad's graves. This is something Harry would never allow the prophet anywhere near. I don't know how they got this information and picture but I'm certain Harry knew nothing about it. Professor McGonagall then stood and confirmed what her young lion had just said. I was aware of where Mr. Crow and Miss Granger were yesterday, and totally agree with Mr. Longbottom. Harry's father would never allow the prophet anywhere near his son, and especially not with yesterday being the anniversary of his parents' murder. Knowing that family as I do, I expect their retaliation to be swift and brutal. I would hate to be the one who leaked Mr. Crow's whereabouts to the press. Padma didn't see McGonagall's gaze settle on Dumbledore, she was too busy staring at the newspaper in her hands. I think it's time this newspaper was treated as the rubbish it is. She began to physically rip the prophet to shreds. Severus got in before anyone else could. Miss Patil, I will not sit here and watch you throw rubbish all over the floor. One point from Ravenclaw, the head of Slytherin then banished his own copy before returning to eat his breakfast. Severus Snape had made his decision. Harry Crow was the son of the best friend he ever, or would ever have. That the boy's father was James Potter could be conveniently ignored. Phileas thought he was going to have to argue with Severus again, his one-point deduction and then banishing his own copy of this, rubbish, saw the diminutive charms master smile. He banished the copy of the prophet that was sitting in front of him, noticing staff along the table were following suit. Albus watched while copies of today's prophet began disappearing from all four house tables as students took the view that the story was wrong, or at least not an interview freely given. He had hoped that this would alienate the boy amongst his peers but the actions of his friends put paid to that. Thankfully the rest of Wizarding Britain would eat it up and believe every word of it. Albus was forced to respond to the quite blatant attempt to have Harry choose a goblin way of life, that just couldn't be allowed to happen. Dan was first down in the morning, and couldn't find either Hermione or Harry. He had raced upstairs and just woken Emma when both of them heard the front door open. As laughter flowed up the stairs, they quickly headed back down and weren't sure how to react with what they found. 
Both kids were dressed in exercise clothes and were flushed as if they had been for a run. Hermione was currently swinging a wooden practice sword about while Harry had a wicked-looking knife in his hand. That knife was passing up and down their sweeping brush, a brush that morphed into a sword to match Hermione's. Morning Mum, Dad, I didn't think you would be up this early. We've just done our morning run and now going to practice with swords in the back garden, Harry's been teaching me. This surprised Dan as much as anything he'd seen since discovering the daughter was a witch, the fact that she was magical seemed easier to believe than Hermione exercising. Do you do this every morning? We run every morning to warm up but Harry has us doing different training every day. At the weekend we just run, Professor Weasley works us hard at our extra defense lessons. Emma was every bit as shocked as her husband. Barchoke said you could perform magic at home because the wards would mask it, can you show us what you're learning? Quick as a flash, Hermione's wand was in her hand and Dan was hit with a leg locker hex. That this was followed by a tickling jinx had both parents laughing. Dan because of the jinx and Emma who thought it was hilarious to watch him laugh and try to maintain his balance at the same time. Hermione soon ended both curses and her wand disappeared back up her sleeve. Professor Weasley provided the three of us with wrist holders for our wands, Harry already had one for his knife. It only takes a flick of my wrist and my wand is ready for action, those were two of the mildest curses were learning. Her father couldn't disguise his pride. That Hermione was not only exercising but learning to defend herself were massive pluses to Dan. That her best friend was responsible for these changes also weighed heavily in Harry's favor, and would see the lad receive a warm welcome whenever he appeared at the Granger's. Emma switched her attention to the young man who was in such distress last night. How are you feeling today, Harry? A lot better, Emma. Hermione has a way of getting me to look at things from a different angle. I now have a godfather, that he's in prison is just about what I've come to expect from my life. I also know my father will be looking for a way to get Sirius out of there, and my father is one very smart goblin. If he's not out of Azkaban by Christmas, I'm sure he'll be able to get us back in to see Sirius again over the holidays. Talking about his father almost seemed to summon him as Barchoke Portkide into the back garden a couple of hours earlier than they were expecting. He marched right up to Harry and handed over a copy of today's prophet. There followed an immediate stream of words in the goblin language. English please son. Sorry father, but if I repeated that in English, Hermione would brain me with that practice sword. He may actually have gotten away with it as Hermione's full attention was taken up by the paper in front of her. How did they get this? We never posed for any picture, and Harry certainly never gave an interview. This makes him out to be as arrogant as Malfoy. As soon as we arrived, I erected wards around that part of the graveyard so we wouldn't be disturbed. No one could have gotten through them without the wards alerting me. We thought some kind of recording quill but that doesn't explain the photograph, I was never more than ten yards away from you too so it has me stumped. Harry though was coming at the problem from a different direction. Someone must have told this Skeeter woman we would be there yesterday, I hardly think they just staked out the cemetery on the off chance we may appear. It was a delighted and proud goblin who answered his son. Of course you are right, we suspect Dumbledore set the entire thing up. He squeezed where you would be on Halloween out of Curse Breaker Weasley, who of course reported this to us at once. We certainly didn't think it would lead to anything like today's prophet. The director is treating this article as a deliberate attack against Gringotts, it can be no coincidence that this comes out the day you are to become the youngest centurion in history, and your supposed interview makes no mention of it. Our legal team are meeting with the prophet right now. Dan was extremely unhappy at seeing his daughter plastered all over the front page of what was effectively a national newspaper. What are you hoping to achieve? They will print a full retraction and reveal how they got this information. That sounded fine in principle but newspapers were very reluctant to call themselves liars, and even more so to reveal sources. Do you think they will? Barchoke answered with a question of his own. What would happen if your bank suddenly decided they wouldn't support your business, and wanted all the money back they had lent you? Add to that you wouldn't be able to use the bank to pay your staff salaries, or pay for supplies to keep your business running. Oh, and you can't take your account to another bank, since there isn't one. There really was only one answer Dan could give. We would be ruined, but why would you do that? The director looks on this as a political attack on Gringotts, a deliberate attempt to discredit one of our subjects. Centurion Crow here extolling the virtues of Hogwarts, and the wizarding world in general, will do massive damage to Harry's standing in our nation. This whole thing has Dumbledore's stamp all over it, our reaction must be swift and severe. Emma was stunned at how much power the goblins actually wielded in the magical world. Why don't wizards have their own bank? No offense intended Barchoke, but how can it make sense to have all their eggs in the one basket, or all the gold in your bank? You are right Emma but blood wizards are inherently lazy. For generations, a flick or swish from their wand has gotten them whatever they wanted, they always take the easy option. Even their favorite sport is played sitting on a broom, hardly physically taxing. Harry and Hermione exercise every day but both their blood friends think they are crazy for doing so, because that's the way they have been raised to think. While Gringotts certainly employs a few witches and wizards, they never get to work on the financial side of the bank. Why should we train people who could one day replace us? This left the mother shaking her head. Hermione told us there were cultural differences between all four friends but it takes some getting used to. Do you really think this newspaper will print an apology and the truth? Hermione had something to add to that conversation. Well, if there's going to be another picture, I want to be in it. I look like some gormless village idiot in this one, Harry though is very handsome. Hermione did indeed have a different way of looking at things and it generated a smile amongst those gathered there that morning. It was time for breakfast, preparations for the ceremony and then crushing a newspaper, unless they printed the truth. Just a normal day for Harry Crow. Hermione's views on the picture were shared by a young redhead at the burrow. Ginny couldn't wait to get the newspaper up to her bedroom and take a pair of scissors to that picture. She intended to cut so that only her handsome Harry would be left, with flowers in his hand for her of course. Ginny was also counting the days to Christmas and knew she would be getting her present early this year. What gift could possibly compare to her meeting Harry Crow? A N thanks for reading. A centurion and a new friend. Harry Crow. Disclaimer, the only thing I own here is the iPad I used to write this chapter. 
Harry Potter and all associated characters belong to JKR. A.N. I am organizing a charity concert in school next week. Rehearsals and planning are eating into my writing time. This may see my posting schedule slip for chapter 17. If this does happen, then I can assure you it's for a good cause. Chapter 16. Hermione was back through the looking glass again, at least that's what it felt like. She was clothed in pure white silk and the material flowed over her form like layers of liquid. Her robe was high at the neck and down to her ankles with a violet sash around her waist providing the only color. That wasn't quite true though, apart from her gold bracelet, Barchok had loaned her jewelry that belonged to his late wife. A golden necklace that had the same filigree design was almost like chainmail armor as it spread over her chest and the diamond tiara she wore was so beautiful, it wouldn't look out of place in the Tower of London beside the British crown jewels. She was walking beside Barchok down an aisle that had seating for about 500 on either side, they were the main guests of honor and had to make their way to the very front. She could hear the murmurings as they walked to their assigned seats and, thanks to Professor Flittick, Hermione could actually understand them. Rowena Ravenclaw had invented a spell that allowed a witch or wizard to communicate with goblins, Helena had taught this now forgotten spell to the head of Ravenclaw so Hermione could understand what was happening here today. It would have been considered the height of bad manners to be translating while another goblin was speaking, this solved the problem of Hermione not having a clue about what was being said. Hermione thought the part of the bank that did business with the public was rather grand while those areas unseen, behind the scenes so to speak, were fairly spartan. There was no decoration, no paintings, tapestries or even pictures, just plain stone walls. The place where the centurion ceremony would be held blew all her goblins being a utilitarian race theories out the window. The room was oval in shape with a domed ceiling, and Hermione couldn't spot a square inch of this massive cathedral-like hall that wasn't covered in at least one form of artwork. Some of this artwork appeared to be exquisitely carved directly into and out of the stone, with sculpture blending seamlessly into paintings. Add to that the effects created by flickering lighting being beautifully and creatively incorporated into each tableau, carved goblins holding smokeless flaming torches and even a fire-breathing dragon painting, sculpture, and it created the impression you could walk directly into some of the scenes. In any culture, art of this diversity and quality would have been considered beautiful. Given the starkness of its surrounding rooms and corridors, it was breathtaking. That most of these scenes depicted goblins battling foes or fierce creatures Hermione thought was to be expected from a race of warriors. From her seat beside Barchok in the front row, she had an uninterrupted view of the raised stage that filled this end of the Oval Hall Cathedral. There was a throne-like carved granite seat in the center of the marble stage, with about another forty seats, in two banks of twenty, facing not into the audience but the lone seat in the middle. Hermione found herself sitting between Harry's father and Master Pitsley, she could hardly miss that Master Sharpshard was also sitting in the front row. She pitied the poor goblin who ended up sitting behind the massive master of the blade, Hermione didn't think they would be asking him to move though. The sound of drumming reverberated through the now-packed hall, cathedral and that was the signal for everyone to stand. The drumming was caused by goblin warriors banging their swords and axes off their shields and was in time to them marching down the aisle. They came to a halt as the lead goblins reached the front before performing a complex marching maneuver. This saw the warriors aligned either side of the aisle, but now with each line facing the other. The drumming stopped as, with a loud cheer, all the warriors raised their weapons in salute. An imposing goblin that Hermione took to be director Ragnik walked down the center of this salute. He was clad in body armor that was decorative and ceremonial but certainly still appeared sturdy enough to fulfill its primary function, and carrying the wickedest looking battle axe she'd ever seen. Considering there were at least a hundred on display here today, Hermione now felt she had a basis for making such a judgment. Marching behind the director were the existing centurions and two things immediately struck the young witch. Harry could have his age trebled and he would still be the youngest centurion, the other thing was more in the form of a question, a question she would ask Barcho later. Hermione wanted to know if the goblins had copied the Roman armies, or if the most successful troops the world had ever known had based themselves on the goblins. The centurions wore tunics much like the one Harry did for exercising but these had strips of dragon hide that acted almost like a kilt. All tunics were festooned with goblin steel and she supposed the epaulettes signified their rank. They all had golden bands around their upper arms that, as she had come to expect, were intricately carved. Though able to understand and speak the language, Hermione again was left longing for, the idiot's guide to goblins. There was just so much going on in this culture and the young witch felt that she was missing out on a lot. It was the helmets the centurions wore that had her comparing them to Roman soldiers, with the crest running up the middle, they appeared identical to ones she had seen in museums. That their tunics were an array of colors led Hermione to believe that this was based purely on the species of dragon they chose to make the tunic from. As Ragnik stepped onto the stage and sat in the center seat, the other centurions filled the chairs either side of the director. It was then Hermione's breath caught in her throat, Harry had just walked forward and knelt in front of Ragnik. His tunic was ivory in color and his, kilt, that had swayed as he walked was hardly longer than his exercise tunic. She had noticed that Harry, although a lot younger than the other centurions, appeared physically taller and broader at the shoulder than a good percentage of them. The director stood and began addressing the assembled crowd. My fellow goblins and invited guest, for millennia the position of centurion has been coveted by each goblin warrior who has ever picked up a weapon. The young candidate that kneels before me now is no different in that respect. He may not have been born a goblin but has certainly been raised as one, embracing our beliefs and values to become a warrior of some renown. He attends Hogwarts but not as a wizard, Crow here is the first goblin warrior ever to attend that ancient seat of learning. There he still receives tutoring from some of our most illustrious masters, and extols the virtues of goblin learning to his classmates. Some of those classmates have actually joined Crow in these lessons, forsaking the offered wizard classes in the process. Hermione was really glad of the translation charm now, otherwise she would have no idea what Ragnik was saying. She thought the goblin leader was laying it on a bit thick, but wondered how much of that was influenced by today's issue of the prophet. Ragnik was certainly giving Harry the big build-up. Our young warrior had hardly set foot in the castle before accomplishing the first of his achievements, the lost goblin forge blade of Godric Gryffindor is back in our hands. It sits proudly on Crow's hip as the castle herself acknowledged the goblin warrior as her champion. This was no honorary position though, that sword he proudly wears has already tasted blood. 
The security of Hogwarts was breached and a mountain troll was running rampage through the castle. It had three young witches and a female healer trapped in their infirmary. Ragnik was an experienced orator and paused here to let the tension build. He also directed his gaze to Hermione. The young witch who is our guest of honor here today is only able to attend because Crow saved all of their lives. He cut that troll down to size before jumping onto its back and administering the killing blow, almost decapitating the beast in the process. This resulted in loud cheering, with all the warriors banging their weapons off their shields in appreciation of their brother warrior's victory. Hermione was blushing profusely at being singled out for attention, she couldn't imagine how Harry felt. He was still kneeling in front of Ragnik with his head bowed but Hermione didn't need to see his face to know it would be red from embarrassment. Harry was such a modest person that this must be torture for him. Unfortunately, the director wasn't quite finished heaping on the praise. If those achievements weren't enough to earn this young warrior the rank of centurion, his next deed certainly merited the award. Every warrior is taught that a sharp mind is the greatest weapon, and Crows is every bit as sharp as that fabled blade he carries. With the help of his father, he engineered a coup that saw the disgusting ghostly spawn of bloody bins expelled from Hogwarts Castle. The cheering this time was tumultuous, and every single goblin was on their feet in celebration. Hermione hadn't understood the depth of feeling held against the ghostly professor, here was a very vocal and visual representation of just how much Harry's victory meant to the goblin nation. Hermione couldn't help but compare her meeting with the Minister of Magic to that of the goblin director she was watching here. She equated the bumbling fudge with his green bowler hat to Dr. Watson, while Ragnick was clearly the Sherlock Holmes of the two. Fudge couldn't impress a class of 11 and 12 year olds while Ragnick had over a thousand goblins hanging on his every word, and the director still wasn't finished. Ragnick waited until everyone had returned to their seats before continuing. Now for everyone else, getting the butcher's last remaining kin thrown out of the castle would have been enough, not for Crow. He didn't want one goblin hating professor simply replaced by another of the same ilk. A teacher not tainted by bins was brought to Hogwarts from Europe to teach proper history, and not the bigoted filth that ghost peddled. How did Crow get Hogwarts to accept this professor? He paid for it with his own gold. This seemed to impress the crowd nearly as much as the killing of the troll. Ragnick let this sink in before proceeding. You have heard of this young goblin's deeds and achievements, it was I who, being so impressed with his actions, bestowed this honor upon him. As tradition demands, it is now time to ask if anyone here objects to this appointment. As I missed the fight where Crow drew first blood against Master Sharpshard, I'm rather hoping someone will come forward. There were sharp intakes of breath as that news permeated the hall, anyone thinking Harry unworthy of this honor were now going to keep those thoughts to themselves. There were a few members of Barchoke's family waiting on him passing away in the hope they would inherit, his adopted son becoming the youngest ever centurion killed that notion stone dead. A centurion as a son would satisfy goblin law, and that son would stand to inherit everything. These family members also reckoned their fate would be the same as their chances of inheriting if they stood and objected, dead as stone. Objections were settled by a duel, and anyone who could draw first blood against the greatest blade in the nation was not someone you wanted to challenge. Ragnik had known about the hyenas circling around Barchoke's wealth, but, like the cowards they were, these hyenas would never attempt a frontal attack on a stronger opponent. Crow's award was unopposed. Arise warrior, do you accept this position our nation bestows upon you? Harry stood, performed the centurion salute before answering the question loud enough for everyone to hear. Yes director, I do. Hermione had been warned about the blood involved in the next part of the ceremony, she rose with everyone else and tried to stand tall and proud. Watching as Harry held his hand out and the deadly battle axe of the director sliced his hand open was very difficult. Harry didn't flinch as his palm was cut deeply, he clenched his hand into a fist as he made his way to his chosen tableaus. The scene displayed bloody bins and his band of wizards being captured and held at swords points by goblin warriors, but it was the murdered victims depicted there that Harry focused on. There was a dead goblin child carved out of the stone, the realistic wounds were colored bloody and here was where Harry focused his attention. He rubbed his injured hand over the part that was depicted as bleeding, adding his blood to the tableaus. The rock actually began glowing, spreading to illuminate the entire scene as the stone accepted his blood sacrifice. This was also the signal for the loudest cheer of the day. Harry marched back to the director who held out his hand, Harry placed his there and the cup was already healed. The centurion has offered his blood to the nation, and the nation clearly accepted. Step forward those chosen. Barchoke, Master Pitsley and Master Sharpshard stepped forward as three caskets were carried in and placed on the stage. Master Pitsley opened the first casket and removed the two gold armlets that it contained, he handed them both to Ragnik. The symbol of our wealth and status is contained in these bands of power, may they bring strength to your arms in times of strife. The director placed one on each of Harry's upper arms. Master Sharpshard then stepped forward and passed the epaulets the second casket had contained to the director. The badge of office that signifies to the world you are a centurion, wear them with pride. These golden accoutrements were fastened onto each of Harry's shoulders. It was a proud father who opened the last casket and removed a beautifully crafted golden helmet, the plume running down the middle was the same ivory white as Harry's tunic. Harry once more knelt before their leader as his father passed over the last piece to complete the ceremony. A warrior's mind is the greatest weapon, may this protect you in your defense of our nation. When the helmet was on, and the chin strap in place, Harry stood tall and performed the centurion salute three times. Once to the director, then his fellow centurions on his right before performing it lastly to those centurions on his left. Harry then turned to face the crowd, drew his famous sword and raised it high into the air. For Gringotts and the nation. The chant was returned by everyone present before the cheering once more broke out. The first time Hermione laid eyes on Harry wearing his exercise tunic, she had mentally compared him to a young Ares. Harry standing there with his sword raised high increased the intensity of that comparison by a factor of at least ten. She didn't know if the color of Harry's tunic and helmet plume was deliberate or not but Centurion Crow epitomized every historical image or representation of a warrior of the light Hermione had ever seen or even read about. The director's next statement heavily influenced her leaning toward the deliberate option. Ragnik held his hands up for silence before making an announcement. Some of you may have read the lies printed in today's Wizarding Press. We have sent our representatives to this newspaper to register our displeasure in the strongest terms possible. 
This fixed everyone's attention. To a goblin, that statement was only one step away from blades being drawn. We announced to the press, the ministry, the WWN and posted notices in Diagon Alley that Centurion Crow would make a statement on the steps of Gringotts after this ceremony. This will mean a slight delay to the feast, but should be, entertaining, for anyone who wishes to accompany us. That was an invitation most of them would love to take up. That Gringotts steps wouldn't hold anywhere near a thousand goblins meant there would be a mad scramble for places after the director's party left the hall. Ragnik was in the lead, Harry, with Hermione once more on his arm, was right behind him. His father and the guests of honor followed on behind, flanked by the forty centurions and at least sixty warriors. The massed audience were behind the troops and all edging for a place where they could at least hear what would be getting said. With the wizarding wireless network announcing they would be broadcasting a live statement from the boy who lived later today, anyone who couldn't make Diagon Alley had their ears glued to their sets. In a castle in Scotland, an old wizard with a long white beard sucked on his lemon drop but found little solace from his favorite tart sweet. Harry's words broadcast live to the nation could do untold damage, and would be hard to refute. He had immediately contacted Cornelius to see if this could be stopped, even although he knew it was virtually impossible. The minister had quickly pointed out what Albus already knew, Gringotts was sovereign soil to the goblins, ministerial interference could start a war. There was no point in banning the WWN from broadcasting since the entire thing would soon appear in print anyway. With hundreds, if not thousands, expected in the alley, there was just no way to contain any damaging information the boy saw fit to disperse. Albus thought it was a bad day when his only point of comfort was that the students would all be in class, he had no way of knowing that Professor Hobson would have a recording crystal containing the full incident for her classes by Monday morning. His new professor was a great believer in making history lessons relevant to what was happening today, and this could be history in the making. In Devon, a young redhead sat beside the wireless with her mother. Ginny had gotten over the disappointment of not being able to go to the alley today, once she had looked at the problem from a practical point of view. As small as she was, Ginny wouldn't see much in the crush that was sure to form. The fact that she was counting the days until she would be introduced to her hero helped quell that disappointment too. Hearing his voice would do, for now. Amelia was in Dagon Alley with every aura she could throw a uniform on. Even with the cadets supplementing her force, she was still shorthanded for maintaining control over a crowd the size of this one. The crowd kept building as the wizards and witches of Britain turned out in their thousands for their first glimpse of the boy who lived. The auras were stretched thin, not helped by those spectators arriving late and attempting to push their way to the front for a better look. This created surges within the crowd and Amelia thought it was only a matter of time before fights broke out. That everything suddenly went quiet and the crowd actually took a step back surprised Amelia, that was until she turned around. Heavily armed goblin after heavily armed goblin just poured out the bank, their very numbers made the head of the DMLE's heart sink. Here was a force trained and ready for battle, that they outnumbered her auras by at least two to one had Amelia worried. Like everyone else, she was expecting a verbal statement from Harry today, it would appear the goblins were making a bold visual statement too. Then her eyes settled on the couple in the center and she was left not knowing what to think. Mr. Crow with Miss Granger on his arm appeared like a young prince and princess, standing there with their conquering army behind them. She could already see the press cameras snapping the pictures that would be front page tomorrow, and for most of next week too. Ragnok's deep baritone voice rang out over the entire length of the alley, his voice obviously charmed to carry so everyone could clearly hear his words. The WWN reporter had the microphone tied to his mouth as he described the scene for those who couldn't make it to Diagon Alley. When Ragnik began speaking, he had the good sense to shut up, hold out the microphone and let the radio listeners actually hear what was going on. Witches and wizards of Britain, you are being lied to. I know this for a fact but, relations between us being what they are, my words are easily dismissed. Instead, I'll hand you over to someone I trust you will believe. Ragnik applied the same charm to Harry as his voice rang true around the alley, and, thanks to the wireless, the entire country. I hope you will forgive me if I make a few mistakes here. This is my first ever attempt at public speaking, and we seem to have drawn quite the crowd. Some laughter rang out at that as the crowd settled to hear what the boy who lived had to say. Harry had worked on this speech with his father so knew exactly what he wanted to achieve here. Yesterday, my father took myself and my best friend Hermione to visit my parents' grave. As you can hopefully understand, this was an intensely private occasion. Someone managed to sneak into the cemetery, eavesdrop on our private conversations and take that photograph without our knowledge or permission. To make matters worse, it all appears as an exclusive interview with me on the front page of today's Prophet. I have never given an interview and certainly never met this daily Prophet reporter. For this Skeeter woman to claim I have makes one of us a liar. I'm standing right here and prepared to face her, publicly calling a goblin's honesty into question is a very serious issue. In the silence that followed that remark, Amelia took it upon herself to officially ask a question. Mr. Crow, are you willing to make a complaint to the ministry? This was unexpected but again Harry let his training take over. Well met Madam Bones, and it's Centurion Crow now. We've just come from the ceremony where this great honor was bestowed upon me. All goblin complaints to the ministry have to be rooted through the department for the regulation and control of magical creatures, I am unaware if they have staffing issues but it's been years since we got a positive result from them. I would rather stand here as a goblin and call her a liar to her face, an action I am prepared to defend with my blade if necessary. My father had that area warded yet she still managed to sneak through and spy on us, I would have though that would have been worrying to the ministry too, unless she is on the ministry payroll. Amelia attempted to quash that notion at once. To my knowledge she is not, and it does concern me she was able to get so close to you. I also notice she is conspicuous by her absence today, Rita Skeeter is not one to miss such things. If she has the ability to spy on us in a graveyard, my guess is she would be here and using that same technique to remain hidden today. This time though all these good people have heard every word I've said, including that Skeeter is a liar. To me, that she does not stand and refute those claims confirms her guilt. Miss Granger, can you corroborate Centurion Crow's claims? She looked toward the director who cast the same spell on Hermione before she answered. Yes Madam Bones, as you can tell from the picture printed today, I was at Harry's side the entire time. 
Neither of us spoke to anyone other than our parents. We are also concerned with who passed on the information that we would be at that cemetery yesterday, that information was known to very few. I can also confirm Harry is Centurion Crow. The charm Professor Flitwick cast now came into play as Hermione turned and bowed to Director Ragnick. When she spoke, it was in the director's own language. I would sincerely like to thank Director Ragnick for inviting me here today. It was very moving to watch my best friend receive such a great honor, I felt honored myself just by being there. This had an effect on all present, not least the goblin leader. He had gambled somewhat in awarding Crow Centurion status, and even more so by inviting his young friend to the ceremony. Ragnick thought that gamble had backfired after reading today's prophet, a piece of astute manipulation by Dumbledore. The only response the nation could give such an attack was to come out fighting, so that's why they were all standing here on the steps of Gringotts. He'd heard from Barchok and their tutors that these two complemented each other, Ragnick had just witnessed this for himself. Crow stood there a proud centurion for everyone to see, and the witch on his arm had just done more to instigate better relations between wizards and goblins than had been achieved in decades. Her display of respect and use of their language couldn't fail but have an effect on the hundreds of goblins currently watching and listening. Ragnick paid her the deserved compliment of returning her bow before addressing everyone once more, in English. For those of you who don't speak our language, Miss Granger was just thanking me for inviting her to the ceremony where her best friend became a centurion. I would like to say she bestowed our nation great honor in attending, and by her words here today. I would also like to say she will be an honored friend of our nation anytime she chooses to visit Gringotts. A quick glance at Harry was all that was needed to know this was something special, she bowed respectfully to the director once more, knowing it would be explained later. The director returned his attention back to the gathered crowd of witches and wizards. As you have now heard, the supposed exclusive interview in the prophet is nothing but fabrication and lies. We have asked the newspaper to print a retraction, they naturally asked us for proof. This proof is now standing before you, though I fail to see Miss Skeeter in attendance. As well as a retraction, we demand to know how this was achieved. It's in everyone's interest that we discover if someone has stumbled upon a method of bypassing wards. Amelia stepped forward and officially introduced herself to the goblin leader, before confirming her department would be investigating this phenomenon thoroughly. A warrant would be issued so Miss Skeeter could be brought in for questioning. Ragnick thanked her before offering a closing comment. We must now take your leave and return to the feast arranged to celebrate our newest centurion, I wish you all a good day. The director had hardly finished speaking before his troops were shepherding the goblin spectators out of the way to clear a path back into the bank, Amelia couldn't fail to be impressed with their efficiency. The crowd had come to see and hear the boy who lived, they had gotten far more than they bargained for. The prophet interview had portrayed Harry as a typical young wizard enjoying his first year at Hogwarts, today had told an entirely different story. Since they had stood and watched the entire episode unfold before their eyes, even the gullible witches and wizards of Britain could see the prophet's version was a pack of lies. As the commentator described the young couple following the goblin leader back into Gringotts, an old wizard in a Scottish castle knew his manipulation had spectacularly backfired. Quote ellipsis. I came here today like most of the crowd to get my first look at our savior, the boy who lived. Instead of seeing Harry Potter, we were introduced to Centurion Crow. Here is a young man who has been raised by the goblins, and may I just say which is he's clearly thriving in that environment. The beautiful young witch on his arm compliments him perfectly, I suspect hearts will be breaking the length and breadth of the country when today's pictures are printed. That Centurion Crow bears no resemblance to the picture the prophet painted of this young man leaves only one conclusion, we are being lied to. This was the point at which Albus turned the radio off. If the mindless cretin that WWN employed to ask a name and downright idiotic questions could figure that out for himself, the rest of the country would too. He expected a visit from William Weasley soon, that young wizard was far too smart not to figure out who had pointed the prophet at the cemetery. Albus would have to reel him in, that sounded so much better than blackmail. William would now have to play the game Albus's way, otherwise Gringotts would discover just who leaked that information. He didn't feel the least bit of sympathy for William, more than ever Albus now needed information. The worst that would happen to the eldest Weasley was that he ended up teaching defense at Hogwarts, that wasn't much of a sacrifice to make for the greater good. He also expected to be hearing from Skeeter within the hour, Rita was about to discover Albus Dumbledore was a recognized expert at this game decades before she was born. When you played with the big boys, sometimes you got burned. Should Rita attempt to pass any of the blame onto Albus, the legs would soon be cut from under her. He mentally prepared his statement for the press, DMLE, just in case it became necessary to give one. He had heard Harry would be visiting the Potter Graves on Halloween, and passed that information on to Miss Skeeter. All he asked in return was that any article she wrote would show Hogwarts in a favorable light. He expected the reporter to ask Mr. Crow a few questions before or after his visit, not spy on the entire thing and then report it as an interview. He was certain Rita wouldn't disclose how she was able to spy on the boy, meaning Albus wouldn't need to mention that he knew Skeeter was an unregistered animagus. The plan was always for Hermione to stay the night at Harry's butt, with her new, friend, status, a different world opened up for the young witch. She was in her training clothes and running beside Harry as he followed his usual underground route when at home. He was in his normal training gear with the sword strapped to his back. Hermione learned the gold armbands never came off, and the epaulets were worn on everything except pajamas. Thankfully the helmet was reserved for ceremonial duties, and wars. As expected, they were drawing a fair bit of attention from everyone they saw or passed. Harry knew the next part of their routine would receive a lot more attention, and had planned accordingly. While Hermione was a quick learner with the wooden sword, she was nowhere near ready to practice those fledgling skills in front of an audience of goblins. She was improving with her goblin shield though, and it was those skills they would practice this morning. Normally, this would be the only time Hermione removed her bracelet, but not today. The certainty that their practice was bound to draw an audience, and that audience would probably make Hermione nervous, Harry wanted to have that extra security of knowing any curses getting past her guard would still be nullified. Harry led them into a large cavern that was occupied by goblins practicing fighting, though there appeared to be just as many simply here to watch. In some strange way it reminded Hermione of a seedy boxing gym, and now it would take her hours to get the rocky theme tune out her head. 
Harry had small portable ward stones that would stop any low-level magic escaping, placing them on the ground to define a safe area. They started firing stinging hexes at each other and escalated from there, blocking with their physical shields when they couldn't dodge and erecting magical shields when they had to. The had escalated to stunners, and had worked quite a sweat up, when the cry of, stop, issued. Both stopped and turned to see who had issued such a command, they were faced by a wizened old goblin who was storming in the direction. Hermione was again in rocky mode as here was, Mickey, coming to chew him out, even his gruff voice was in character. Put those devil toys away at once, this is a place for real fighting. Hermione was about to comply when Harry's voice stopped her. Watch our backs. Those three words just dumped a shedload of adrenaline into the young witch's body as she took up position guarding Harry's back. Harry almost casually reduced and clipped his shield onto his scabbard, their attracted audience could see he was deadly serious the instant he reached back for his sword. Who are you to decide what real fighting is? Are you so old or just blind stupid that you can't see my rank? How dare you interrupt my training? You snot-nosed whelp, get a bit of rank and forget who trained you. You sir will address me properly, or there will be blood spilled here today. The old goblin's face split into a grin that had many gaps before he gave the proper centurion salute. Just remember centurion crow, never give the bastards an inch. Quote ellipsis. Or they'll walk all over you, I remember Whitefang, you've shouted that at me since I was five, how could I bloody forget? Are we done here, or are you planning another one of your surprises? Whitefang let out a rich laugh at that. Well centurion, I can see that rank was earned. I had intended a couple of my boys would attack from behind but your little witch there seems ready for them. Harry knew what Whitefang was trying to do, deliberately unsettle him while seeing just how far he could be pushed, but there was still more than a trace of anger in his reply. That, little witch, is Miss Hermione Granger, she is under my protection and named friend by the director himself. Insult her and I will introduce you to my blade. The writing was on the wall, he pushed too far, and it was his understanding of such things that White Fang eked his meager living from, a bow and apology were quickly offered. Sorry if I insulted you Miss Granger, that was not my intention. Hermione returned the bow, apology accepted Master White Fang. This led to a loud burst of sarcastic laughter from Harry. The only thing White Fang is master of is the most disgusting mouth in the nation, and I don't mean dentally. None of the small crowd knew what Harry meant by his last remark but it made Hermione smile, and reduced her apprehension. If Harry was cracking jokes, the situation was well in hand. Since White Fang has disrupted our exercise session, I suggest we head home for breakfast. My father has taken the morning off to spend some time with us before we visit your parents later. They picked up the wardstones and Harry had a few words with goblins he obviously knew, Hermione also noticed White Fang watching everything closely. As they left, Harry began supplying the answers he knew his best friend was dying to ask. White Fang is, White Fang, I know that doesn't help but I don't have any words you would understand to describe him. Harry, Rowena's charm is still working, just tell me in your own language. His answer had her blushing. Okay, I get the picture, part scoundrel, part lovable crook. How do you know him, and what does your father think of this? When I was a good bit younger I used to get my ass kicked, a lot. White Fang watched this happening one day, didn't stop it mind you, and had words with me afterwards. Said I had guts, but was stupid. You know me well enough now to guess how I would react to that. Hermione actually smiled, not well I'll bet. Well White Fang said I needed to learn to fight, not just stand up and get knocked back down again. He took me to the training place we were today, and gradually taught me every dirty way to fight there is. This confused Hermione, then why were you so hostile to him if he helped you? Oh he certainly helped me a great deal, but it's complicated. Had I shown him the respect I offer, say Master Sharkshard, White Fang would have spat in my face and insisted I had insulted him. By treating him the way I did today, as a dangerous character I shouldn't be around, that to him is a form of respect he can accept. My father pays him for information occasionally, he's very good at blending into the background and missing nothing. White Fang would accept gold for that, but never for helping me. A sigh of exasperation came from his best friend. Every time I think I'm beginning to understand goblins, something else comes along and changes it. Harry just laughed. We're a very simple race Hermione, let's run back and you can have some more of that ale you like so much. I must admit, I really miss it when we're at Hogwarts. Pumpkin juice is far too sweet for me, and the wizard's attempts to copy our ale, butterbeer I think it's called, is supposed to be disgusting. At the feast I noticed everyone was drinking ale, that or wine. Hermione, we only have four drinks and one of them is water. Grog is never drank in public, it knocks you on your back after only a couple of tankards. This was hard for Hermione to believe, her mother drank more types of coffee than that. This prompted another question, surely there must be more than four drinks, don't you have any hot beverages? Sure we do, hot water, hot ale and hot wine. Master Sharkshard is the only person I know who can drink hot grog, a good indication of how toxic the brew is when heated. I told you Hermione, simple. Hermione was shaking her head, simple, right. This was going to take her years to figure out. That thought brought a smile to her face as she ran beside Harry, heading for his home. Padma found her twin waiting on her as she left Ravenclaw Tower, they hugged in greeting before Parvati told her why she was there. I said to Neville I would walk you to breakfast this morning, we never get to spend as much time together as we used to. I don't think I like being in separate houses, and we won't even be together over the holidays. Unlike her sister, Padma was enjoying being in a different house from Parvati. They really were two very different witches, with her more gregarious twin attracting all the attention while quiet little Padma faded into the background. Padma didn't resent her twin for this, you might as well blame the rain for being wet, it was just who Parvati was. It was only now though, being in a different house and having her own group of friends, that Padma felt she could let out the witch that, until recently, only she knew was in there. Pav, you seemed happy with Gryffindor, you and Lavender had a fight. What, no, it's just that I thought it was going to be so different. I mean, look what we have to put up with, Ron Weasley, please. Seamus and Dean aren't much better, neither are the second years. One decent wizard and my twin sister has to snaffle him. 
Neville and I are good friends, Pav, but I'm not expecting a marriage proposal soon. We hope to see him during the holidays but he won't be staying at Hermione's. No, you'll just have to make do spending the holiday with Harry. I still can't believe you marched down to the front of the Great Hall yesterday, that boy is a bad influence on you. Padma had trouble believing it herself, but she thought Harry and Hermione were great influences on her. Without their friendship, she would never have had the confidence to stand up for them yesterday. Have breakfast with me this morning. I do miss spending time with you Pav, we can still be together more than we have been lately. Parvati quickly agreed, before coming to the main reason for wanting to speak with her twin. I heard Hermione mention shopping, presents and parties, can you swing an invite for me too? Padma was well aware Parvati would drive both her friends nuts with her constant chattering so tried to nip this idea in the bud. Did you also hear her mention running every morning, lots of studying and living without magic for two weeks? Running, and no magic, how are you supposed to live without magic? I have no idea Parv, but that's the whole point. I want to learn new things, and living with muggles for two weeks will certainly do that. Suddenly the idea wasn't so appealing to Parvati. When Padma said she would try and include her when they met up with Neville, she was delighted. Both sisters entered the Great Hall and sat at the Ravenclaw table, being quickly joined by Neville. Padma was sitting between her sister and friend and thought the morning was just about perfect, until the prophet was delivered and it got so much better. A. N. Thanks for reading. Bill believed. Harry Crow. A. N. Just a silly question that popped into my mind. Do you think flamers get a kick out of the FFN automated message? The author would like to thank you for your continued support. One person I really would like to thank for her time and continued support is Alex33. I work without a beta and her reviews are always constructive and concise, helping me to hopefully become a better author. Chapter 17. The headline of Saturday's Daily Prophet screamed the newspaper's intent right from the front page, it was time to grovel. It also helped that they could blame everything on a convenient scapegoat. Penitent Prophet. As. Centurion Crow crowned. The imposing figure in our picture, wearing the golden helmet and carrying the sword of Godric Gryffindor, is Centurion Crow. That this is also the boy who lived immediately indicates there was an error made with the story concerning him previously printed in this newspaper. The beautiful young witch on his arm though, is once again Miss Hermione Granger. They're all similarities with yesterday's issue of this newspaper end. Both Centurion Crow and Miss Granger vehemently denied having met Miss Skeeter, far less participated in an exclusive interview before posing for a picture. It now appears as if Miss Skeeter has spied on the young couple as they visited the Potter graves on Halloween, the 10th anniversary of James and Lily Potter's murder. The Daily Prophet was in no way complicit with this reporter's actions and doesn't want to comment further at the moment, as Miss Skeeter is currently at the center of an investigation initiated by the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. This newspaper will of course comply fully with that investigation. Dan Granger let out a low whistle as he read over the front page article from the newspaper Barchoke had just handed him. His wife was reading it over his shoulder and had her own comment to make. Was that whistle in appreciation of the apology or the picture? Emma had to look at the picture twice to assure herself it actually was Hermione and Harry. Her daughter stood there looking every inch a princess, the jewelry she wore must be worth a king's ransom, while Harry appeared ready to do battle. Their poise and clothing reminded her of a famous historical couple, Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Showing this picture to anyone who didn't know Hermione or Harry, you could never convince them these two were eleven and twelve. The royal theme just wouldn't leave her alone as she looked at the wide shot the newspaper had also printed, Hermione and Harry were in the center but surrounded by goblins dressed in their finest. The only thing Emma had to compare this with was a royal wedding photograph, the ones the press were so fond of printing as the royal family gathered on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. That there were thousands of people watching this picture being taken, and the newspaper dedicated a further nine pages to the event, reinforced the, royal wedding, image in her mind. She just hoped her husband was following a different mental route. Dan was indeed following a different mental route, this route was currently stuck on a giant roundabout that he couldn't find an exit from. The father was struggling to accept that this beautiful and confident young woman in the picture was actually his little girl. She was standing there facing thousands of strangers yet drawing the confidence to deal with it from the young man whose arm she was on. The newspaper went to great lengths to extol her beauty and poise, that she spoke gobbledygook and the goblin leader bestowed a great honor on her was certainly something he would need to ask Barchoke about when he got his mind back into gear. Well, there's one thing for certain Hermione, you absolutely destroyed any notion of you being a gormless village idiot. Your father's opinion may be biased, but I think my daughter is truly beautiful. Then again, I've thought that since the day you were born. His daughter's playful giggles at that was music to his ears. Thanks dad, I almost wish I had been in Hogwarts this morning to see certain witches' reactions when that was delivered. I'll need to ask Padma if Cho choked on her porridge or cried, I'm hoping for both. Hermione, isn't that rather unkind? No Harry, it's not. I'm usually standing there on your arm while Cho tries to flirt with you. I know you do nothing to encourage her, and I can't really blame her either. How did the prophet put it, dashingly handsome young man, standing shoulder to shoulder with a nation's leader as if he belonged there. I understand why all the girls hit on you, it's the way they pretend I'm not standing there that annoys the hell out of me. Harry decided to quote the prophet straight back at her. Well I don't know how they could possibly ignore, the beautiful young witch who sparkles by my side, and I don't think they were talking about that tiara you were wearing. The three parents were laughing at the antics of their children. They may be front page news for the second day in succession but they seemed far more concerned with what they thought of each other than letting fame go to their heads. I'm just glad we managed to ward your house before this whole thing started, it also has an owl redirect which will allow urgent and official Gringotts owls only. Anything else will end up at Gringotts where it can be examined before forwarding. This concerned the Grangers but they recognized that, even in their world, getting press coverage like this could attract its own special breed of weirdos and crazies. They were delighted any potential problems would be dealt with before they could get anywhere near Hermione. Barchoke had even more good news for them though. Hermione's status as a goblin friend allows you to do your banking through Gringotts, and get our best rates. This could save you thousands on your mortgage and business account. Get your figures and I would be more than happy to go over them with you, the savings will be substantial. 
Dan thought he should be getting used to the shocks by now. Your daughter is a witch and she needs to go away to Scotland for almost 10 months of the year. Well it looks as if our summer holiday next year could be a good one. It was a nervous Harry who interrupted. M, excuse me sir. Since you were kind enough to invite me into your home over the Christmas holidays, I was hoping to return the favor at summer. This piqued Emma's interest. What did you have in mind Harry? Well, because I had to remain hidden, I haven't really left Gringotts much. There are a lot of Potter properties dotted around the world I've never seen, but that I now have access to. I was hoping you would be my guests as we explored some of them. They really do span the globe, from the south of France to the Seychelles and on to the South Pacific. Dan was struggling to believe the wealth of this young lad, and yet how level-headed he appeared. That sounds unbelievable actually. Wouldn't we spend most of the holiday in airports though? This drew a puzzled look from Harry. I don't think so Dan, since I don't know what an airport is. He looked to Hermione for help. Airports are where you go to board planes that fly you to your destination. Can I assume we would be traveling using portkeys? A nod from her best friend saw Hermione offering an explanation to her parents, only for her mother to excitedly jump right in. Oh that young Weasley chap used one of them to take us to London in seconds, are you saying that these can be used to travel the world? Barchoke thought Emma's excitement at such a simple thing was a delight to watch. A portkey will take you from one pot of property, directly to the next one. Both Granger parents were overwhelmed at this. No waiting in airports for delayed flights. No being bored out your head by sitting for hours on a plane. No arriving to find your luggage is in Timbuktu. No tedious transfers to and from the airports. We're in. This was greeted by an eardrum bursting squeal of delight before Hermione actually jumped on Harry, wrapping her arms and legs around him and almost having both of them over. I get to spend Christmas and summer with you. Oh Harry, that's wonderful. Dan was watching his little girl wrap herself around a boy and his only reaction was to laugh, how could he possibly get upset when Hermione was so happy? It was left to Barcho to discuss practicalities. I'll organize a folder of those properties that you can all look through when Harry stays here at the holidays. I plan on taking some time away myself over summer so we could either organize it to be together or split it and give these two a longer holiday. This drew another squeal from Hermione as a delighted Harry twirled her around the room, all three parents were smiling at the antics of their two very happy children. It was also nice to see them acting their age for once, just a couple of kids very excited about spending their Christmas and summer holidays together. I think those two like the idea of a longer holiday but I also think we should build a bit of overlap in there too, where we can all be together. Barchoke was quite overwhelmed at Emma's suggestion. That these people would actually arrange their schedule purely to spend time with a goblin wasn't just unbelievable, it was historically unprecedented. I think I would like that very much. We may even have some company. If we can get Sirius Black out of Azkaban, I can't think of anyone who would be in more need of a holiday. It would also give Harry a chance to get to know his godfather. This was something Dan was very interested in, the thought of an innocent man rotting in prison appalled him. What do you think the chances are of getting him out? To be honest, two very powerful men colluded to put Sirius in there. That these two are still as powerful is going to make this a very difficult task. At the moment, it's beyond us. That these two did this one unlawful deal would suggest there may be other skeletons in their cupboards. If we can discredit them, people would be more inclined to believe claims Sirius is in fact innocent. This wasn't nearly quick enough for Emma. Surely the mere fact the man never had a trial should see the entire case reopened. A goblin explaining to a pair of muggles how the magical world worked didn't even qualify for a raised eyebrow amongst this group now. Azkaban is an exceedingly dangerous place, deaths amongst inmates is not uncommon. I fear that is the fate Sirius might face if we were to go public with this. Dumbledore may preach forgiveness, but only when it suits his aims. Barty Crouch is the ultimate hardliner. The man sentenced his only son to life in Azkaban, and his life is exactly what it cost the young wizard named after his father. Dan looked over to the two children, still in each other's arms and chatting excitedly about their future plans. We have to thank you for your honesty Barchoke, almost as much as the lengths you have undertaken to protect our daughter. The more I hear of this world, the more I worry about the decision we made to let Hermione join it. Then I look over there and see what I always wanted, my daughter happy. No thanks are needed Dan, I am also looking over there at my son being very happy. I will take every measure I can to ensure their safety. Gringotts now have an employee we can trust inside Hogwarts 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Master Pitsley and Cursebreaker Weasley also make frequent visits to the castle. I'm sure we can trust their head of house and believe McGonagall is also on our side. Apart from getting Dumbledore thrown out on his ear, I don't think we can make that situation much safer. Both Grangers were keen to know if that was a possibility, Barchoke did his best to explain the situation. Dumbledore, for all his faults, is a very powerful and clever wizard. He's become so used to everyone around him doing exactly what he wants, we kind of caught him on the hop a bit. I'm willing to bet he instigated that entire incident with Skeeter, just as I'm willing to bet he'll have covered his tracks. Some of his earlier moves were stupid, born out of overconfidence, he won't make the same mistake again. I just don't understand how one person could end up holding so much power. I think it comes down to laziness again Emma. They've gotten so used to asking someone else what to do, we are reaching the stage where senior ministerial officials can barely think for themselves. Dumbledore has been repeatedly offered the job as Minister of Magic but continually turns it down. The minister can be held accountable when things go wrong. Those manipulating the minister will escape any unpleasantness like that, and usually have a hand in choosing the sacked minister's replacement. There is no shortage of people every bit as stupid and just as easily manipulated as Fudge, all willing to do anything to take his place as Minister of Magic. It's a rotten and corrupt system, but those pulling the strings certainly don't want changes being made. I want some changes made, this makes us look like incompetent assholes. Albus then inquired just what changes the minister wanted made. The lad kills a troll, saves three students and the Hogwarts healer, yet doesn't even earn a house point. The goblins give him a golden helmet for chasing a ghost out the bloody castle. The boy who lived, standing on the steps of Gringotts and talking about how honored he is to receive an award from the goblins has seen the ministry inundated with owls. 
They all want to know why the person who rid us of Voldemort hasn't received as much as a ministerial thank you. He's the Hogwarts champion for Merlin's sake yet neither the school or ministry received one positive mention in ten pages of the prophet dedicated to the boy. This state of affairs can't be allowed to continue. Albus had allowed Cornelius to get it all off his chest as the minister ranted and raved in the headmaster's office, he actually agreed with most of it. I am at a loss to see how we can turn this around. If Hogwarts or the ministry start showering the boy with trinkets and awards, it's going to stand out for exactly what it is, us attempting to curry favor with Harry. He will see right through that and may even refuse to accept, imagine how embarrassing that would be. The goblins have won this battle hands down, I think we have to just acknowledge that and continue the fight from another angle. You really can't be serious, won't officially acknowledging this make the situation worse for us. I think you have to add your congratulations to Centurion Crow. It might not be a bad idea to let slip the ministry were considering something similar but don't want to be seen to be competing for the boy's affection so have put it off to a later date. I shall approach Minerva about the possibility of a special award to the school for his actions the day, presented at the leaving feast before Christmas. She has a better understanding of Crow and can determine whether the lad will accept before we let any announcements slip to the press. Cornelius was beginning to understand the angle this crafty old wizard was suggesting. So we play it as if the ministry were in the process of recognizing the boy who livid's achievements but the goblins stole the march on us. We congratulate the lad because the award is well deserved and will revisit our options to add our further congratulations in the future. Exactly, sometimes the only option left is to doff your hat to an opponent in appreciation of the skill they displayed, also showing your determination to win the next encounter. I think this is one of those situations. As to how we win the next one, all I can say is I'm working on it. Cornelius drew comfort from this, not knowing Dumbledore hadn't a clue what to do next. Another coup like that for the goblins and I fear the battle could be lost, I've already had to publicly thank the goblins for doing such a good job in raising the lad. The boy who lived standing there dressed as a goblin, with a witch beside him dripping in priceless goblin jewelry, is a very powerful image. Especially since the goblin hierarchy were all lined up behind him, showing support for his award. It's going to appear to the magical population of Britain as if Harry Potter has deserted us, that is a state of affairs neither of us could politically survive. One more article like this and we might not have a hat to doff. Albus once again found himself agreeing with the minister. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise though, the one thing Fudge excelled at was judging public opinion, and shifting his own position to keep Cornelius Fudge on the right side of it. Hogwarts was buzzing when Harry and Hermione returned, Padma immediately began teasing about having epaulets on a Hogwarts robe. Hermione shot that down before it could go any further. Well I think they are handsome, and a lot more practical than some badge saying prefect or quidditch captain. Logic like that ended the teasing, though Padma just switched to what else they were up to in their time out of Hogwarts. It was almost a relief when they all needed to head to Herbology. By lunchtime, it was as if they had never been away. Bill watched his students leave the classroom, and couldn't fail to notice Dumbledore waiting to enter. He had no intention of listening to the old wizard today, the supposed interview with Harry printed in the Prophet had sent chills up his spine. Had he not reported to Barchoke that Dumbledore managed to get that information out of him, Bill would currently be unemployed, homeless and a promising career destroyed. He wouldn't have to fake anger in this confrontation. Albus entered and shut the door, only to be met with hostility. I'll save you the trouble of spouting whatever words you had prepared, I have nothing whatsoever to say to you and refuse to play these games anymore. Games, you think this is a game? Bill didn't back down an inch. I know it's not a game, these are real people's lives that are being affected here. To you though, we are all just pieces in a game, a game where you have elected yourself the main player. All this greater good pish, and sacrifices have to be made shit. You can go and drown in your own stinking manipulations headmaster, I have no intention of making any sacrifices for the greater good of Albus bloody Dumbledore. Bill was pushing past the headmaster when Albus grabbed his arm. This has nothing to do with what I want, I'm trying to save our world from changes that would destroy it. The curse breaker jerked his arm out of the headmaster's grip. Before I took this assignment, I spent my days working in tombs of people who couldn't adapt to change. They were the gods of the day, with the power of life and death over millions. Now all that is left are some piles of stone. Impressive piles of stone to be sure but their way of life is gone forever. Dumbledore seized on this analogy. If we allow things to continue, Hogwarts could be nothing more than rubble in a few generations. Our way of life is under attack from all sides, it's now more important than ever that we all stick together. My problem with that statement is we are all supposed to stick together, and do whatever Albus Dumbledore wants. What gives the headmaster of a school the right to determine the direction our way of life has to proceed? I have no intention of blindly following someone whose motives are at best questionable, and whose actions are borderline criminal. This was not going the way Albus had planned. If he thought about it, very little had gone to plan recently. So you would rather align yourself with the goblins than your fellow wizards. I'm aligning myself with Harry, that just happens to be the side the goblin nation are supporting too. I would rather put my trust in that young man than be a mindless follower of the self-proclaimed leader of the light. Bill had his hand on the door before Albus dropped any and all pretense. You claim to support Harry, yet were involved in a major breach of security against the lad's safety. I wonder what your goblin masters would make of that information, should it find its way to them. It was you who passed the information on to Skeeter. Dumbledore thought he had his man now. Ah, but I wouldn't have been able to, if you hadn't told me about the proposed visit beforehand. I truly am sorry to do this William but you leave me no choice. I desperately need information, if you won't cooperate then perhaps your replacement will be a bit more accommodating. Bill's eyes were boring into the old wizard. It was a confident Dumbledore who was standing in front of him. The curse breaker could see that Albus thought he was in a win-win position, time to end his delusions. It was also time to admit to himself he was shite at this spy crap, there was just too much of the Weasley temper in him to be able to play nice with people like Dumbledore. You're a learned wizard headmaster so I will leave you with a simple puzzle. Rearrange these words into a well-known phrase, off, fuck. With that Bill left the classroom, slamming the door behind him. Leaving behind a surprised and confused Dumbledore. 
Harry was sitting at dinner talking with his friends, attempting to explain some of the muggle things he'd seen at the Grangers to Padma and Neville while Hermione smilingly looked on. It was such a pleasant scene, Bill was loath to interrupt. A few whispers in Harry's ear drew a nod of understanding and his friends could see playful Harry slip away, being replaced by the persona that was Centurion Crow. Bill patted Harry on the back before taking his leave, no one in the hall thought anything of him approaching and talking with his students. It was naturally Hermione who asked Harry what was going on. Oh, just as we suspected, Dumbledore has been playing games again. I'm just trying to figure out the best way to use this. The headmaster entering the hall from a side door and taking his place at the staff table appeared to make Harry's mind up. Before he could rise though, Hermione's hand clamped on his leg. Are you sure about this Harry? He smiled at her. No, but I shouldn't be in any danger. I'm far better confronting him in the hall, with McGonagall and Master Flitwick here. Couldn't we send for Master Sharkshard too? He lifted her hand off his leg and kissed her knuckles. Hermione Granger, you're actually developing a goblin sense of humor. Harry stood and strode to the front of the hall. He attracted attention most of his time in Hogwarts but almost every pair of eyes must have been watching him by the time he reached the staff table. Harry didn't bother with any preliminaries. Dumbledore, you told that Skeeter reporter I would visit my parents' graves on Halloween. The silence that followed those words drew out until Snape actually broke it. Mr. Crow, that is a pretty serious allegation to make. Do you have any proof? It's Centurion Crow sir, and yes I do. Curse Breaker Weasley let slip to the headmaster where I would be going, and then this despicable old bastard just tried to blackmail my tutor into passing over more information. He admitted telling Skeeter where I would be, before threatening to report how he learned the information to my father, if Curse Breaker Weasley didn't do what Dumbledore told him to. Minerva practically had steam coming out her ears at that revelation. Do you know what Mr. Weasley's answer was? Yes professor, I believe he told the headmaster to fuck off. This drew some laughter, and had a pair of red-headed twins up on the Gryffindor table doing a jig of delight. Harry wasn't finished yet though. For ten years I was safe within Gringotts walls, I haven't been here ten weeks yet but it has been one attack after another. First evening, you attempted to have me renounce my goblin upbringing, while at the same time having Voldemort sitting at the staff table. Add in trolls, bullies and death eaters, getting the picture headmaster. Then when I step outside Hogwarts, you tell someone exactly where we'll be. You endangered not only me, but Miss Granger too. Dumbledore finally spoke, am I to take it that Mr. Weasley's attempts to save his job by slandering me are being believed? Curse Breaker Weasley is a wizard with honor and integrity, two qualities you are sadly lacking in. He also reported the incident to my father on the day it happened, we just didn't think you would stoop so low. We already knew you were behind the supposed interview, attempting blackmail just confirmed it. I am very happy with the defense tutor my father found me, Curse Breaker Weasley will not be going anywhere. Minerva felt she had to intervene before this escalated any further. Centurion Crow, I'm sorry but calling the headmaster a despicable old bastard is against school rules and will earn you another detention with me. Rest assured though, I agree with your assessment that whoever released this information endangered two Hogwarts students. I shall be reporting the matter to the DMLE and the Hogwarts Board of Governors. Harry nodded respectfully to McGonagall, fully aware that the detention would be nothing more than another tutoring session. I understand Professor, and like any other student will obey Hogwarts rules. Please inform both of those bodies I would be quite happy to speak with them on this matter. May I ask that you make this sooner rather than later. My father's patience with Albus Dumbledore is pretty much exhausted, and both Hermione and I understand French well enough that attending Bubatons would not be a problem. As Harry was heading back to his seat, McGonagall called out to him. Centurion Crow, nice to have you back. It would be a sad day for Hogwarts if you and Miss Granger left. A slight nod of his head was all the indication he gave that he had heard, though the students he passed to reach his seat could all see he was smiling. Both Harry and his father knew it was more likely to be a series of body blows that would lead to Dumbledore's eventual downfall, rather than one knockout punch. The headmaster was sitting at the table reeling as another scheme had not only failed, but spectacularly blown up in his face. Dropping in the line about Bubatons would hopefully muzzle him for a while, and give the goblin plans time to bear some fruit. Hermione was just glad to see Harry make it back to her without any weapons being drawn, though Percy had to restrain his twin brothers when Dumbledore attempted to push the blame onto their eldest sibling. The name Dumbledore had taken a bashing amongst the Weasleys, and one glance around the hall was enough to see it was Harry's version of events that was being believed. Severus certainly believed Albus would attempt to blackmail Bill Weasley to basically become his spy, the potions master only wished that he had been in a strong enough position to deliver the same answer to Dumbledore all those years ago. He had studied the, Centurion Crow, edition of the Prophet from cover to cover, all he could think of though was that Lily would be so proud of her son. Looking at that, army, behind him kindled hope in Severus that this boy might actually be capable of finishing the Dark Lord. It was now clear to anyone paying attention that Dumbledore was also firmly in Crow's sights, and set to fall if the potions master was any judge. Being the Slytherin that he was, he needed to do something so that Severus Snape wasn't dragged down with either of the two wizards who had dictated his life since he was a teenager. The more he thought of Harry as Lily's boy, the more Severus found himself appreciating just what this boy could do. He had no idea Harry was about to make his life even better. They had hardly left the Great Hall when the Weasley twins approached the group of friends. Harry, we would like to thank you for defending our brother in there. Harry held up his hands to stop them saying any more. Guys, not only do we all like your brother, he's a brilliant teacher. Working for Gringotts comes with some pretty tight restrictions, but we also look after and reward our employees. Now I have a question to ask you, can you two be serious? Of course we can. What do you think we are? A couple of jokers. Something tells me I could regret this but what class do you two have on a Friday morning? Divination, why? It suddenly hit George and he was down on his knees pleading, his twin only seconds behind. Hermione had also sussed just what was going on, and questioned Harry's choice. Are you sure about this Harry? Of course I'm not, but I think I should give them a chance. Master Pitsley offered another couple of places, who else could I chose? 
I couldn't pick a pair of Hufflepuffs or Slytherins without upsetting the rest. Same with Gryffindor, though I honestly don't think any of their first years are up to all the work involved, sorry Padma. No problem Harry, Poverty would be the first to admit she doesn't enjoy studying. Harry once more turned his attention to the twins. Okay guys, but you need to get McGonagall to agree to this, and Snape. Harry was suddenly up in the air and being twirled around as both twins had him in a hug Hermione would have been proud of. The whoops of joy soon drew an audience, and a fair bit of laughter. Both twins gently lowered Harry back to his feet before shaking his hand. We won't let you down Harry. Most of our pranks are potions based, we understand this is a life-changing opportunity for us. Reserve an extra two places at your study table Neville, we're off to see McGonagall. As they skipped along the corridor, it was a worried Hermione who expressed a thought most of them shared. Oh dear, I wonder if Master Pitsley will know what hit him. Hermione, where do you think I learned to brew the potion I used on Snape? Master Pitsley knows more prank potions than anyone else in the country, they are just more subtle than donkey ears and the like that the twins seem so fond of. With goblin humor, sitting at a formal dinner and having your victim loudly letting one rip is considered the height of hilarity. Okay, I need to write home and make sure we have a good selection of comedy tapes for Christmas. You need to learn a different definition of funny. Harry's eyes almost glowed at this. You mean there are more videotapes than the ones you already have? Thousands Harry, with new ones released almost weekly. This had a wide smile on Harry's face, and caused laughter amongst the friends. Bill didn't find any laughter when he entered his sister's room. Instead he found a young girl staring into a mirror with eyes red and swollen from crying. Mum said you've been upset Ginny, do you want to talk about it? As her brother's arm went around her, Ginny leaned into him as the tears once more began falling. You tried to warn me, didn't you? Ginny indicated the prophet pictures lying scattered on her bed. How can I compete with that, how can any girl compete? She's like a princess on his arm, and he's already madly in love with her. Bill hated to see his sister like this but thought Ginny might finally be coming to her senses. He wanted to discover how she arrived at this conclusion though. She reached over for a picture that was showing definite things of where, Ginny had obviously studied it quite a bit. Just watch and you'll see him glance at her, making sure she's okay. Her smile back practically has his eyes sparkling. You told me they were close friends but you don't look at a friend like that. She's beautiful, so smart and already speaks gobbledygook, little Ginny Weasley never stood a chance. She cried some more before asking Bill a question. You didn't go to Hogwarts this weekend, wasn't Harry there? They stayed with Hermione's parents a few nights but both stayed at Harry's too. She stayed at Gringotts, is that even possible? Hermione is a friend to the Goblin Nation, that gives her all different kinds of privileges. Bill could feel Ginny's tears soaking into his shirt as his sister clung to him, realizing that her dreams would never be more than that. He held her close and let Ginny cry it out. It was a while before she actually spoke. Will you still introduce me to him? Are you sure that's something you want to do? He could feel Ginny nodding her head as it was still buried in his chest. I think I need to see it for myself. At least now I know what to expect. I'm going to be at Hogwarts with him for six years, perhaps we could be friends. Bill agreed to that, delighted that his favorite sister appeared to be coming to her senses. Just remember what I said, no boyfriends until you're at least 26. He'd hoped for a smile but had to settle for her holding him tighter, it was her first steps on the right road. Padma had gone to bed, leaving Harry and Hermione sitting together on a sofa in their study area. So, are you glad to be back? It was quite the few days. Now, that's an understatement Harry. I love my time at Gringotts with you but getting to spend some time with my mum and dad was just wonderful. Knowing we'll all be together at Christmas has already got me so excited, and I told you my parents would love my best friend. Your parents were great, sorry for springing that summer thing on you. It was something I had been thinking about and had barely gotten a chance to talk it over with my father. When your dad mentioned it, I didn't want him making arrangements before we meet again at Christmas. He found himself enveloped in a hug. Only you Harry could apologize for arranging someone's summer holidays. I didn't think my mum could get any more excited at Christmas but this year looks like topping all the others. I'm now gonna have two friends staying, and planning our summer holiday too. Hermione kissed him on the cheek. Thanks Harry, for everything. I'll see you in the morning for our run. Hermione headed up to her room, leaving a grinning Harry behind. A.N. Thanks for reading.